Hey guys, welcome to part 4 of what if Naruto was adopted by Uruka. If you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 13. Bittersweet Victories. It's hard to describe, Sasuke said dully, staring down at his folded hands. He was sitting on the end of his bed, with his friends on either side of him. The early morning sunlight cast a soft glow through the thin curtains. However, what might have been a comfortable, peaceful environment was tense. Sasuke, it's been three days. I know you've talked to Kakashi about it a little, but you said you'd talk to us, too. Naruto wore an uncharacteristically serious expression, a testament to his concern. All you've said so far is that it wasn't you back there, but it also was at the same time. I don't get it. We're only worried about you, Hanada offered quietly. She was fidgeting with the hem of her coat, which had been cleaned along with the rest of their clothes, but in a distracted manner rather than in her usual nervous habit. Sasuke was silent for a time. They had been saying similar things ever since he had recovered from the sealing technique the day before. Kakashi hadn't given him a choice in the matter, but his friends hadn't pressed him too hard. He knew they were concerned. You too remember when Itachi murdered my family, as well as the rest of my clan, don't you? The sudden question caught them off guard, but Hinata and Naruto both nodded. It was impossible to forget such a thing. In the aftermath and for a few years following I was so focused on killing Itachi. It was all I thought about some days, it distracted me from training even though it should have been motivation to train harder. And it never faded, he continued, his fists clenching. Not for a single moment. It just got easier to set aside, to focus in the day to day. But it's always there, in the back of my mind, reminding me that my older brother took everything from me. When I said that it wasn't me back in the forest, in some ways that was true. But, Sasuke struggled to find the words, shutting his eyes tightly for a moment before relaxing again. When he opened his eyes and spoke, he sounded tired. But it was me, somewhere, deep down. I wanted to hurt that guy. I wanted to kill him in the most painful way I could think of. I wanted that. It was me. Naruto's studying eyes felt like the harshest judgment. After I fell unconscious, I had these, really vivid dreams. They felt so real at the time. In every single one I had to watch that. That scene again. Though his features remained placid, several tears slid their way down his face. I saw my parents' dead bodies, with Itachi standing over them. I had to experience his Sukuyomi again, and again, and again. I saw how he killed them, every one, in perfect clarity. I thought, Sasuke clenched teeth and shut his eyes again, forcing the choking emotions away. I had suppressed it, I even stopped having nightmares about it. But, in that one night after Orochimaru gave me his curse it all came back, along with every single ounce of my hatred for Itachi. It made me remember it, and once I woke up I knew what it had been trying to do. And, it worked. When I was finally conscious the chakra was already there, and I could feel the power it gave me. I'm sure you both noticed how strong it was, it felt something like Naruto when he's got that cloak on. Naruto nodded solemnly, flexing his right hand, the one that had caught Sasuke's punch. Hanada inclined her head as well, wiping at the corners of her eyes with her sleeves. It felt incredible. It felt like I could do anything with that power, like I could kill Itachi. And that's what it wanted you to feel, Naruto said quietly. Isn't it? I knew it was dangerous, and I knew it was stupid. But, I couldn't think straight. All I wanted to do was take out that anger, that terrible hatred on somebody. I would have killed Dosu if you hadn't stopped me, Naruto. Hanada bit her lip and glanced at him, but Sasuke only shook his head, his voice growing harder. I would have, and you know it. And if you had let me stay like that I wouldn't have felt the slightest remorse. I think, I think that curse just brought who I really am into light. I feel like I've just been pretending all this time, trying to be something I'm not. In reality, I'm nothing except what he made me. I'm just like him, like Orochimaru. You're wrong. Sasuke turned fully to his left and blinked. He wasn't surprised at the words, he had expected them from Naruto. 
but it had been Hanada who had so fervently spoken. She didn't even flush as they both looked at her. I said you're wrong, Sasuke-kun. He blinked again several times. Hanada had never attached an endearing suffix to his name, or any at all for that matter. Itachi didn't take everything from you, and you are what you choose to be. He found his hand tightly grasped in hers, and before he could get a word out Naruto took his other in a similarly firm hold. Sasuke. He started, examining his spare hand. We didn't let you isolate yourself back then, and we won't now or ever. That curse didn't do anything but try to tempt you into becoming somebody you're not. Come on, Naruto continued, smirking sidewise at his friend. We've known you for over five years now. You may be a stubborn ass er, jerk, he corrected, eyes flickering to Hinata. But you're our friend, and you have to care about us at least a little to put up with me all the time. Haku really likes you, too. He's not the type to like people unless there's good in them. He was fond of Zabuza, Sasuke said wryly, though his tone was significantly softer now. Kakashi told us what Zabuza said just before he died, Hanada put in. We know he actually cared about Haku. And I think Haku knows that even if you seem distant and apathetic a lot of times, you're a good person. I know that we can't really understand how you feel, Sasuke, Naruto said quietly. His grip tightened on his friend's hand as he continued. But we've at least lived through enough on our own to know a little of what it's like. He looked past Sasuke to Hanada who met his gaze for a moment before nodding slowly. I never had family to lose, not until Aruka sensei took me in. I've never admitted it, but I was lonely, and a part of me hurt every time I saw kids with their parents. It still does, sometimes. But, a genuine, warm smile tugged at his lips, and he looked appreciatively towards the three of their locked hands. Thanks to you I get to know what it would be like to have a brother. Sasuke tensed and for a second Naruto cursed his choice of words. But then he realized that his friend was looking down and trying to hold back tears. I, Hanada hesitated, gripping hard at both her coat and Sasuke's hand. When my father cast me out and I came to live with Aruka sensei you were always kind to me, Sasuke-kun. I mean, not that you weren't before, she said quickly, blushing slightly. But you always encouraged me, in your own way, and never let me get down on myself. I don't, I don't know entirely how you feel either, but I do know that you're our friend, and that you're truly a nice person. Nobody, not Orochimaru or Itachi, can take that away. And they can't take us away, either. But they can, Sasuke rasped, his tears flowing freely now. Itachi massacred every other Uchiha alive by himself. And Orochimaru could have killed all three of us easily. That's why that power was so tempting. I don't want to be helpless like that again. I want to have the strength to avenge my clan, and... And... And then it hit him. Tears still dripped steadily onto his lap, some falling onto his friend's hands, but Sasuke's expression had smoothed over. His eyes were a little wide as he stared down at Hinata's pale fingers, turning his gaze slowly over to Naruto's a moment later. And to protect my friends. They both tightened their hold on his hands, as if they could sense his thoughts. And for us, Naruto finished for him. That's proof enough that you're not like them, Sasuke. It was only a slight pressure at first, but slowly Sasuke started to squeeze back until he was holding hard enough to make them wince. A long, comfortable silence fell between them. What had needed to be said had been, and for a time the trio simply enjoyed each other's presence. We'll get them both. Sasuke said at last, his voice calm and strong again. Itachi and Orochimaru. But, he looked to his right, then left, smirking at Naruto and Hinata. We'll do it the right way. Right. His friends agreed in unison. Another long pause allowed Sasuke to collect himself, retrieving his hands to wipe his eyes. They were long past the point of being embarrassed around one another, but it wouldn't do to make them worry more. Thanks Naruto. Hinata. Sorry for letting it get to me. Oh whatever. Naruto grinned, rolling his eyes as he stood and stretched towards the ceiling. How about we go get breakfast instead of talking about how dramatic you are? Sasuke smirked and rose from the bed, hitting Naruto's shoulder in a light jest. He turned towards the door to lead the way out, and Hinata stood to follow. As Naruto's hand fell comfortably into her own, 
She smiled and squeezed gently. Just like he had promised, they had made it through together. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Yo, how'd you sleep together? I mean, how'd you sleep? Shikamaru asked coolly, unable to keep the cheeky grin from his features. Naruto and Hinata both turned red and looked away from one another. They were seated at a long table in a makeshift cafeteria, which had likely been set up solely for the exam. I can't believe Kakashi Sensei told everybody about that, Naruto mumbled, poking at his omelette. It was an accident, and besides why'd he come in our room so early anyway? Hanada stayed silent, too embarrassed to even chance looking up. Kiba and Shikamaru shared a hearty laugh at their expense. Oh man, when we got here yesterday I think that was one of the first things we heard, Kiba said cheerily, alternating between shoving fish in his mouth and talking. Whatever. I'd like to see you try to stay conscious with the amount of chakra we had left, let alone find your way to the right bed. Naruto scowled and took a large, grumpy bite of egg and rice. Shikamaru chuckled and shook his head, though his expression sobered as he began speaking again. Yeah, you guys were pretty beat up. You still not going to tell us what happened? He asked, glancing at the three of them from across the table. Sasuke shrugged, and sipped at his miso soup. He might have been back to normal, but that didn't mean he was up for much more conversation that early in the morning. Hanada fidgeted with her jacket and shook her head, her blush slowly receding. Sorry Shikamaru, but Kakashi Sensei said that we can't, Naruto responded, and he truly sounded sincere. All we could figure out is that you guys were attacked by somebody who wasn't supposed to be in the exam, Tenden said as she took a seat next to Hanada, smiling at the other girl. All of the junin are being really tight-lipped about it. Even Guy Sensei won't tell me, Lee sulked, taking the seat by Sasuke. Naruto blinked at both of them in turn, raising a curious eyebrow. The rest of the rookies went silent. Isn't Neji going to be mad if you're hanging out with us? Naruto asked. He's staying in our room for a while, Tenten shrugged, starting into her meal. Something about meditating before the next exam starts in a few hours. I think he's still peeved that two rookie teams finished before we did. She, however, didn't seem troubled by it at all. Team Guy had purposefully taken their time, though, as Neji had been sure to inform them. It was probably true, but Naruto still allowed himself to feel a little smug about beating them to the tower. It is very impressive, Lee stated emphatically, sending rice scattering across the table as he flourished his chopsticks. You all have shown us that your fires of youth are not to be underestimated. Tenten rolled her eyes and shared a look with Hinata that sent them both into light giggles. Naruto, though, humored him. Yeah, a lot of teams from Konoha passed, actually. All of the rookies, you guys, Kabuto-san's team. Aside from that, only that one Suna team got through. He got a lot of grins from that, and even Ino and Sakura stopped arguing long enough to nod and afford irritated smiles. Shikamaru looked troubled, however. I'm not sure that's entirely a good thing, he mused, staring down at his untouched food. Everyone but Tenten looked at him curiously, she merely nodded and continued eating with a grave expression. Shikamaru shrugged and continued, rubbing distractedly at the back of his neck. I mean, don't you think it might look a little strange to the other villages if five of the six teams that passed are from the hosting village? The rest of the genin had only just begun nodding in comprehension when a low voice started from the door at the far side of the room. That's seven teams, Brat, Zaku spat as he ambled into the room, followed closely by Dosu and Kin. And hell yeah it's suspicious. Not really, Kin shrugged, smirking at the familiar faces. It's easier to get genin into an event hosted in your own village. Not to mention, your broken arm says that they earned their place here. Zaku cast her a venomous glare, she ignored it and returned a devious smile instead. Quiet down. Dosu growled, sidling ahead of his companions and nodding towards the rookies. The three sound nin looked a little worse for the wear, but overall healthy. Zaku's right arm hung in a sling crafted from bandages, and he looked as contemptuous as ever as his team passed by. Naruto and Sasuke watched them with narrowed eyes while Hinata looked worriedly between her teammates and the newcomers. Ino and Choji blanched and tried to pretend they didn't notice, and Shikamaru managed to continue looking bored. As I was saying, 
he sighed, finally starting into his cooling breakfast. While it's definitely something to be proud of, I would be careful how we act around other people. It's troublesome, but you never know who might decide to call foul on the Hokage for rigging the exam. The old man wouldn't do something like that, Naruto said sharply, annoyed that anybody could even think that about the Sandane. Shikamaru shrugged noncommittally, but it was Shino who responded. It took everybody a moment to locate the boy, who had been sitting right next to Kiba the entire time. That is irrelevant. The potential for political strife is great, and we would do well not to exacerbate the situation. He lapsed into silence again and returned to sipping at his tea. Naruto understood, then. That's probably why they didn't cancel the exam. I. The alliances between villages are frail at best. You mortals will find any reason to slaughter one another. I don't want to hear that from you. Even annoyed, Naruto could tell that the fox's subsequent silence was different than normal. It was a simmering one, as expected, but it also had an undertone of anger that was not directed at him. Naruto shivered. It was disturbing sometimes that he could tell how the Kyubi felt by just thinking about it. Conversation moved back towards more amiable topics after that. Kiba explained in great detail how he had single-handedly taken out a group of genin from Suna, though he was forced to mend his statements when Sakura hit him over the head hard enough to leave a visible bump. Lee went on an unabashed tangent about he had saved Sakura from a giant centipede, proceeding directly after to ask the pink-haired Kunoichi on a date. He was refused flatly, though there was a tint of red in Sakura's cheeks as she informed him that he was far too, unique, for her tastes. Ino bragged incessantly about how she had, saved Sasuke-kun, from the sound nin, and that was a note that Sasuke couldn't help but respond to. I wasn't there to be saved, he stated nonchalantly, reclining in his chair with an arm hanging lazily over the back. I'm sure Naruto appreciates you distracting them for him, though. By the way, Sakura, would you like to grab lunch or something after the next exam is over? Sasuke had offered the question as mildly as possible. Naruto struggled to keep his face straight, and Hinata busied herself examining a spot on the far wall. Ino's look of stunned disbelief was exaggerated further by her mouth hanging open. Sakura only blinked at Sasuke for a few seconds before flushing and nodding quickly. Of course, Sasuke-kun. Sakura bubbled being very careful not to look towards Ino. If anything she had a decent head on her shoulders, and she had caught on to what Sasuke was doing immediately. It was a little disappointing that he wasn't asking her on a genuine date, but teaching Ino a lesson while getting to spend time with Sasuke wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt at all. Sasuke nodded and stood, acting as if nothing had happened while Ino began to rail at Sakura. Naruto and Hinata stood after Sasuke, discarding their disposable plates before heading for the exit. That was cruel, Sasuke-kun, Hinata said in a disapproving tone. You told Ino you'd go on a date after the exam. No, I said I'd consider it. So I thought about it, and decided she's obnoxious and needs to be taken down a peg or two. By going on a date with Sakura, Naruto asked, raising a curious eyebrow. I thought you always thought she was just as annoying as Ino. I'm starting to think she's not quite as irritating. It's close, but at least she's smart. Besides, it's not going to be a real date anyway, he said with a dry smirk. We'll just go to Ichiraku or something, chat a little, and be done with it. I just hope she doesn't go bragging about it to Ino, or it'll only prove she's as immature. Still, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Sasuke rolled his eyes at Hinata as they walked. She always avoided contention and tried to be nice to everybody. She seemed distracted, though, so he didn't push the topic further. Something wrong, Hinata-chan. You're gripping my hand a little tight. Naruto seemed legitimately concerned, and even more so when Hinata jumped at the question and blushed. And no, I'm fine. I was just thinking about something. She relaxed her hold on his hand as they reached the door, shaking her head and sighing mentally at herself. I can wait. Naruto, do you have a minute? Shikamaru asked from behind them. Naruto turned, noticed that he was sporting a severe expression, and nodded. I'll meet you in the room, he said, turning briefly back to Hinata and Sasuke. They hesitated for only a moment before returning his nod and exiting the dining hall. What's up, Shikamaru? 
he returned his focus to the other boy, wondering what it was that could only be said to him. Let's go someplace else, Shikamaru suggested in a way that could only mean this would be a serious conversation. It'd be troublesome if somebody overheard. That got both of Naruto's eyebrows up, but he nodded and led the way from the room. They walked in silence for a few minutes until they reached an empty room. Shikamaru closed the door behind them, then folded his arms and leaned against it. Naruto wasn't sure what he was up to, but the secrecy was making him uneasy. What's up? Naruto asked again. Shikamaru watched him for a long moment before taking on a careful tone. Ino told me what happened after I was knocked unconscious. Her attention span is pretty low, but I got enough out of her to have a lot of questions. He took a deep breath before continuing, noting that Naruto was already getting a little defensive. Look, it's not my business what that strange orange chakra was around you, or the purple chakra around Sasuke. But I have a feeling it's connected to what all of the instructors are so nervous about. If it's something dangerous, we have a right to know about it. Naruto relaxed a little, rubbing absently at the back of his neck. Er, my chakra doesn't have anything to do with it, I promise. And, well, all I can say is that Sasuke's did, but it got taken care of already. Can't you tell me something? Shikamaru sighed, sounding annoyed. I get that you might get in trouble, but don't you think it's irresponsible to keep this information from everybody? What if this person who attacked you comes back and attacks another team during the next exam? Maybe if we knew a little about it we could stand a better chance. I, Naruto hesitated, staring down at his hands for a few seconds. Look, if I tell you what happened, you can't tell anybody else all right. At least if you know you'll be able to help make a plan if the guy does show up again. Shikamaru nodding begrudgingly, and Naruto took another deep breath. Do you know who Orochimaru is? The other boy's eyes widened, and he nodded again. He listened intently as Naruto detailed what had happened on the first day of the exam and their encounter with Orochimaru. By the time he had finished Shikamaru was pacing back and forth wearing a troubled expression. So one of the legendary Sanin attacked you three, gave Sasuke that curse, and then let you live. Naruto shrugged, and Shikamaru scowled. The fact that you managed to land a hit on him at all is impressive, but I don't get why he would let you go. Unless, he drummed his fingers against his opposite wrist. Unless he wants to observe the effects of his curse during the rest of the exam. And he picked Sasuke among the three of you, there has to be a reason for that. We just figured it was because he's an Uchiha. I mean, since the massacre there are only two alive that we know of. Sasuke said that the curse was trying to change him. That makes sense. Orochimaru said that Sasuke will come to find him, right? Maybe he wants Sasuke's bloodline for something. It was starting to hurt his head thinking about it. A missing nin like Orochimaru could kill every one of them without breaking a sweat. So why wasn't he? Shikamaru shook his head again. Anyway, thanks for telling me. I'll think it over more. No problem. Was there anything else? How did you three get to be so strong? Naruto blinked at that question and tilted his head to the side, genuinely confused. What do you mean? We just trained a lot. Shikamaru shook his head for the umpteenth time. Naruto, you all went against Orochimaru and held your own, to an extent, anyway. Then you went against those three genin from the sound who were a lot stronger than they should have been, but you still stood a chance even when you must have been low on chakra. Hanada can use medical ninjutsu precise enough to heal my inner ear and Choji's muscle tissue. Not to mention she had enough chakra to keep her Byakugan consistently active for over a full day, and she healed four people in such a short time. Sasuke's ninjutsu and speed with hand seals are incredible, too, from what you described. And what's more, you guys are inventing your own techniques. He took another deep breath after that, eyeing Naruto in a calculating manner. All of the teams train, but you three are on your own level. Why? I mean, we train a lot. Naruto looked a little lost, but did his best to explain. Outside of academy classes we've trained together pretty much every day since we were seven. While most of the other kids went to play, we trained instead. Sasuke helped me and Hinata with ninjutsu, I helped them with taijutsu, and Hinata helped with our chakra control and recognizing genjutsu. 
Even on days that we had classes we'd spend an extra four or five hours training. Shikamaru blinked at that. He had known that the trio put a lot of time into training, but he hadn't been aware just how much. What's a normal day of training for you like? He asked slowly. We like to split it up. Nowadays we'll start before dawn and work on our own for an hour or so. Hanada usually meditates and stretches with her Byakugan active to increase the amount of time she can keep it active. She said something about being able to see farther, too. Sasuke works with Haku on honing his skill using the Sharingan, so they do all sorts of things. I usually do a few hundred push-ups and sit-ups, then either practice with ninja tools or spar with a few shadow clones. Shikamaru was already taken aback by that information, but as Naruto kept going his mouth slowly dropped open further. Then we'll usually get together and spar for a few hours, I'll keep making clones for whoever is sitting out. They always say I'm better at the Goken stances and stuff, but really I can just outlast them in fights. After that we break for lunch before working on ninjutsu. Most of the time we just pick a new technique we think would be useful and keep practicing it every day until we have it down. Sasuke helps us with that. He's really good at explaining how to mold chakra the right way, and gives us tips on how to make seals faster. After we finish that we go for another hour or so of sparring, then Hinata coaches us on chakra control. We'll never be as good as she is, but we've gotten a lot better at it. She's also been practicing genjutsu with Kakashi Sensei. He laughed then, catching Shikamaru off guard. I'm terrible at it, but at least I've learned the basics enough to know it when I see it. I think. Anyway, by then it's near dinner time and we grab something to eat. If Kakashi is training with us that day we have a sparring match with us three against him, we've never even gotten close to winning, but it helps us practice together. Usually that's it, Naruto concluded, thinking hard. If we feel like it we'll do some more sparring before it gets dark, but usually we'll just finish up with weapons training. Kakashi sensei says we should all find weapons that suit us. He rubbed at the back of his neck and grinned sheepishly. That's pretty much what we do on the days we don't do missions, and we've been doing something like that for five years. Shikamaru stared at him. It wasn't as if his team hadn't been training, but that degree of diligence was unheard of. Naruto lowered his hand and looked concernedly at the other boy, wondering if he had said something unsettling. What? Isn't that what everybody does? Naruto. Shikamaru started weakly, slumping heavily against the door. We train a lot too, but it's nothing like that, not even close. And we take days off, like most teams. We also didn't spend our academy days doing serious training. How? Why in the world would you go through all of that trouble? Because we want to be strong enough to protect one another, Naruto said simply. Uruka sensei always tells us that our job as the shinobi of Konoha is to protect the village, and to take that task seriously. We train hard so that we can do that. Besides, it's always been fun spending time with Sasuke and Hinata. Just because we're training doesn't mean we're not enjoying ourselves. To protect the village, Shikamaru mused, soaking in his friend's words. Naruto had said it all so matter-of-factly, but it wasn't something most of them thought about very often. Real missions put comrades in harm's way. Nobody wanted to think about their friends dying, but Team 7 did on a regular basis. And it made them strong, and want to become even stronger. I guess I see what you mean. I'm going to have to talk to Asuma Sensei about our training. Ino and Choji won't like it, and it'll be troublesome, but Naruto's right. It's our duty, and we should act like it. I need to get back to the room to go over a few things before the next exam, Naruto put in apologetically, stepping towards the door. Shikamaru shook himself, then nodded. As Naruto reached for the door, however, Shikamaru spoke very quietly. One last thing, Naruto. The blonde froze, his fingertips brushing the doorknob. The air thickened with tension in the moments before Shikamaru went on. When he finally spoke, his voice was calm and conversational despite the air of unease. What's with your orange chakra? It's not yours. Silence. For a full minute neither of them spoke, and it felt like an eternity to Naruto as his thoughts raced. Does he know? He's probably figuring it out, the fox reasoned, seeming to examine Shikamaru through Naruto's eyes. The kid has a sharp mind. What do you mean? 
Naruto ventured carefully, turning back away from the door. I've been noticing some weird chakra surges some days, when I get close to some of the training grounds. It's not normal chakra, and I felt it again in the forest three days ago when you took out those three rain nin. It's been coming from you. Naruto said nothing, instead just staring ahead. Other people have been noticing, although we're told it's just jutsu testing or something. I didn't buy that in the first place, though now I know it's a lie. I guess it's none of my business, but if you have access to that chakra it makes me wonder why you didn't use it on those sound nin. And you're keeping it a secret from us. You probably have your reasons, but it would have made the other day a lot less troublesome if you'd used it to fight instead of to block one of Sasuke's punches. He waited then, watching Naruto. I couldn't, he said finally, forcing a smirk onto his features. It's kinda complicated I guess, but you don't need to worry about it. Shikamaru raised an eyebrow, as if waiting for further explanation. When none came, he shrugged and raised his hands in surrender. All right, suit yourself. Thanks for talking. Naruto nodded and left the room swiftly, careful not to break into a run to get back up to the top floor. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. 21 Genin stood at the center of a large stone room with raised catwalks on either side, facing a stage that was lined with Junin instructors and the Hokage at their center. The exam was a mere minute from ending, and everybody was tense in the heavy silence. The Sandame kept his steady, calm gaze on them, the slightest hint of a smile pulling at the corner of his mouth. That last minute crawled by, but at least the doors behind them closed and Anko stepped forward from the ranks. Congratulations on passing the second exam, she said evenly, though there was a touch of amusement in her voice. Hokage-sama will now give an explanation of the third exam. All eyes moved to watch him. Before I explain the details, there's something you all need to know first, he began, his normally reserved voice somehow carrying throughout the room with ease. That is, the true purpose of the Chunin exams. Nobody wanted to interrupt during his speech, but he could tell that their collective curiosity had been piqued. You have been told that the purpose of these exams is to encourage cooperation and good relation between the villages. You have also been told that it is to determine which genin have earned the right to become a chunin. Only the lattermost reason is true. The chunin exams originated as a place for conflicting nations to send their elite to battle, reducing the costliness of wars. Instead of being decided by long, bloody battles, wars were decided by a select few shinobi from each village. In these days of tentative peace, countries instead send their best genin to carry the dignity of their land, to fight, kill, and die for that dignity. It is a measure of each country's power, simply put. Powerful people from across the land will be attending the third exam to assess the strength of each nation. These are clients for all nations, and as you would imagine the countries with a better showing at the exams will gain a larger clientele. If realization hadn't dawned on the genin already, now it came flooding in. Hiruzen smiled sadly before continuing, regretting that he had to be the one to bring the largely innocent youths into the real world. Before he could speak again, Kiba finally broke the silence among the genin. Why do we have to fight each with our lives on the line? People died in that forest. He said loudly, and though not angry his words were pointed enough so that everybody could tell he was put off. A country's strength is judged by the strength of its village. A village's strength comes from its ninja, and a ninja's real strength can only be seen in a life or death battle. Those of you that were pushed to your limits in the forest of death can attest to that. A brief, uncomfortable silence followed that statement, it had hit home for many of them. This exam is an introduction to the real world, and that is a world governed by the military power of the hidden villages. We say that it promotes good relations because, in a way, fighting to maintain balance between villages is good relation in the world of ninja. I don't care. Everyone looked toward Gara when he spoke, his chilling voice taking most of them by surprise. Just tell us the details of the next, life or death, exam. The Hokage frowned slightly, and then nodded. Hayate. At the Sandame's call, a man appeared in front of the dais, first kneeling in respect towards the Hokage before turning to regard the assembled teams. My name is Gekko Hayate, and I will be the proctor for the preliminary matches. Preliminary matches? Sakura asked, her brow furrowing. Yes. 
The Chunin exams regulations dictate that the number of examinees must be cut down to accommodate the requirements of the third exam. As the Sandame explained, there will be many people visiting from far away, and we will be limited on time. As such, we cannot continue with the current number of examinees. For the sake of saving time, please raise your hand if you do not feel up to continuing at this time. From here on out we will have one-on-one -on -one matches, so your team will not be affected by your actions. Every sentence or two the Junin coughed a few times, sometimes violently. There was an immediate rise in murmurs as he finished speaking, followed immediately by silence as a single hand raised into the air. Anyo, I'd like to drop out, Kabuto started with an embarrassed grin. I haven't recovered enough to continue. Kona has Yakushi Kabuto-kun. You are dismissed. Hayate said after a short bout of dry coughs. After Kabuto turned and exited the room, he continued as if uninterrupted. Are there any others? Nobody else moved. The room was largely filled with defiant eyes. Then the preliminary exam will begin immediately. They will be, as stated, one-on-one -on -one matches. There are no rules. You will fight until one of you dies, is knocked unconscious, or gives up. However, I will stop a match that I deem is over in order to prevent unnecessary deaths. As Hayate finished his explanation, a large stone panel above the stage slid aside, revealing an electronic board. He turned towards it and nodded, coughing a few more times before turning back. This board will display two randomly generated names, and as you would expect they will be the ones fighting. If there are no objections, we will now announce the first match. Nobody said a word and with a signal to Anko the board lit up. The tension in the room rose to a peak as nearly every genin stopped breathing. Golden letters flashed across the screen as it jumbled through names. With a loud beep the sequence stopped, displaying two names in giant letters. The first match will be Akato Yoroi versus Uchiha Sasuke. Everybody except for the fighters will move to one of the platforms above to spectate. Don't win too fast, Naruto grinned as he passed Sasuke at least make it entertaining. Good luck, Sasuke-kun, Hanada offered sedately, joining hands with Naruto as they made their way to the stairs. Sasuke gave them both a wave and a smirk before approaching Hayate. Neither Yoroi nor his remaining teammate said a word. He simply stepped forward to the proctor before turning to face Sasuke. Sasuke's lucky to get to fight first, Naruto sighed, leaning against the railing above the arena. All of the genin and instructors from Konoha had taken to one of the raised catwalks, the teams from Suna and Odo occupied the one across the way. Now he gets to relax and watch the rest of the fights after he wins. You are very confident in him, Lee said from nearby, his eyes remaining on Sasuke. Of course I am. Aren't you confident in your team? Naruto grinned and winked at him, eliciting a similar expression from the other boy. I suppose so, he admitted though he looked concernedly at the pair facing off. I don't know anything about Yoroi, even though he is from our village. Sasuke-kun won't lose, Hanada stated with firm conviction. Naruto glanced at her and nodded, giving her hand a light squeeze before turning his attention to the ground floor. Only Hayate and the two fighters remained. Hayate looked to his right at Sasuke, who nodded to indicate that he was ready. A look the opposite way showed that Yoroi was prepared as well. Hayate took a few steps back and raised both hands to chest height, sweeping them down a moment later. Begin. Sorry, Naruto, I don't know what this guy does. If I just have fun with it I could end up making a mistake. Sasuke didn't move despite his reasoning, waiting to see what his opponent would do first. Yoroi didn't waste any time, forming a tiger seal immediately before throwing a fist of shuriken at Sasuke. Distraction. The Uchiha's eyes flashed crimson while the weapons were in flight, and a moment later both genin vanished. Only the trained eyes in the room actually saw what happened. Sasuke effortlessly dodged the shuriken, catching two of them even though his eyes were focused on Yoroi the whole time. When the man all but disappeared in a blur of motion, Sasuke smirked and took a single step to the side, pivoting in the same motion to bring a round kick flying towards where he had just been standing. Yoroi's chakra-laced hand hit the ground previously occupied by his adversary, and an instant later Sasuke's foot collided with the side of his head. The stunned genin grunted and flew sideways with the force of the blow, 
smashing into the stone wall only a few meters away. The shuriken Sasuke had caught came following immediately after, pinning Yoroi's collar on either side so that he hung against the wall. Was that all? Sasuke asked lazily amid the silence of the room. Even Hayate was looking back and forth between the two genin, like he was confused about what he had just seen. Naruto cheered from above, and if he had turned to look Sasuke would have seen Hinata beaming. Hayate started to raise his hand to signal the end of the match when Yoroi coughed and stirred. I'm not done yet, he groaned, shrugging both shoulders to dislodge the shuriken. He landed heavily on his feet, swaying slightly and holding his head. Mostly because, Sasuke froze as a hand fell on his shoulder, and the genin in front of him melted into a pool of water. Yoroi's voice continued in a sinister tone directly behind him. You're the one that's done. A burning sensation roiled within Sasuke, not enough to be too painful but enough to make him balk. The moment he had sensed Yoroi behind him he had spun away, but not before the man had touched his shoulder. In that fraction of a second Sasuke felt his chakra drain away, it wasn't a significant amount, but enough to notice at least. When his spin brought him around to face Yoroi, the man's hand was glowing blue. The mask covering his face made it hard to tell the expression beneath but his sneering voice was enough to determine that. The Uchiha clan was always so full of hubris, he mocked, crouching low. Too blind to see your own, Yoroi stopped abruptly, his whole body tensing as he choked on his own words. A moment later he fell limply to the ground, clearly unconscious. Sasuke stood just behind him, looking bored with both hands shoved in his pockets. Most of the genin were confused, Though none of the Junin seemed surprised, a few even looked impressed. From their point of view, Yoroi had started talking, and then Sasuke had casually walked up to his opponent. The older Genin had continued gloating at empty space, appearing not to even notice as Sasuke stepped behind him and delivered a hard chop to the back of his neck that rendered him unconscious. The winner of the first match is Uchiha Sasuke, Hayate called after a brief coughing fit. He had given it a few seconds to make sure that Yoroi wouldn't get back up, but it was clear that Sasuke had outwitted him. Well, he made it less boring on his own. Sasuke sauntered away and up the stairs as a pair of medics came in and carried Yoroi out on a stretcher. Sorry it was so quick, he smirked, leaning against the railing next to Hinata. I didn't like hearing him talk. Sasuke-kun, Hinata whispered, glancing around. I thought you weren't going to use Genjutsu until the final round. He shrugged and seemed unconcerned. It was a really minor technique, he reasoned, glancing past her to Naruto. I bet you didn't even notice what was going on until halfway through. Whatever, Naruto grumbled, not willing to openly admit it. Sasuke smirked again very slightly. A few steps away Choji was asking Asuma and Shikamaru why Yoroi had just let Sasuke win. At least he hadn't been the only one. We will now begin the next match. Please step forward when your name appears on the board, Hayate called to the room, turning to nod at Anko again. The screen lit up and began cycling through names before stopping on, Zaku Abumi vs. Aburame Shino. Team 7 and 10 both looked across the room, focusing on the group of sound nin. Zaku still had his arm in a sling from the battle several days earlier but seemed just as cocky as ever. He vaulted the railing and landed lightly near Hayate, waiting impatiently as Shino made his way unhurriedly down the steps to meet him. Their fight lasted only slightly longer than Sasuke's. After being blasted once with Zaku's air cutter, Shino hardly had to move again as his Kikaichu finished the battle for him. When Zaku revealed that his right arm was well enough to use and subsequently tried to utilize his air cutter with both hands, his arms appeared to explode. Shino calmly explained to Hayate that his parasitic insects had plugged the holes in Zaku's hands, causing a chakra buildup that found violent outlets through his arms. Shino ascended the stairs a minute later after knocking an enraged Zaku to the ground, Hayate declared the Abarame the victor. Way to go, Shino. Kiba said loudly, followed by a cheer from Sakura. You showed him not to mess with Team 8. He merely underestimated his opponent and acted rashly. I expect you two to do better than he. Sakura's ecstatic expression faltered, and Kiba started glowering. They both knew Shino well enough to know that he wasn't trying to be cold, that's just how he was. 
That knowledge didn't always make his words easier to take, though. The third match will be Sarugi Masumi vs. Kankuro. Please step forward. Hayate seemed to want to hurry through the preliminary round. He wasn't wasting any time between fights. Kabuto's remaining teammate took his place near Hayate, facing the Suna Nin. At least Hayate was getting what he wanted out of the first few matches. Masumi's body had stretched and contorted around Kankuro, choking the boy until his neck snapped. A few gasps from the Konoha side were quickly hushed as Kankuro's body turned out to be a puppet, reversing the hold and crushing Masumi's arms and ribcage in a single motion. Hayate quickly declared the San Genin the winner to avoid further injury. That was boring, Kankuro sighed loudly enough for everybody to hear, wrapping his puppet back in its bandages and slinging it over his shoulder. Well now we know what he does, Sasuke stated curiously, eyeing Kankuro as he paced back up to join Gara and Tamari. I've never seen a puppeteer before, the marionette technique is pretty interesting. When do you think he switched places with his puppet? Naruto asked, scratching his head. I didn't see him use a replacement jutsu. It must have been beforehand, Hanada reasoned. So that nobody would be watching to take notice. Even his team looked a little surprised. Naruto nodded, grinning slightly. Tricky guy, but I guess he planned ahead. Next round. Haruno Sakura vs Yamanaka Ino. Step forward please. The air seemed to crackle with tension as the two Kunoichi locked eyes, both wearing determined expressions. This is going to be a boring match, Neji sighed, leaning back against the wall as the girls moved down to take their places. Two female ninjas fighting, great. Their being female has nothing to do with it. One of the Sanin is Tsunade, if you recall, Tenten said sharply, narrowing her eyes at Neji before turning back to Sakura and Ino's match. Sex doesn't determine strength. Those two just have a history, and probably won't go all out. Lee glanced nervously at Tenten while Guy gave Neji a reproving look. Neji, their sensei began, raising a fist in front of him. His eyes were alight with the strange fanaticism he got whenever speaking on something he was passionate about. Tenten is right, a shinobi's power is measured only by his or her determination. Right, Lee. Yes, sensei. Lee piped in glowing with pride at his teacher's wise words. Naruto raised an eyebrow at their antics, and Sasuke shook his head tiredly. Hanada, though, was smiling softly at Tenten. Sakura and Ino started the fight soft as Tenten had predicted. After a bout of taijutsu, though, they both donned their forehead protectors, the proper way, and went at one another seriously. Sakura landed the first real blow after using clones to confuse Ino. After feigning a bout of frustration during which she cut off her ponytail, Ino tricked Sakura into standing on the fallen locks. The pink-haired Kunoichi was stuck in place when her adversary channeled Chakra into the hair, and subsequently hit Sakura with her mind transfer jutsu. That's strange, Shikamaru said quietly, drawing Naruto's attention from the fight. It should have ended there. Why hasn't Ino forced her to give up? Sakura's hand was raised halfway staring at Hayate with her mouth open. Just like with Kin, Ino had taken possession of the girl's mind. But something was clearly wrong. Her features were twisted in angry concentration, she couldn't seem to lift her hand. Soccer is pretty hard-headed, Sasuke joked. However, it appeared to be only a temporary roadblock for Ino. I give up, Ino said calmly, using Sakura's voice to convey the message. Ah. The winner of this match is Yamanaka Ino, Hayate hesitated, looking back and forth between them. I guess that is a valid tactic. A moment later Ino released the technique and stood up, allowing Sakura to crumple to the ground, unconscious. Ino skipped up to her teammates as Sakura was retrieved by Kurenai. Ah well, Shikamaru grinned. I guess it wasn't that hard. Good job, Ino. Hell yeah, now you two had better not lose. She pumped her fist to emphasize her statement, and Shikamaru rolled his eyes, muttering something about how excitable women were. They have a lot of training to do, Neji said blandly, shaking his head. Tenten gave him a reproachful look, but couldn't argue. If that had been their best effort, it fell far short of most of the room. At least Ino had outsmarted her opponent and used her abilities tactfully. She turned towards the screen instead of responding, 
blinking a few times when she saw her name pop up above Temeriz. Great. Just my luck, she mumbled. Despite his outward attitude Neji winced and looked genuinely apologetic. Guy's expression was grave, but he wished his student the best of luck before she moved to the ground floor. What's up? Naruto asked, looking from Tamari, to Tenten, to Guy. Why is she so worried? It's just speculation, Neji said quietly, watching as the Suna Kunoichi joined Tenten below. But that girl from the sand uses a giant battle fan. Tenten's specialty is using weaponry, primarily ranged ones. If that Tamari girl uses wind attacks as part of her repertoire, Tenten doesn't stand much a chance. Can't she just get into close quarters? Sasuke asked, but it was Shikamaru who shook his head this time. If she's smart, Tamari won't let her close the gap. All she needs to do is keep her distance and batter Tenten with augmented ninjutsu. I'm sure Tenten knows that, but there's not much she can do about it. Naruto frowned, but he understood. Hanada bit her lip and looked worriedly to Tenten as the match was about to start. They both liked Tenten. She was always nice and cheerful, and had helped them a lot with their training. She had even worked with them a few times since spending the four days training together, helping them practice more with weapons. Unfortunately, the skirmish went as Neji and Shikamaru had predicted. Tenten went through half a dozen weapon scrolls without a single projectile landing. Kanai, Kama, short swords, and a variety of other weapons lay scattered in a circle around Tamari by the time she was through. The blonde girl had hardly moved, only using her fan to brush the weapons aside like flies. Didn't think that would work, Tenten sighed, landing from another of her attacks. But let no tactic go untested. Temeri's eyes narrowed as her adversary rushed forward. A scroll shot out in front of Tenten, and a pair of heavy spiked tonfas appeared in small puffs of smoke. She caught them without missing a step, rolling to the side as a rush of wind sped towards her. She clashed with Tamari a second later, trying to use her speed and rapidly changing weaponry to her advantage. Tonfas clattered to the ground in favor of Kamas, followed quickly by Morning Stars. Useless, Tamari sighed, dodging back effortlessly amid the onslaught. Every blow not deflected by her fan's metal guard was avoided. When one of the maces caught on her fan and sent sparks flying in her face, she growled and sent a blast of wind at Tenten's torso. In the same instant the head of the mace detached and shattered, sending its spikes flying in every direction as Tenten careened backwards. Tamari cursed as a few buried into her shoulder, one grazed her cheek and left a long bloody mark behind. You bitch, she yelled taking up her fan with both hands and opening it fully. Tenten rolled to her feet as Temeri's jutsu was almost upon her, following a cry of, Ninpu, whirlwind. A torrent of air spiraled upward, catching Tenten inside and tearing at her with chakra-laced wind. Tamari walked slowly, angrily forward, planting her folded fan on the ground and waiting. A few seconds later Tenten tumbled out of the gale, and Tamari caught her cruelly on the end of her fan. Blood spattered the floor as Tenten gasped before going limp, her back bent painfully over the massive weapon. Winner. Tamari, Hayate announced a moment later. Allow a few minutes to clean the floor of weapons before announcing the next match. Tisk. Trash Kunoichi, Tamari fumed, shoving her fan hard and sending Tenten through the air. She would have landed amid the weapon somewhere, which had likely been the Suna Nin's intention, but a green blur caught Tenten before she hit the ground sliding back and easing her down instead. Nice catch, she stated dryly at Lee. He was still kneeling beside his fallen teammate, and it was the first time Naruto had ever seen him look legitimately angry. Why did you do that? Tenten fought her best against an opponent ill-suited for her abilities. Lee was on his feet now, his fists clenched and shaking. Shut up, Tamari droned, turning to walk casually away. Take your garbage and leave. Lee's eyes burned with hate, but before he could go after her guy appeared behind him, placing a hand firmly on his shoulder. Lee, do not be tempted into violence, he said quietly, eyes on Tamari. However, Guy continued, offering a mirthless grin to the members of the sand above. Gentlemen of the sand, I will warn you that he is strong. You had best be prepared. Kankuro blanched slightly, but Gara looked intrigued. Tamari continued walking as if she hadn't heard, rejoining her team as the medic Nin rushed in to take Tenten to the infirmary. 
That was, terrible, Hanada breathed, overt concern written all over her features. Naruto and Sasuke nodded, their gazes hard on the trio of sand nin across the way. They're an unpleasant bunch, Kakashi agreed quietly, studying Gara. I only hope that none of you has to fight the last one. His eye flicked to Naruto for a second before moving to the electronic board. Except for Naruto, perhaps, but it's too early for him to reveal the Kyuubi's chakra. The weapons were cleared out in short order by a few chunin, and Hayate's voice called out as soon as they had exited the room. Please step forward as your name is displayed, he repeated in a dull tone, turning to regard the screen like the rest of the room. Seconds later, Nara Shikamaru vs. Kin Suchi appeared. Why's her name backwards? Naruto pondered aloud, squinting at the letters. Do you think that was an accident? Beats me, Shikamaru shrugged, trundling off towards the stairs. I just hope she's as overconfident as her friends, or this could be troublesome. I hate fighting girls. He stepped up in front of Kin amid a continuous stream of cheers from Ino, to which he sighed and waved a hand noncommittally. Their match lasted no longer than the first few. As Shikamaru had hoped, Kin was too confident in her own abilities. It took less than a minute for him to snare her. Unseen to even the spectators he had stretched his shadow so thin that she had mistaken it for the shadow of the wires attached to her needles. In short order he simply leaned her straight back, striking her head against the wall and knocking her out cold. How troublesome, he grumbled, shuffling back up to the rest amid another round of exuberance. Winner. Nara Shikamaru. Hayate gave the same instructions to regard the screen, and the board lit up to scramble the names again. Naruto's eyebrows went up as his name showed on the board, followed below by, Inazuka Kiba. Er, good luck, Kiba, he laughed, rubbing at the back of his neck. Kiba scowled and stalked away down the stairs. Shino calmly wished him the same, and Sakura echoed him in a defeated tone. She had been gloomy since her fight with Ino had ended. Good luck, Naruto-kun, Hanada said with a small smile, squeezing his hand once before letting it go. He grinned and gave her a thumbs up before starting after Kiba. Don't make it too boring, Sasuke smirked from behind him. Naruto flashed another grin back at him before trotting down the stairs. So, Sakura, he continued casually, keeping his eyes on the arena. Do you like barbecue or seafood better? The downtrodden girl looked up and blinked at him a few times. Sakura simpered a moment later, and Hinata couldn't help but smile as well. Sasuke really was a nice person. I love seafood, Sakura responded quickly, flushing a little. Sasuke only nodded thoughtfully and continued watching Naruto's progress to the arena floor, but he was glad to note out of the corner of his eye that she had stopped sulking. I'm not gonna go easy on you. Naruto, Kiba growled quietly, followed by an affirmative bark from Akamaru. I wouldn't want you to, Naruto shrugged, dropping into a taijutsu stance. Can't show off any abilities, have to make it as quick as possible. And none of my chakra, like we agreed. Right, even if you have to lose. Wait, wah, begin. Hayate leapt back at the shout, and Kiba rushed forward to engage. Kiba's taijutsu was decent. His stance and form were different than what Naruto was used to, but not difficult to keep up with. His speed, however, ranked up with Sasuke's and threatened to catch Hinata's at points. Naruto silently thanked his friends for all of the times they'd sparred together. I'm not going to be able to win purely with Taijutsu, he lamented, more to himself than the Kyuubi. The fox, however, thought it prudent to respond. That's a surprise, he jeered. The one trick ninja has to use ninjutsu too. Kiba has an extremely sensitive nose, why don't you just pass gas? What? No way. I'm not doing something so dumb. And shut up. You know what I meant. I'm going to have to show more than I wanted to. The Kyuubi only cackled at him, and the deep rumbling sound nearly distracted him enough to take a hit. Naruto jumped back, and mid-flight formed his hand seal. Cage Bunshin no jutsu. Five clones fanned out as he slid to a halt, moving to surround Kiba and charge in. Four legs technique, Kiba growled, dropping onto all fours as the clones reached him. Passing Fang. Five clouds of smoke temporarily hid the boy as the Bunshin were destroyed, but a moment later he flew from the haze in a spiraling blur, arching towards Naruto at an incredible speed. 
Naruto barely managed to roll out of the way and Kiba rebounded off the ground, tearing deep gouges into the stone floor. Fast, strong, close quarters specialist, Naruto listed off, not expecting help but just taking mental note. He was still getting used to analyzing abilities in the midst of combat. It's going to be hard to hit him with ninjutsu if he's moving around like that, too. Genjutsu would be my best option, but he silently cursed his lack of ability in that area. Think about a technique that won't require you to hit him directly. I know for a fact you can do one. Naruto thought hard as he jumped to the side to avoid another attack. Before he had landed, however, another spiral detached from Kiba and rushed towards him, catching him off guard and slamming him into the wall. The air rushed from Naruto's lungs on impact, and he barely managed to stay standing. What? Kiba whirled to a halt at the center of the arena, still on all fours and offering a feral grin. A second Kiba landed next to him, mimicking his low stance and snarling. Don't let up, Akamaru. The first called, leaping forward and resuming his spin. The second Kiba growled and did the same, both of them coming towards Naruto at breakneck speeds. Great. His dog can transform into him. Naruto backflipped, twisting in midair and landing on the wall. He channeled more chakra into the soles of his feet and pushed off hard, thrusting down with a kanai as he flew over the twin spirals. The weapon was torn from his hand by the sheer force of the movements, but both Kiba and Akamaru collided with the wall a moment later. Naruto landed in a balanced stance on the other side, eyes sharp as dust filled the air from the impact. Ow! Kiba winced as he and the transformed Akamaru stumbled from the ruined wall. Can you not dodge next time? He whined in obvious jest, shaking his head and crouching again. He said something quietly to Akamaru, who nodded and flanked wide around Naruto. Sorry, Naruto, I don't want this match going too long. I know you'll win if I drag it out. Without another word he tossed something small and black into the air winding up and throwing another to Akamaru directly after. He caught the first in his mouth on its way down, crunching down once before swallowing. And then things got hectic. Naruto felt a surge of chakra from both Kiba and Akamaru, and then the blue energy began leaking rapidly into the air around them. Soldier pills. Two can play at th. Wait, Sasuke has them still. Damn it. Idiot. You have more chakra than him even with that gimmick. Just release more of it. As usual, the advice came as a scathing remark, but Naruto had long since learned to take it in stride. If I do that, I could seriously hurt Kiba. Kid, give me a break. This exam is meant to pit you against your peers, and the fights are to the death. You could have been fighting your girlfriend, you know. The thought chilled a little more reason into Naruto, and he was suddenly grateful to be fighting Kiba. The last of his apprehension faded as the Kyubi rolled its eyes at him. Just end it quick so you don't hurt him too bad, you pathetic oaf. Naruto didn't have time for a retort. Kiba and Akamaru were rushing towards him faster than before, their afterimages blurring along behind. Before they returned to their fang passing fang technique, they both hurled a small indigo orb at Naruto's feet. The area erupted in thick purple smoke and a moment later the barrage of attacks tore through it at Naruto. Damn it, he ground out in his mind, guarding his head as the unseen onslaught began to batter him. A technique I don't have to aim that'll stop, damn I am slow. Naruto's hands lowered and raced through seals as a whirlwind clipped his head, knocking his hit I ate loose, a trickle of blood started down the side of his head a moment later. Doden. Rock shell. The tile stones below erupted in a circle flowing around him and forming a solid dome in a tortoiseshell pattern. About time. Now hurry up and gather your chakra. You know, I appreciate your help and all, but would it kill you to be less of an asshole? The Kyubi laughed as he dropped to the ground in the darkness, folding his legs and concentrating. It wasn't often that he employed the bulk of his chakra pool for his taijutsu, but the last time he had done it Sasuke had ended up seriously battered. Wish I had enough chakra to do this against the sound last time, he grumbled. The inside of the shell began to glow even as it cracked from Kiba's continuous attacks. Up in the stands, Hanada shivered, then glanced at Sasuke. Is he? Yeah, feels like it. Sasuke smirked, and Sakura raised a curious eyebrow before speaking up. What is it? 
It looks like Kiba's winning, she said, sounding perplexed. You'll see, Sasuke said placidly. You'll feel it first, though. Sakura wasn't quite sure what he was talking about until she did feel it. A massive chakra presence at the center of the smokescreen was growing larger by the second, and a moment later Kiba and Akamaru retreated from the fog. They glanced warily at one another before turning their attention back to the smoke. The haze had begun drifting apart on its own, forced away at the center by an invisible force. Naruto's small stone dome was now clearly visible to the room, and though it had sustained major damage it was still intact. A vibrant blue light was shining through the cracks. All at once the rock shattered outward, the earthen shards flying in every direction. The only thing Kiba and his partner could do fast enough was guard their faces, a few pieces slicing past or into them. When they lowered their arms both sets of Kiba's eyes widened, staring at Naruto. Brilliant blue chakra swirled and leapt around the blonde-like living fire, giving his hair an odd green tint. While he and his friends had noted that it wasn't nearly as strong of a boost as the Kyuubi's chakra, it was substantial, and also doubled as intimidation. It may not come with the same power, but it was definitely more of a spectacle. A few of the Junin shared the Genin's collective awe, staring at the boy in disbelief. He might have as much chakra as me, Kakashi mused, his one eye shimmering in the blue light. It wasn't nearly as strong last time did this. He raised a hand to lift his Hitai 8 from his Sharingan, focusing it on Naruto. Sasuke saw him and his smirk widened, he wouldn't be able to follow Naruto's movements either if not for his own Sharingan. Naruto wasted no time in creating a single shadow clone, which copied every detail down to the roiling chakra. The energy died down some as he did so, but it still burned bright on both of them. He grinned and leaned forward, winking sideways at his bunshin. Bet I knock mine out before you get yours, he challenged. The clone grinned back and, turning its attention to his adversary, charged at the same instant Naruto started forward. Stone buckled beneath their feet in a thunderous crack, and tiles tore backwards as the two of them vanished. Almost in the same instant Kiba and Akamaru flew back and crashed into the far wall with enough force to create two sizable dents in the stone. Naruto and his clone were left standing where Kiba had been, his leg was drawing back from a straight side kick, and the bunshin was withdrawing its fist from a simple punch. Sucks that I had to show that off, but at least I didn't go too far with it. The chakra surrounding the two of them flickered out, and after an enthusiastic high five the clone dispersed. Hayate finished blinking dust out of his eyes and looked down the length of the room at where Kiba and Akamaru had hit. The latter was back in his small canine form, lying limp on the ground. Kiba was hunched forward and clearly unconscious, still stuck in the miniature crater from his impact. Blood was dripping steadily from his mouth and staining the floor beneath him. When he remained stationary for a few seconds longer, Hayate coughed and raised a hand. Winner. Uzumaki Naruto. Instead of leaving the floor, Naruto rushed forward to check on Kiba, lowering him slowly to the ground next to Akamaru. Thankfully the boy sputtered after a few seconds, coughing up a little more blood before inching one eye open. Damn it, he wheezed, straining to look to his side. Is Akamaru all right? He's fine, I think. Probably just a few broken ribs like you. Sorry, Naruto said guiltily. I wasn't trying to hurt either of you. Kiba managed a weak laugh that turned into a fit of coughs. He spoke again after he stopped, closing his eye again and taking in shallow, sharp breaths. Don't mention it, he winced. I'd have done the same. If I could have. Naruto still felt bad when the medical team arrived to take Kiba away, but the words helped a little. As far as he could tell from his clone's memory its punch had landed just below the ribcage, so Akamaru shouldn't have suffered much damage outside of the impact with the wall. Nice one, Sasuke said evenly, turning to greet him as he came back up. You were a little rough with Kiba, though, your clone didn't hit Akamaru nearly as hard. Yeah, Naruto sighed, rubbing at the back of his neck again. I misjudged the distance. I meant to end up closer and push him with the kick instead, but I stopped short and he got the full impact instead. Every other genin and instructor was looking at him with either an expression of disbelief or one of clear acknowledgement. You're hurt, Hanada said after a moment, moving to him and placing a hand on the side of his head. 
Before she could even start channeling her chakra Naruto took her hand and lowered it gently. Her lips parted in surprise, and she was about to speak again when Naruto shook his head. You still have a match to go, Hanada-chan. Save your chakra, just in case. I'll use some gauze and bandages, and besides they're just small cuts and bruises. He smiled reassuringly, and after biting her lip for a few seconds she nodded and pulled a roll of medical tape from her belt pouch. She helped him to quickly bandage the worst of the cuts on his arms, face, and neck. The lighter ones were already starting to close on their own. The next match will be announced shortly after the repairs to the arena. Please stay alert if you have yet to fight, Hayate called out. Two Chunin were out in front of him, using earth techniques to fix the ground that Naruto and Kiba had torn up before moving to the damaged walls. Naruto-kun, Lee ventured after Hinata finished with the last bandage. I've never seen you use that technique before. Why didn't you use it when sparring with me? Naruto raised an eyebrow, then shrugged. I'm sure all of you have abilities we didn't see, he replied. I mean, Tenten didn't use an exploding mace on me any time we fought, right? Neji scowled and rubbed at his cheek as if remembering an unfortunate incident with the same weapon. Lee nodded slowly and grinned. You're right. We have yet to see each other's true strength. Naruto laughed at the older Genin's enthusiasm, but it was close enough to what he had been trying to say. He stretched and lowered his hand reflexively to Hinata's, who gripped his own tightly as the screen above came to life. Hinata, Naruto started, so quietly that only she and Sasuke would hear. If you're matched against Gara or Neji. She lowered her gaze and nodded, she knew what he was going to tell her. They were both out of her league, and she knew it. Make sure you go all out and beat the crap out of them. Hanada looked up, startled at his words. But, Naruto-kun, she was interrupted by the electronic board, which had finally landed on two names. Her whole body tensed, and her breath caught in her throat. Hanada's grip on Naruto's hand threatened to cut off his circulation, but she couldn't help it. She was terrified. Neji smirked and shook his head, walking silently past them to the stairs. Hayuga Hanada versus Hayuga Neji. Calm down, Hanada, Sasuke said in an undertone, watching Neji as he began to descend from the platform. You can beat him. You're strong, Hanada-chan, a lot stronger than you give yourself credit for. You've trained with me and Sasuke for years, and we both know you can do it. Sasuke nodded at Naruto's assertion, though he kept his eyes forward. She looked between the two of them, and after a long moment exhaled and shivered visibly. Her hold on Naruto's hand relaxed as her eyes closed. They're right. Maybe I wasn't a match for him before, but I can do it now. I can. She kept that as her mantra as she broke her hand away from Naruto's, but before she could take a step away he stepped forward and hugged her tightly. The action caused her normal demeanor to rush back, and she turned red an instant later. Be safe, he whispered. Hearing the same words she had given him days earlier almost caused her to tear up. She returned the embrace fiercely, though it was brief. She was walking purposefully after Neji a moment later, her head held high and determination written on her features. Only the slightest traces of apprehension were visible about her eyes, but it was enough for Neji to notice the moment she took her place in front of him. Hanada-sama, Neji started before Hayate could begin the match. The Junin hesitated, then lowered his hand without calling for them to begin. I'm surprised to be fighting you, but I suppose it's fate. The branch family was always made to do the head family's dirty work. It looks like I'm meant to take care of its outcast. Hanada kept her eyes on his, and though he could sense her nervous energy, she appeared to be collected and ready. He continued, pressing her harder. You haven't changed at all from before. You're still as frail and weak as when Hiyashi-sama threw you out. You're a disgrace to the Hayuga name. You. Neji Nisan, Hanada interrupted quietly, but with a firm tone. Neji stopped and blinked at her a few times, clearly taken aback. She lowered into her modified Jukan stance before taking a deep breath and speaking again, her voice calm. I am no longer the same as I once was. People can change, and I will prove it to you here. Neji's mouth was agape and he was staring at her in disbelief. He had hardly seen Hinata in the months following her expulsion, but even in the four days they had been forced to train together she had been withdrawn. 
When Guy had made them spar together she had fallen far short of him on every front, she hadn't hit a single one of his or anybody else's tenkatsu either. Who was she to speak that way to him? Instructor, he said, addressing Hayate with feigned calm. Try to stop the match before she dies. Neji dropped into his stance a moment later, waiting. Hayate eyed him, looking a tad annoyed, then raised his hand again. Begin. From the outset they both knew what this match would be. Plain and simple, it was a contest between Jukan users, between Hyuga households, and between Bayakugan. Both of their white eyes were lined with the faux pupil created by their keke genke, accented further by the numerous veins all around. Those eyes stared into one another as they clashed at the center of the room, and neither bothered with illusory or ninja techniques. Hanada took Naruto's words to heart, and from the beginning she moved with every ounce of alacrity and precision that she possessed. Chakra flashed in every direction as she deflected Neji's attacks, her own turned only a hair's breadth off of their target through his defense. The dull mutterings around the arena ceased as all eyes focused on the frenzied dance in the middle of the room. It was like watching two bolts of lightning fight, beautiful and deadly. At one point they clashed, perfectly mirroring one another as they came into strike. Neji's fingertips struck Hanada's shoulder at the same instant hers did the same. A swath of chakra flooded over each of their shoulders, and for a long moment they stayed locked like that, breathing hard. Then Neji smirked, lifting his free arm and pulling back Hanada's sleeve. Several red, circular welts dotted her forearm, and he smiled mirthlessly when he saw. You're outmatched, Hanada-sama. My Bayakugan can see your tenkatsu. Despite his words, Hanada seemed unshaken, as if she had known that those points had been hit all along. Rather than respond verbally, she lifted her own free hand and tugged his short sleeve back to the shoulder. His eyes widened when he saw the same marks on all around his upper arm and shoulder. When did you? There are more, Hanada said tersely, sliding away from him and sinking again into her stance. You are not the only one who can see them, Neji Nisan. Do not underestimate me. Her words seemed to irk Neji more than the fact that he had just been shown up by the Hyuga outcast. His eyes narrowed, and with a frustrated grunt he sped forward to re-engage. They're evenly matched, Guy said slowly, staring openly. That girl is keeping up with Neji. Kakashi, when did she learn to see Tenkatsu? Neji sparred with her only two weeks ago. She's been able to since before I took them as students, Kakashi shrugged. It's likely a result of training every day in the academy. She's made more progress in the last few months than either of these two as well. Naruto grinned fiercely, though kept his eyes fixed on the fight below, Sasuke gave an approving nod and did the same. Guy stared at them, shook his head, and looked worriedly back to Hinata and Neji. Lee seemed unable to speak, eyes wide as he focused on the fight. The tone of the skirmish changed abruptly as Neji leapt back, his breathing labored and his expression strained. Hanada appeared just as winded, but she met his gaze and waited as calmly as she could manage. This shouldn't be happening. She isn't this strong. It has to be a trick. His mind worked itself into knots trying to figure it out, but he simply couldn't. Nobody could change that much in such a short time. Nobody could change that much period. You were not born to be great. You were not meant to be a shinobi at all. Cutting his mental tirade short, Neji leaned into a familiar stance, and Hanada stiffened. Hake. 64 palms. Neji growled as he sped forward. This would take care of her, he was sure of it. His eyes went wide, however, when she eased back into an unknown stance. Shugohawk. 64 palms. Hanada cried. Neji might have had time to be surprised if he wasn't already driving the first two strikes towards her. They were both turned aside by his adversary in two smooth motions. The next four met a similar end, missing their marks by only a fraction of a centimeter. Neji grew increasingly frustrated as the next eight missed, and then every one of the subsequent sixteen. Only a single tenkatsu out of the next thirty-two was struck, but it was enough to make Hanada falter. She turned the error into a clean backbend allowing half a dozen strikes to fly above her until she regained her balance and deflected the rest. Neji halted upon his technique's completion, frozen in shock with both arms still out. 
Hanada was much more worn out than he was, but she had managed to avoid all but one of the 126 strikes. All but one. Figures the one she misses hits her near a vital organ, Sasuke muttered, gripping the railing tighter than he intended. Hanada staggered back slightly, managing to keep her feet. A trickle of blood was running down from the corner of her mouth. Lung, probably, her breathing is too short to be caused by exhaustion alone. His sharingan shimmered as he clenched his teeth. Naruto put a hand on his shoulder for a second before speaking clearly. Something like that won't stop Hanada. Naruto said it with such conviction that even Kakashi looked down at him. She finally mastered that technique too, remember? Hake. 64 palms. Hanada gasped, blurring forward to begin her own sequence. Neji braced himself, letting out a curse as he was forced to twist to avoid the first two hits. Four strikes. His eyes went wide as two of the blows struck Tenkatsu, and he could feel the chakra flow cease. Eight strikes. This can't be, he panicked. She isn't this strong. A very small, but very real part of his mind reasoned that she was. He ground his teeth, and in that moment decided it was time to end the match. Midway through the next series, half of which hit home, he made his move. Hakusho. Revolving heaven. The air crackled around Neji as he spun, and in the space between one of Hanada's strikes and the next she was thrown backwards in a violent whirlwind of chakra. A veritable dome of pure chakra surrounded Neji, and his rapid spinning created an arching slice in the stone floor. When he slid to a halt a few seconds later, he was standing in the middle of a small crater created entirely by his own explosive chakra. Hanada lay still on the floor a few meters away. That, Neji breathed, still panting from the exertion, is the difference in skill between us, Hanada-sama. Hanada, Naruto whispered, stunned gaze fixed on his fallen friend. Sasuke's eyes were hard on Neji, and Kakashi sighed behind them. Neji is a genius of the Hyuga clan, Lee said gravely, closing his eyes for a moment. Hanada-san is strong, but he is, stronger. He opened his eyes, then blinked several times to make sure he was comprehending the scene correctly. Hanada was slowly standing, and though her arms were shaking as she did so she pushed herself from the ground determinedly. I, I hit enough of your tenkatsu, Hanada coughed, more blood trickling to her chin. That won't be enough to finish me, Neji Nisan. Despite her apparently confident statement, she was entirely unsure of herself. Hanada had only heard of that technique, but it was just as formidable as it had been touted to be. It was a defense that nothing could get through. Unless, the blind spot, though she had mostly matched her cousin's speed, his experience granted him a larger chakra pool and increased arsenal of abilities. She was already feeling drained, having expended plenty of chakra on her jukan strikes with the two taxing techniques on top. Her only chance was exploiting their dujutsu's one weak point. It was time to break from tradition. Hanada's hands flashed into seals before she slammed her palm into the ground causing the stones to buckle directly underneath. Doden. Earth rupture. Neji flipped back as the ground was devoured, narrowly avoiding the ability. Mid-flight, however, he was hit by a burst of wind from another jutsu that sent him skidding off course. By the time he saw the kanai, it was nearly too late. Neji tumbled to across the ground, leaving a trail of red behind him. Hanada was no longer where she had been. She landed heavily and dropped to one knee, gasping in breath and clutching her side. Those who might have followed her movements would have seen her releasing the gale palm technique, then breaking it off early to disappear in a blur of speed. She threw the kanai even before she had stopped moving so that Neji wouldn't have been able to see it coming, and that had been her goal. You, he snarled, shaking in pain and anger alike as he forced himself from the ground. Hanada froze as he did so, eyes going wide. The knife had missed its mark and dug into his upper back below the shoulder. If I hadn't shifted my weight at the last possible instant, I could have died. Hanada clenched her jaw and shook her head weakly. Only unconscious, Hanada breathed, the icy grip of fear threatening to take her. She had aimed her kanai to hit next to the spinal column, and it had been that slightest degree of difference that had allowed Neji to dodge. He spat out a cold laugh at that, swaying slowly to his feet. So you missed on purpose so that you wouldn't risk killing me. You really are. He winced, clutching at his shoulder. You're weak.
For a few seconds those words raked at Hinata, but only for that short time before she forced them away. You're wrong, Neji Nisan. I am not the same as I was before, she repeated with as much fervor as she could manage. It came out frail, but the tone held. Neji ground his teeth once again and took a step forward. Hanada coughed and blood spattered across the ground, but to the entire rooms as she found her way painfully to her feet once more. That alone seemed to enrage Neji further, and he took the last few steps at a run. The ensuing combat happened fast, though not as rapidly as the first encounter. Both Jenin were exhausted, though only one was forced to fight with a punctured lung. But Hinata held her ground and put everything she had into those final seconds. Neji saw an opening at the same instant that she did, and they both went for it. Hinata forced every ounce of chakra she had left into that last attack. Two brilliant bursts of chakra flared out behind each of them, and then everything went quiet. Neji's palm was pressed against Hinata's heart, and her hand was trembling near his own. He wore a triumphant smirk for the briefest moment before he tensed and lurched backwards, falling to one knee. Blood spilled from his mouth as he coughed, and his hands began to shake. Hanada, though, was falling. She hit the ground a breath later, whimpered once, and became very still. Her form's only motion came from extremely shallow breathing that seemed to be getting weaker by the second. An instant later Neji's killer intent spiked, and Hayate took a step back at the sudden intensity. The two genin had fought their way across the room, and he wouldn't be able to react fast enough if the boy did something rash. Hayuga Hinata appears unable to continue. Hayuga Neji is the winner. The fight is over, he called sharply, but Neji wasn't listening. Neji reached back and tore the kunai loose from his shoulder with a grunt, staggering forward. It wasn't difficult to determine his objective. The guard rail where Naruto and Sasuke had been standing crunched as it bent inward, and before anybody could blink Neji was being held in place by Kakashi, Guy, Lee, and Sasuke. Nobody registered the orange comet that had arrived first, but whatever the light had been it was gone now. Naruto was at Hinata's side, cradling her head in one hand and cupping her cheek with the other. Hinata-chan, he said gently, fighting down his fury and flooding dread. Hinata-chan, can you hear me? A long, tense moment passed before she moaned weakly. Her eyelashes fluttered until her eyes were half-lidded, unfocused as they looked up at Naruto. Naruto. Kum. He smiled down at her and nodded, a few unbidden tears falling on her face. Hanada blinked slowly, bleary and confused. Why are you so sad? I promise I, I did my best. She closed her eyes again, consciousness once again slipping away. You did great, Naruto said softly, wiping at his eyes. You were amazing, Hanada-chan. He held her like that until the medics arrived a few seconds later, explaining quickly to them what had happened. It was likely they were fully aware, but it made Naruto feel a little better. As they prepared to take her to the infirmary he turned to Kakashi, who was just stepping back from Neji. The boy was on the ground now, breathing hard and wincing at every movement. Kakashi-sensei, you can tell me about the rest of the matches later. I'm going with Hinata. Naruto. You can't, he started, but Sasuke cut him off. I'm going too. I dare you to tell us we can't go with her. Sasuke's voice was so low and vicious that Kakashi almost took a step back on instinct. Lee nodded, and Guy placed a hand on Kakashi's shoulder. Let them go, Kakashi. Their fires of youth burn brightest together. He said it in a way so matter-of-fact that, despite its odd presentation nobody questioned what he meant. The blonde smiled slightly at the eccentric Junin before running after the stretcher, keeping pace all the way out the door with Sasuke at his side. Those three are impressive, Guy said as they departed, eyes on the door. Neji was retrieved a few seconds later by a separate medical team, though neither he nor Lee offered to accompany them. They surprise me more every day, Kakashi sighed running his hand through his silvery hair. They're the epitome of what a good team should be, and I'm lucky to have them. And they're lucky to have you, Guy pointed out with a broad grin, slapping his old friend on the back. The friendly gesture made Kakashi cough and stagger forward a step, eliciting a bark of laughter from the other man. As Kakashi led the way back to the balcony, he glanced back to the door that his team had disappeared behind as he 
A small smile creased the corners of his eyes, and he tugged his forehead protector down with an accompanying shake of his head. Well done, Team 7. Incredibly, undeniably well done. Chapter 14. Requited. It was quiet when Hanada finally came back to consciousness. The scent of wildflowers drifted to her from nearby, and no harsh lights invaded past her closed eyelids. She was warm and comfortable despite feeling short of breath. Her ribcage felt a little constricted, though not painfully so. There was an inexplicable pressure by her right leg, and another on her hand. It felt nice to just lie there in the dimness, but eventually curiosity got the better of her. Pale eyes opened slowly. They felt heavier than usual, the reason for which eluded Hanada no matter how hard she concentrated on it. Her head felt fuzzy. A bit of panic took hold of her when she found only darkness, and on instinct she tried to sit up. Before she could even lift her head a searing agony stabbed through her chest. She took in a sharp breath and eased up immediately, it took a few seconds for the stabbing pain to dwindle to a dull throb. Try to lie still. Hanada would have jumped out of her skin if she could have moved at all. Sasuke's voice sounded strange and far away, but it had startled her nonetheless. She tried to speak, but all that came out was a weak, dry croak. Hang on. I'll get you some water. Shapes were finally starting to come into focus. Hanada's eyes traveled slowly around the small room. She could tell now that she was in a hospital. She was lying in a bed with a large window on her right and a medical curtain on her left. It was pulled back so that she could see the door, and there was a narrow table along the wall opposite her bed. Flowers covered every available space on the table and threatened to spill onto the floor. The room was dark, lit only by the soft glow from a crescent moon. Sasuke slid off of the windowsill, moving carefully around her bed to a stand on the other side. He retrieved a bottle that had apparently been set aside for her, leaning over to put its straw to her lips. Hanada drank slowly, grateful for the cool water that seemed to wash away a bit of the murkiness lingering in her mind. There was still that odd pressure against her right leg and the comfortable weight atop her hand. Her head had been propped up at some point, but she was still unable to see down far enough to check what it was. After a moment she nodded very slightly, and Sasuke withdrew the drink. Thank you, she managed, though it came out as barely more than a whisper. Sasuke nodded and set the bottle down, then sank into a chair next to her. Don't mention it. He didn't say anything for a time after that, allowing Hanada to gather her thoughts. She remembered everything in vivid detail. Trading blows, missing the blind spot, feeling Neji's chakra course through her chest, and then falling. A vague recollection of Naruto's features played about in her head, but it was hard to place. How long? She ventured licking futilely at her cracked lips. It's been nearly two days, Sasuke responded evenly, she saw him out of the corner of her eye giving her a wry smirk. I'm sure your hand's numb by now, Naruto hasn't left since you got here. He was trying to stay awake until you woke up, but he finally fell asleep about an hour ago. Naruto. Kun. Hanada asked blearily, she had thought that the room was empty outside the two of them. Sasuke raised an eyebrow and his eyes flicked to the other side of the bed. He's pretty much been there the whole time. The medic nin in charge of your surgery assured us that you weren't in any life-threatening danger, but I guess you know best how he can be when he's worried. She blinked several times, processing his words slowly. Hanada carefully lifted her head, and even that minor action caused no small amount of strain. Before her head fell back she caught a glimpse of Naruto's shock of blonde hair. The side of his face was resting on the bed by her thigh, and his hand was covering hers. He looked almost as tired as she felt. There were tears building in the corners of her eyes by the time she relaxed her neck again. I wasn't strong enough, she said in a quiet, tight voice. I couldn't do it. If it makes you feel any better, last I checked Neji is still unconscious, Sasuke said lightly, though when a tear broke away and started running down her cheek he sighed and leaned forward folding his hands and speaking seriously. Hanada, you were incredible. You held your own against Neji, do you think I could have done that? Even Kakashi Sensei says he's Konoha's top genin. That's not what I mean, she choked. He blinked at her a few times, and when she managed to turn her head enough for him to see her eyes they were shimmering. If I had aimed, for the vertebrae instead of to its side, I could have, one. 
Hanada winced, her breath coming short as she tried to calm herself down. Sasuke was on his feet again, resting a hand on her shoulder and looking a little worried. It's all right, Hanada. If your kanai had hit his spine he might have died. She coughed. Her heart rate was rising quickly, and with every beat a vice tightened around her chest. Are crippled. But, but. Hey, hey. Sasuke soothed, his tone fully concerned now. Take a minute and just breathe. Breathe. Hanada shut her eyes tight and tried, focusing on her pulse and willing herself to calm down. Getting too emotional in her state could cause complications. It took nearly five minutes for her already shallow breathing to get back to normal, and when she finally opened her eyes they were dry and a little unfocused. Her voice was calm again, albeit hoarse. But I couldn't. She sounded tired now, and every syllable carried with it a modicum of doubt and old, deep-seated self-loathing that Sasuke couldn't have missed if he'd tried. He was right. I'm too weak. Not cut out to be a shinobi. Um. Hanada-chan. Stop that. They both froze. Sasuke's lips were parted in an unspoken response when his eyes traveled down to where Naruto lay slumbering. The blonde boy's eyes were still closed, and he had inadvertently started nuzzling Hanada's hand in his sleep. He made a few more sleepy noises before concluding his muttering. No. Stop. I don't want any broccoli. Hanada couldn't help it. She laughed, though the sound came out a bit choked. She squeezed his hand as tightly as she could. What would Naruto-kun say if he heard me right now? Crying and feeling sorry for myself, he'd be ashamed of me. Sasuke was shaking his head and smiling faintly, it wasn't his typical smirk, either. Both corners of his lips were quirked up as he turned his eyes back to her. You know as well as I do just how wrong that is, Hanada. You know what Naruto would say if he were awake. She closed her eyes, and her head tilted forward slightly in a nod. He continued regardless, knowing it was best she heard it from somebody. He'd tell you that what you did isn't considered weak, because kindness isn't the same thing as weakness. Even though Neji didn't deserve it, you chose not to win the match if it meant putting his life in danger. That took more strength than he'll ever have. It was a gradual thing, but after a few minutes of silence Hanada began to reign in her negative thoughts. It took a lot more effort than expected, but somewhere deep down she knew that Sasuke was right. He wouldn't lie to her. And if she really, truly thought hard on it, even she was surprised by how well she had done against Neji. Kakashi Sensei. He did say not to prioritize the mission over our comrades, right? Right. Sasuke agreed. I'm not sure I can think of Neji as a comrade after that, but I understand that he's your family. You did the right thing, Hanada. She smiled faintly, her eyes already sliding closed. He watched her for a moment before moving back around to the window, slipping back on the sill. In her state that conversation had likely taken a lot out of her, it would be best to let her rest. Thank you. She mumbled, already nodding off. Get some rest, Sasuke said quietly, his eyes turning contemplatively out towards the moon. Naruto would get mad at me if he knew I was keeping you up. Hanada didn't hear him. The last things she remembered of that night were Naruto's hand squeezing her own, and thinking just how lucky she was to have such friends. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. It's hard to believe that Lee San got beaten. Naruto shook his head. He could believe it, though. Gara had been Lee's opponent. I'm glad Guy stopped it in time, though. How's he doing? He asked, leaning back against his pillow and resting his head on the wall. Hanada sat next to him on her hospital bed, looking a great deal healthier than she had a few days earlier. She was still weak, but able to sit up next to him. She was only leaning on his arm a little because the support was necessary, of course. He's bedridden for a little while, which upset him quite a bit. But Guy keeps reminding him that if Gara had gotten that last attack off, he could have been crippled for life. Kakashi stood at the foot of the bed with his hands in his pockets, examining his team. Sasuke was perched on the windowsill as usual, reading a book that Haku had recommended. The color had fully returned to Hinata's face now, and her demeanor was more or less back to normal. Naruto was his typical self, though markedly quieter out of consideration for his injured friend. Haku was there as well, mirroring Sasuke on the other side of the sill and reading another novel. Guy wanted me to thank you, 
By the way, he continued, looking pointedly to Naruto. The boy tilted his head and raised an eyebrow, the action brought the side of his head into contact with the top of Hanada's. Kakashi was glad to note that the girl was feeling well enough to blush again. Thank me for what? You were the one who warned them about Gara. If you hadn't told me about Gara, I wouldn't have been able to warn Lee to be careful. The Hokage forbade me from telling any specifics, but Guy knows me well enough to take me on my word. When he saw that look in Gara's eyes when Lee was down, he stopped the fight immediately. Kakashi shrugged and leaned back against the wall, almost knocking over one of the flower vases in the process. So in effect, you saved Lee's career as a ninja, and possibly his life. If you want to get that technical, Naruto responded dryly, flexing his fingers around Hinata's, you should thank the Kyubi. He's the one who told me. Kakashi blinked at that, and then cast a sharp look at Haku. He hadn't moved at all save to lick his finger and flip a page. We told him, Sasuke said dismissively, flipping the pages of his book every few seconds. Kakashi could see the red of his irises in the window's faint reflection, why hadn't he ever thought to read through Ika Ika Paradise with his Sharingan? The Junin sighed and ran his fingers through his hair. Check with me before you share sensitive information with anybody in the future, understand? Haku may be your friend, but he's my responsibility. That knowledge is dangerous for anybody to have, but even more so for somebody not of our village. Haku flinched very slightly, which surprised Kakashi enough to make him stop. The boy wasn't one to convey many emotions openly. Maybe he was being too strict. After all, Haku had been accepted into their fold, and he had proven willing to follow Kakashi's orders and help Team 7 in whatever ways he could. When are you and Sasuke leaving for training? Hanada asked after a moment. Her voice was nearly back to its usual strength, just a bit quieter and only touched with fatigue. Today, I actually came here to get him. You're coming with us too, Haku. The pair on the windowsill looked up at the same time, and it was difficult to tell who was more surprised. I'm going to be working with Sasuke on his physical endurance, strength, and speed primarily. If he's going to be fighting Gara, he'll need it. You can help him with his speed like you have already, just more, intensely. Sasuke almost shuddered at the thought of nearly a month of training with Kakashi, but Haku just beamed. I'd be glad to, Kakashi-sensei, the older boy said immediately. If I can be of use to Sasuke-kun, I will. You're helping me, Sasuke corrected, grimacing at Haku's choice of words. I'm not using you. Of course. Haku smiled at him, and Sasuke got the feeling that his friend didn't understand the difference at all. Naruto. Kakashi began again, turning to give his other student a level look. I didn't object to your spending time with Hinata while she was recovering, but now that she's clearly all right again I expect you to start your training. I've arranged for you to start this afternoon. You are to meet your instructor at our usual gathering point at 2 o'clock. Got it. Yes, sensei. Are you going to tell me who it is yet? Naruto sighed and unlaced his fingers from Hinata's, stretching upwards. I still think I'd do better training by myself, and with Hinata-chan when she's better. You'll think otherwise soon enough. Sasuke. Haku. Let's go. Good luck, Naruto, and I hope you're fully recovered soon Hinata. Kakashi waved as Naruto nodded and Hinata gave him a small smile. Sasuke closed his book and stuffed it in his back pouch before sliding off the windowsill, stepping over to the bed and holding out his fist to Naruto. The blonde grinned and wrapped his friend's knuckles. Sasuke then extended his arm to Hinata, who blinked at it for a second before giggling lightly and pressing her closed fist against his. Oh, Sasuke, Naruto began, stopping Sasuke before he could step away. I forgot to ask how your date with Sakura went. That was last night, right? Yeah, it was, he shrugged. It went a lot better than I expected it to. I'll tell you how the next one goes in more detail. We're supposed to go out again when I get back from training. Naruto raised an eyebrow, and Hinata's eyes widened. He flashed them both a smirk before continuing nonchalantly. See you two in a few weeks. Don't get in too much trouble without me. Sasuke turned and put his hands in his pockets, walking to the door behind Kakashi. Haku smiled at Naruto and Hinata, gave them a knowing, mischievous wink, and then hurried after Sasuke. 
A moment later they were gone, leaving the pair to themselves. Hanada started absently tracing lines in Naruto's palm with her thumb, waiting a few seconds before speaking up. You have to leave in an hour, yeah. It wasn't really a question. Of course he needed to. Naruto nodded anyway, looking distracted. Hanada could tell what he was thinking about without having to ask. I know we talked about it already, but please don't dwell on what Neji did. It wasn't really his fault. I know, I know, Naruto sighed, though he already looked irritated. The thing with the branch family and the head family, he's got that cursed seal on his forehead, his dad died when he was young. I'm not mad at him for going so hard on you, well, I am, but whatever. I just, he struggled for a second, then exhaled deeply again. I just can't forgive him for trying to kill you, for intending to kill you even after the match was over. Hanada winced. They had told her about it when she had come fully back to consciousness, and it was difficult to think about. She had decided to keep their conversation within the arena to herself. They had overheard some of it, but she knew Naruto and Sasuke would be livid if they were privy to the whole thing. Even so, you promised not to do any more than necessary to win. Don't let him get to you. She quieted then and flushed wondering when she had become so forward as to demand things from naruto he didn't seem to mind though only nodding and continuing to stare at the wall thank you by the way that seemed to snap him out of whatever daze he was in and he turned to blink curiously at her f for staying with me i mean i i appreciated having you here oh ah naruto reddened slightly rubbing at the back of his neck i was just really worried and I didn't want you to wake up alone in the hospital. Sorry for drooling on your hand while I was asleep, though. That didn't explain why he had been there nigh constantly since she had come to, but Hinata didn't inquire further. A demure smile lifted the corners of her lips, and she lowered her head to rest against his shoulder. He tensed for a fraction of a second, then smiled and lifted his hand from hers. Before she had time to register it his left arm had lifted over her head, settling down behind her with his hand resting near her hip. It was her turn to tense, but it lasted for quite a bit longer. N Naruto-kun, she stammered, not daring to move. Hanada didn't see his blush deepen, too concentrated on her sudden lightheadedness. What? Did I make you uncomfortable? His voice was full of concern, and he started to move his hand away a second later. Before it broke contact, however, Hanada's own hand clasped it back to her. And no, I was just surprised. Oh, he relaxed again, settling back against the pillows. Hanada kept her left hand atop his, slipping her fingers in between his own and holding on tight. Her tension began to fade away, and the two of them remained that way for a time. Hanada closed her eyes and allowed herself to enjoy the blissful silence without feeling guilty or worried, slowly beginning to piece her thoughts together. I must have missed it happening, while I was waiting. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Naruto sighed, scowling at the creek below. He had arrived a few minutes late after falling asleep with Hinata, a memory that brought a flush back to his features. But it had been at least half an hour since then and he hadn't seen a single person pass by the bridge. The only signs of life were a few minnows drifting lazily in the water. This sucks. I could be training right now. You could have been training for the last five days. The response wasn't exactly patronizing, but it held a clear tone of disapproval. Not only was it a waste of time, but it was boring as hell. How can you just sit around with your girlfriend for that long? She was unconscious for half of it. Making sure that Hinata's okay was more important than training, Naruto retorted firmly. Besides, I did some chakra control exercises while she was sleeping. It's not exactly easy to sit on the ceiling for a few hours. The term, girlfriend, caught his attention, had the fox always referred to Hinata like that. Right, that will definitely help you when you have to fight the Hyuga boy. That kid's nothing to mess with. I'll be ready. I want to spend most of my time this month figuring out how to let more of your chakra out. I intend to use as much of it as I can against him. I told you. No, I'm telling you this time. If the Kyubi had a physical form, it might have looked to have taken a slap to the face. I haven't really argued with you up to now, but this is different. 
Neji tried to kill Hanada. I'm not going to break my promise to her. I'll only go as far as I need to. But I'm going to use everything I can up front to teach him a lesson. To Naruto's surprise, he could sense the fox grinning. Revenge. Huh. Naruto shrugged, and the Kyubi barked out a laugh. Fine, mortal. I don't object. But how do you expect to release more of my chakra? There's no noticeable change from day to day. The seal was designed to loosen gradually. Very gradually. You won't notice a difference for months to come. I don't know, but maybe somebody who knows a lot about Fuinjutsu can help. Are you sure this is the right kid, Gama? Naruto spun, dropping instinctively into a Goken stance. He hadn't sensed or heard anything, but as soon as he turned he was confronted with a sight that made his jaw drop. A massive toad, one large enough to take up the breadth of the bridge, stood no more than a meter from him, staring down with huge, flat eyes. Atop its head a man sat cross-legged, his arms folded and regarding Naruto with a dubious expression. He wasn't as old as the Hokage, but he must have been nearing 50 at least. The man had extraordinarily long white hair, held back by a broad hitaiate emblazoned with the symbol for oil. The giant amphibian let out an echoing, somehow affirmative croak. Naruto took a step back, eyes wide on the newcomers. Ah, who are, what is, what? The man raised an eyebrow, then sighed and shook his head. This is the thanks I get for my research. I get blackmailed into babysitting some clueless brat. Naruto bristled at that, standing up straight and narrowing his eyes. Are you who's supposed to be training me? He asked incredulously. Kakashi sensei said I wouldn't regret it, but he took a deep breath and relaxed a little, though he kept an eye on the toad as he amended his statement. Uruka would get upset with him if he neglected his manners, even if the old man was being rude. Sorry, I'm Uzumaki Naruto. Kakashi sensei said I was supposed to meet somebody here to start my training. He didn't even tell you my name. The man asked, his eyes showing genuine disbelief. He put a hand to his forehead in exaggerated distress, donning a look of, probably, feigned anguish. Youths these days don't know how to respect their elders. First that upstart interrupts my all-important information gathering, and now my identity is to be lost to antiquity. He glanced down at Naruto to make sure that the blonde was following along. All he received in response were a few bewildered blinks. He scowled and jumped up, striking a dramatic pose and whipping his hair in a circle before flinging it back over his shoulder. I am the renowned Toad Sage of Mayubokuzen. Toad Sage. Naruto titled his head to the side. What's that? And? What's that? He asked, pointing at Gama. The man's eyebrow twitched, and after a moment he dropped the pose and appeared to deflate some. What does it look like, kid? It's a toad. But why is it so big? Naruto received a flat look in response, and a moment later the toad erupted into a cloud of white smoke. The man landed lightly on the ground, looking the blonde boy up and down before shaking his head again, clearly exasperated. Haven't you ever heard of summoning techniques? What do they teach at the academy these days? Of course I have, Naruto said defensively. He was trying to be respectful, but it was getting harder to take the man seriously with all of the sarcasm being served up. I've just never seen anything like that. The only animals I've seen summoned are Kakashi Sensei's Ninkan and some big snakes. As soon as the last word left his lips, the sage's demeanor changed and he sobered considerably. Snakes. Huh, I heard about your little encounter with Orochimaru. Naruto balked at that, tensing for a second before responding carefully. Only the Junin instructors and the Hokage are supposed to know about that. I've never seen you before, how do you know about it? His inquiry was met with a gruff laugh, and the man sidled past him to lean over the railing. When Naruto turned to him again the odd shinobi was studying the small fish pensively, all hints of his previous eccentric behavior were gone. It's not important how I know. He was quiet for a while after that, and eventually Naruto moved beside him to watch the stream as well. The white-haired man cast a furtive glance at the boy and grinned slightly. He looks just like you, Minato. I wonder if he's as strong as the rumors say. Naruto noticed his smirk and looked up curiously. Well, I told Kakashi that I'd only talk to him, but we'll see what he can do first. All right kid. I can't train you unless I know what you're capable of. I know that you have a lot of chakra, 
that you prefer taijutsu over ninjutsu, and that you can't do any genjutsu to save your life. Naruto scowled as he went on, but didn't argue. The sage smirked and continued. I also happen to know that you have access to a different chakra source, correct? He seemed to be choosing his words carefully, but Naruto still froze and paled slightly. How do you? The man waved a hand dismissively, cutting him off. I told you kid, how isn't important. I have reason to believe that you also know what the chakra is, and why you have it. Naruto said nothing, but nodded stiffly. I didn't expect him to be open about it, but he's a lot more closed up than I expected. So, tell me about it. I, Naruto hesitated, thinking hard. Uruka had told him that he could share the information with anybody he chose to, within reason. He knew nothing about this stranger. No matter how the man presented himself, it could be a bad idea to tell him about the Kyubi. I'd like to know who you are first. It's not something I talk to people about, and if you really did know about it you'd be treating me differently than you are. That earned him a surprised look, and the older ninja considered it for a moment. Treat him differently. What? He understood a moment later after he saw the expression that Naruto was holding. The boy was defensive and untrusting, and of more than just him. Maybe he had come on a little strong, but that alone wouldn't be enough to back the kid into a corner. Damned villagers, he thought bitterly, grimacing back at the creek. He shrugged then, sighing in mock exasperation. My name is Jiraiya. Don't go bragging to your friends about meeting me, either. Naruto's brow furrowed, and after a few seconds he gave a start and straightened. Before last week he hadn't heard that name before, but following the confrontation with Orochimaru he had asked Hinata about the Sanin she had mentioned. And unless this man simply shared the name. You're. One of the Sanin. The knowing wink Jiraiya gave him didn't exactly provide any proof, but something about his nonchalant, confident mannerisms gave Naruto the feeling that he wasn't lying. You at least know that the three Sanin are famous for their summons, right? Well, I'm the Toad Sage, my contract is with Toads of Mount Mayuboku. Orochimaru has one with snakes of Ryauchi Cave, and Tsunade's is with the slug Katsuyu of Shikatsu Forest. You can ask your sensei if you don't believe me, but he is the one who asked me to come here. More like twisted my arm, but it might yet prove to be interesting. That explanation seemed to satisfy Naruto for the time being, he wasn't about to take Jiraiya's word without asking Kakashi first, but it was enough to make him act with a little more respect. After a moment's consideration he bowed to the older man, inclining his head to a similar degree as he would for the Sandane. Jiraiya scowled again, but Naruto didn't seem to notice. I apologize for being rude, Jiraiya-sama, I. Okay. Okay. Kid, Naruto, right. If I'm going to be helping with your training, just call me, Jiraiya-sensei. You don't have to be so formal. Now, just tell me what you know about your chakra. He seemed more flustered than annoyed, but Naruto only nodded and adopted an apprehensive expression. He probably already knows. He's one of the Hokage's students, and he's old enough to remember the events of that wretched day. He didn't react the same way towards me as the other villagers, though. If he knew about you, would he have agreed to train me? I know it's hard to believe, the Kyubi stated wryly, but not everybody is a narrow-minded imbecile. That's a surprising thing to hear you say. It was odd to be found teasing the fox, but its rumbling growl gave him a bit of satisfaction from it. I know it's from the Kayubi no Kitsune, Naruto stated simply, shrugging as he turned back to the water. We started working together a few months ago, and he's been teaching me how to use his chakra. Apparently this was not the response that Jiraiya had been expecting. You and the demon fox started to what? The sage nearly sputtered, eyes widening. Naruto fidgeted a little before shrugging again. I can use the Kayubi's chakra when I need to, he said again. Before I could only use it when I was. Well, it was usually when I was really mad. But I talked to him about it and we decided that it was in our best interest that I learn how to use it normally, like it was just another energy source or something. He always says it should be used as an extension of my chakra, for things that take a lot of energy to do. If I need to make more than 50 shadow clones, for example, it makes more sense to use his chakra so I won't be as drained by it. He stopped there, growing more uncomfortable at Jiraiya's increasingly disbelieving countenance. Well, 
The man started after a recomposing himself. He coughed, shaking his head as he stared thoughtfully over Naruto's shoulder, his eyes unfocused. I expected you to know about it, and maybe even know where it was from. But I didn't expect you to be able to use it at will already. Already. Jiraiya nodded and turned his gaze back to Naruto. Follow me. I'll show you what I mean. He turned and began walking, his sandals clacking upon the bridge's wooden planks. Naruto hurried to fall in beside Jiraiya, his mind racing at the sage's words. It took only a few minutes to reach the nearest secluded area, the third training ground. Naruto smiled faintly when he saw the three wooden posts near the memorial stone. It felt like it had been so long since they had passed Kakashi's test there, even though it had been only a few short months ago. Jiraiya led him to the center post, smirking and placing his hand fondly on it. Before Naruto could say anything, the man turned towards him and folded his arms. All right, Naruto, take your coat and shirt off. Naruto raised an eyebrow, but did as he was told without arguing. He placed his long black coat on one of the poles, his gray shirt following shortly after. Good, now start channeling a bit of the Kyubi's chakra. It doesn't matter where or for what purpose. Just send some to the soles of your feet for now, like you're walking on water or something. Naruto nodded, concentrating the chakra as instructed. As he did, the seal over his torso appeared, it was something that he was still trying to get used to. Hanada had noticed it first when he had begun training with the Kyubi's chakra, and since then he realized that it showed up every time the demon fox's chakra was accessed. This was made using the 8 trigram sealing technique, Jiraiya mused, kneeling in front of Naruto and examining the markings. A thick spiral was nestled between two intricate arcs above and below, each containing flowing runes and symbols that branched outward at four points. It looked like a tattoo on his stomach, but much clearer as if it had been drawn with fresh ink. You see these two individual seals? He pointed to the two arcs, then moved his finger to where they almost connected to form a circle around the spiral center. Each one is a four symbol seal, a special jutsu meant to contain something inside of something else. When the fourth sealed the Kyubi, it looks like he used two on purpose. See the spaces here on either side, where they don't quite connect to form a circle. Naruto nodded, entranced by the explanation. I suspect he did that on purpose, to allow space for the demon's chakra to leak out and mix with your own. What I meant before is that the Yandaimi likely intended for you to be able to use the Kyubi's chakra eventually, it may have been his way of protecting you. But I don't think even he would have expected that you'd be able to use it at will already. He stood slowly, eyes lingering on the seal before nodding again. Now show me what you can do with it. Naruto hesitated for only a moment before stepping back turning inward for a moment first. You don't mind, right? Are you kidding? This guy could help loosen the seal. Go all out and show him what you're capable of, and maybe he'll consider it. Naruto nodded, which earned him a befuddled look from Jiraiya. He wasn't interested in explaining that he could talk to the Kyubi at will, so instead he just brought out as much chakra as he could. Jiraiya smirked as the vermilion cloak crept up around Naruto. The chakra was fundamentally different than most. Normally when chakra was strong enough to be seen it took on an appearance not unlike fire. Jiraiya was surprised to see, however, that it looked more like thick reddish liquid, with small bubbles throughout that gave it the appearance of perpetually boiling water. The single tail twitched back and forth behind him, like it was trying to get a better view of Jiraiya. But Naruto didn't appear to be finished yet. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu a breath later the clearing was packed with orange-shrouded Naruto's, all bare-chested and looking at the sage with a myriad of expressions. Some seemed curious, others excited, the majority appeared calm and patient, simply waiting for whatever comment the man had to offer. Interesting. Very interesting. Kid, is that all the chakra you can use? Yes, Naruto responded slowly, allowing the few dozen clones to disperse. I can use it like that to make me faster and stronger or I can use it to make my ninjutsu more powerful. I'm still working on doing both at once. It's hard to concentrate on using it like this, balancing it with my own chakra, and then mixing both for ninjutsu. Jiraiya stared at him for a time before shaking his head again, chuckling. You've got a lot on your plate, I see. 
That chakra source should let you perform summoning techniques with relative ease, they generally require a large amount of chakra. How would you like to learn? Naruto blinked at him as he allowed the chakra to fade, retrieving his clothes while he thought it over. Summoned animals are supposed to help you when you need them, right? He asked after slipping back into his shirt. Jiraiya nodded, and Naruto paused in picking up his coat. That toad you were riding earlier was huge. How big do they usually get? At that his new sensei laughed. That was Gama, one of the average-sized toad summons. He likes to get outside of Mount Mayuboku for some fresh air, and he's a great friend, so I summon him from time to time. The biggest toads, however. He thought for a moment, and then grinned broadly. If Gamabunta was standing at the base of the academy, his head might reach the faces of the Hokage monument. Naruto's lips parted in wordless surprise, and he coughed once or twice before he was able to respond. Ah, right, so you can, summon one of those huge toads to do stuff for you. Yes and no, Jiraiya responded cryptically, letting the boy muddle in confusion before continuing. A summoning jutsu is what's called a space-time technique, one that manipulates people or objects and sends them through a dimensional. Dot dot quote. He trailed off upon seeing Naruto's puzzled expression, and he sighed and rubbed at the back of his neck. It was a complicated subject to teach a 12-year-old. The important part is that when you summon something, it gets taken from one place and put in another instantly. There's no travel time, it just appears where you summon it. Get it. Naruto nodded and Jiraiya decided that sticking with simplicity would be best for now. Signing a contract with an animal aspect gives you the right and permission to call upon them. However, that doesn't mean that they have to come help you. You're not their master. If Gama was busy when I wanted to summon him, he could refuse to come. He'd also be able to tell that I was the one trying to summon him. Conversely, an animal summon can choose to summon you in what's called a reverse summon. So far I haven't been able to figure out how to refuse one of those, he laughed, though the statement made Naruto a little nervous. But it would only happen in an emergency I'm sure, or with your permission. Any questions? Anyo. You keep mentioning a contract, sensei. What do you mean? Jiraiya nodded and took a few steps to the side. He lifted his hand and bit down hard on his thumb, drawing blood immediately. His hands went through a series of seals. Boar dog, bird, monkey, and ram, in deliberately slow movements so that Naruto could follow along. After the final seal he leaned down and pressed his palm to the ground. Kuchio's no jutsu, black lines shot out from his palm, spreading across the ground like living ink. They twisted in what looked to be a foreign script, and in almost the same instant a circle of the same design appeared all around Jiraiya's hand, connecting the lines. Before Naruto could study the markings closely, a plume of white smoke burst forth from the pattern, concealing the sage for a few seconds. When it cleared, he was once again sitting atop Gamma's head, grinning down at Naruto smugly. The large frog had its tongue lolling out, holding a sizable scroll in its slimy clutches. It lowered the document carefully, and Jiraiya dropped to the ground beside it. Whoa! Naruto breathed, even if this guy isn't actually Jiraiya he can do some really cool stuff. He seems to know a lot, too, the fox pointed out. Would have been better if he was a sage of something other than frogs, though, I hate frogs. Why, not that I'm surprised that you hate something. Frogs are food, and don't get cheeky with me, mortal. This is the contract you'd have to sign in order to be allowed to summon toads, Jiraiya said, brandishing the big cylindrical parchment. You sign it with your own blood, and the contract is binding even after death, if somebody were to get a hold of your blood, they could use the summoning technique as well. He flipped the scroll over and unraveled it, displaying a series of signatures with accompanying fingerprints alongside blank spaces for future contractees. The most recent name read, Jiraiya, with the one preceding spelling out, Namikaze Minato. The fourth Hokage had a contract with the toads. Naruto stared at the name, the other, more faded ones didn't even register. I, he did. Minato was my student, you know. Jiraiya was smiling when Naruto looked up at him, he could see more respect building behind those blue eyes. But, he chewed on his lower lip, looking back to the scroll. Isn't this kind of a big decision to make? 
Aruka always said to think hard about big decisions, and try to sleep on it at least. He could hear the fox laughing at him, but he ignored it. I suppose it is, Jiraiya said slowly, watching Naruto. But you can always make more than one contract if you want, you're not bound to one if you don't want to be. Just don't go trying to summon more than one or you could be in for a rough time. I wouldn't sign it, kid. Why not? Being able to summon a toad like Gamabunta might be really helpful sometime. I fought Gamabunta once, the Kyubi started matter of factly. Naruto was taken aback not only at the knowledge, but at the fox using the name of something rather than referring to it passively. The measure of respect was, strange. The Yandaimi summoned him to fight me twelve years ago before sealing me away. He's definitely strong, but you're better off finding your own summon that's less likely to have a grudge against me. Besides, I hate frogs. Naruto chuckled aloud, eliciting a growl from the Kyubi and a questioning eyebrow from Jiraiya. I appreciate the honor, Jiraiya-sensei. Do you mind if I think about it for a while first? The man nodded to him and resealed the scroll, tossing it back for Gama to hold. It's your blood. There's plenty of other stuff you can do with that chakra. I can teach you a few things, I suppose. Jiraiya's expression changed to one of apparent severity and intense consideration, and he seemed to study Naruto carefully for a time. I need to get back to my research for today, but I want you to spend the rest of daylight practicing with molding the Kyubi's chakra with your own into techniques. Kakashi tells me that your ninjutsu is the weaker of your salvageable skills, so work hard on the techniques you're learning. I'll meet you back here tomorrow morning at 10, got it? Yes, sensei, Naruto said immediately, grinning up at Jiraiya. The man gave him a calculated nod and turned, disappearing back into the woods and chatting at Gama the whole way. I wonder what kind of research he does. With the way he was talking about it I guess it must be something important, and maybe even secret. Beats me, the Kyubi yawned. Just make sure to ask him tomorrow about the seal. I want to be able to stretch my proverbial legs a bit more. Yeah, yeah, I will. Now focus and help me with this training. I'm still not that good at maintaining the partial cloak and using ninjutsu. The red-orange chakra sprang back up around him, though only as a haze and without the tail formed. All you need to do is focus. You humans and your one-track brains are aggravating. Despite the snide remark, the Kyubi helped Naruto stay focused on the task at hand. He did as Jiraiya had instructed, beginning work on a lightning technique Sasuke had shown him a few weeks before while making sure to keep his entire body covered with the fox's chakra at the same time. It would prove to be a frustrating afternoon. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Hanada-chan. You have visitors. Hanada's eyes fluttered open at the sound of a familiar voice, it was the kindly nurse that frequently checked up on her. Visitors. She quickly rubbed at the corners of her eyes, blinking the sleep away before the door opened. Judging by the soft light flowing in from the window it was nearing sunset. Naruto he would still be training until after dark, and Sasuke and Haku were gone with Kakashi. Please, come in, Hanada responded a little louder carefully sitting up and propping a few pillows behind her. Hey there ninja princess, Tenten greeted her, smiling warmly from behind the nurse as she stepped in. Feeling better. After a moment's confusion Hanada's features lit up with a smile of her own, tinged with a blush at her friend's choice of words. It's good to see you, Tenten senpei. I'm feeling much better, thank you. While Tenten made her way to the long table to set down some fresh flowers, the nurse waited by the door, her gaze cast out into the hallway. I still don't think it's a good idea for you to be up and about yet, Li Kun, the woman worried. A few seconds later Li came limping into the room with a crutch under one arm and a fierce, determined grin on his face. This is nothing, I'll never fully recover if I don't push myself. He grunted as he crossed the threshold, and the nurse only sighed and gave Hanada a weak smile before leaving them to themselves. Li Senpei. Hanada started concernedly as Tenten helped ease him into a chair. Are you sure you're okay to be out of bed? Of course. He responded emphatically, straightening as soon as he was settled. She barely even noticed his wince. I had to come speak to you. He leaned forward, his voluminous eyebrows furrowed as he took on a serious expression. You fought on par with Neji, Hanada-san. And what's more, 
You rendered him unconscious so that he could not see my secret move in the fight against Gara of the Sand. I am indebted to you. He bowed his head to her, causing a renewed blush to spring up on the girl's face. A Anyo. Hanada fidgeted with the sheets in her lap, not entirely sure how to respond. Luckily Tenten was there to roll her eyes and pat Lee sympathetically on the shoulder. Lee, you're being dramatic again. Although I wish I had been awake to see whatever technique you're bragging about, she grumbled, dropping into the chair next to his. Stupid fan girl. It was unfortunate that you had to fight her, Hanada sympathized, but Tenten only shook her head and laughed. I'm glad that it happened. It reminded me that we won't always get to choose who we fight. I bet the test was designed that way, so that some people would be forced into bad matchups. I mean, as a Chunin, as a squad leader, we'd have to figure out how to overcome situations like that, so it makes sense. I just need to train harder, and focus on my weak areas. Lee nodded and grinned at his teammates' determination, and Hanada couldn't help but smile as well. She admired Tenten's outlook, a perspective the older girl and Lee seemed to have in common. Have Naruto-kun and Sasuke-kun begun their training? Lee asked a moment later, intense gaze turning back to Hinata. Yes. They both left today. Kakashi-sensei is training Sasuke-kun with Haku-chan's help, and Naruto-kun went to train with. Well, she faltered. I don't know who he went to train with, but his teacher is supposed to be strong. Lee and Tenten shared a curious look, but they didn't press Hinata for details. How? How is Neji Nisan? He was only able to leave the hospital today, Tenten answered, smirking as Hanada's eyes widened slightly. You really did a number on him, I heard. Yash. Lee exclaimed, his eyes alight. It was inspiring, and I learned many things from it. Hanada san's conviction is unrivaled. She kept getting up and fighting no matter what, and. He continued into an exaggerated retelling of the encounter, and with every compliment or mention of her, heroics, Hanada flushed deeper. By the end her index fingers were pressed together so hard that they turned white, and she had long since ducked her head. Why you give me too much credit, Lee Senpei, she mumbled after he was finished, but before he could respond Tenten cut in with a chiding tone. Hanada, you're too humble, neither of us could have beaten Neji. Well, maybe Lee could have with his super secret technique, but you fought on par with him without any tricks and nearly won. He's a year your senior. Two, you should be proud of your accomplishment. Oh, and speaking of seniors, she continued firmly, you don't have to keep addressing us like that. As far as I'm concerned, we're both genin, and you've already proved that you're on the same level as we are. We're equals, and friends, Hanada chan Hanada blinked rapidly as a few tears threatened to escape the corners of her eyes. It was, more or less, the same thing Sasuke and Naruto had told her. Kakashi had even put in a similar word of praise. It was becoming more and more difficult to hold on to her own doubt. Thank you, Tenten Sen. She stopped herself when Tenten raised an eyebrow. Tenten Chan. There we go, the older Kunoichi chimed, grinning again. That wasn't so hard, was it? Hanada offered a shy smile. Tenten considered her for a moment before turning to Lee. Lee, you should go back and get some more rest. The medic nin told you yesterday that you could be out by the end of the week if you stay in bed. But I wanted to talk to Hanada-san about her fight some more, Lee protested. Tenten gave him a flat look that left no room for arguing. The boy pouted a little but bounced back to his usual perky self in no time, turning back to Hanada. Please allow me to visit again soon, I must hear about your training. Hanada nodded slowly. It was difficult to read Lee most of the time, and sometimes his exuberance put her off balance. He flashed her a toothy grin before hoisting himself up with Tenten's assistance, hobbling to the door and giving them a last thumbs up on his way out. Tenten rolled her eyes and shut the door, lowering herself back into the chair a moment later. So, she started without preamble, how are you and Naruto doing? We're. Hanada stopped abruptly with her lips still parted, and after a few bewildered blinks she turned a brilliant shade of red. Tenten let out a rich laugh that devolved into a fit of giggles. Hanada only sat there, struck dumb at being caught so unexpectedly. It had been such a matter-of-fact question and her response had been immediate. We. You still haven't told him, have you? Tenten teased lightly, 
causing Hanada to look quickly down. It took a few seconds, but she eventually shook her head, her face still burning. Tenton sighed and leaned back in her chair, still smiling. Not that it's any of my business, I guess, but you two are pretty much dating already. I just don't think either of you have realized it yet. W or not, Hanada insisted, still staring down at her hands. She was fidgeting with the sheets, too distracted to notice her fingers becoming entangled. We're just close friends. You and Sasuke are close friends, the other girl countered. I don't see you holding his hand or looking at him the same way. Hanada floundered for an appropriate response, but after a time she could only offer a small sigh and lean back against her pillows. Tenton had known since the first day they had trained together, and had made sure to ask about their relationship once or twice since. At first Hanada had answered honestly, if not in a flustered state, that she and Naruto were only friends. But now, it's, we're doing fine, she said, but the words came out tired and unsure. I think, I think we both know, but neither of us has confessed. Why not? Tenton asked, genuinely puzzled. You two have been friends for years, and by all accounts you've only gotten closer over time. A all accounts, Hanada started, glancing quickly towards Tenton. The girl winked mischievously. I like to socialize, Tenton stated casually. Her expression sobered after a moment, though, and she looked down at her lap. Hanada, you ought to tell him how you feel. Normally the statement might elicit another blush from Hanada, but the gravity with which it was said made her stop and wonder. Our lives are dangerous. Like someone said a few days ago, people died in the Chunin exam. We saw some of them, too, and were still genin. She let the words sink in before continuing, still studying nothing in particular. Once we're all Chunin or Junin, the missions will carry more risk, and the possibility of death will only rise with every operation. If Naruto makes Chunin and goes off to start performing more life threatening assignments, she didn't have to continue the thought, Hanada had already connected the dots. Hanada, Naruto could have died in the forest of death. Tenten's statement was a simple one, but it jarred Hanada enough to make her tense. She bit her lower lip hard and closed her eyes. He could die in the next portion of the exam, even if he beats Neji, someone else might take him down. We're shinobi, she said quietly, eyes lifting to Hanada's. Our lives are put on the line every day. There isn't room to be hesitant about your feelings. One of you could be gone tomorrow, and you'll have never shared your feelings for one another. The pair sat in silence for a long while. The soft glow of sunlight faded slowly, and by the time Hanada spoke the room was nearly dark. I'll tell him after the exams, she said quietly. Tenton looked apprehensive, but she offered the older girl a small, confident smile. He won't lose there, I promise and I don't want to distract him from his training. Tenton looked reluctant to accept that, but she nodded and returned Hanada's smile. I'll hold you to it. You two make a cute couple. Hanada's blush returned in full force at that, and Tenton let out another laugh before standing up. I'm sure he'll be back soon, so I'll head home for the night. I'll be back tomorrow, all right. And I'll bring some lunch, too. Hanada smiled and nodded, and with a last wave Tenton departed. Hanada sat and sifted through her thoughts until Naruto returned to regale her with the day's events. She was just as surprised as he had been about Jiraiya, and she asked question after question about summoning techniques. By the time he finished talking about how his solo training had gone, night had completely fallen and it was getting late. I don't think I've gotten any better, he lamented in conclusion, leaning back against the pillow beside Hanada but I'm going to ask Jiraiya-sensei if he'll look at the Kyubi's seal for me tomorrow. He might be able to loosen it, he knows a lot about Fuinjutsu too. Are you sure? She asked carefully, echoing her concerns from the previous week. Hanada was confident in Naruto's ability, but the Kyubi's power frightened her still. It was hard to take his, or the fox's, word that it wasn't dangerous to release more of its chakra. Jiraiya sensei said that the seal was made so that the Kyubi's chakra could leak out, right? So I think I was supposed to be able to control it eventually. Hanada nodded, but seemed distracted. He glanced at her and smiled, giving her hand a gentle squeeze. If it turns out bad, he could always fix the seal again. Right, she agreed, feeling a little better with it in that context. 
Jiraiya wouldn't let anything get out of hand, and if he was as strong as Orochimaru he wouldn't have a problem subduing Naruto if he needed to. The thought of Naruto losing control brought about an involuntary shiver. Uruka sensei said he wanted me to be home tonight, Naruto said after a few more minutes of light conversation. He sounded apologetic, but Hinata only nodded and put her free hand on his forearm. I'll be all right by myself, don't worry, she teased lightly. Naruto flushed before grinning sheepishly and rubbing at the back of his neck. I know that. I just like being here with you is all. It was her turn to blush. Hanada moved her hand from his and slipped it around his arm, holding it in as good of a hug as she could manage from her position next to him. Naruto placed a hand over hers and held tight for a few seconds before reluctantly slipping off of the bed and out of Hanada's embrace. I'll stop by tomorrow after training. Do you know when you'll be able to leave the hospital? Another week or so, she replied sullenly. Naruto couldn't help but notice how cute Hinata looked when she was pouting. But the medic nin said that if my heart had been weaker, or if more chakra had been forced through it, I'd have been here for over a month. Or, Hinata trailed off, and Naruto paled at the unfinished thought. A small, soft smile still crept onto his lips as he leaned down, one arm moving around her upper back to pull her to him. She leaned her head gently against his, and she moved one hand up to rest on the back of his neck. I'm glad you're safe, he said quietly, his voice a little thick. He gave her a brief squeeze before withdrawing, and as he did Hinata froze, a shiver running down the length of her spine. Inadvertently or not, Naruto's lips had brushed her cheek on his way back. When she looked up he was already by the door, and she held her breath when he turned back to her. Even in the dim light she could see his abashed grin, he looked back at her one last time before slipping silently from the room. Hanada was left staring after him, one hand on her cheek and the other pressed to her stomach, the butterflies were out in force today. Even if it wasn't intentional, she reasoned, settling back down and pulling the comforter up, it felt. It was difficult for her to reconcile how it really had felt. Hanada drifted off to pleasant dreams in the midst of deciding how she would go about taking Tenten's advice, and how she would finally tell Naruto how much she cared for him. Chapter 15. Preparation and Progress. Sasuke grunted and fell to one knee, clutching at his calf. A thin icicle protruded from the back of his leg, slowly being overtaken by the red taint of blood. A few of the mirrors surrounding him cracked and began to sink towards the ground. Haku's concerned features were reflected in every one, even without his old mask it was painfully reminiscent of their encounter in the land of waves. Before the technique could end, however, Kakashi appeared in front of Sasuke, looking down at him blandly. You're not done yet, Haku, the Junin stated calmly. The mirrors ceased their descent, and several of the fractures began to repair themselves. Haku still looked stricken with worry. You've made a lot of progress this last week. Sasuke, but you need to be faster. You won't defeat Gara like this. It'd help if you'd teach me that technique already, the boy retorted, clenching his teeth as he wrenched the frozen Sanban from his flesh. The ice had thankfully numbed a bit of the pain, enabling him to stand shakily. You can't expect me to be as fast as Lee after he opens those gates. Maybe, maybe not, Kakashi responded cryptically. Do you think he's faster than me, even with them opened? Sasuke opened his mouth, then closed it again. He hadn't seen firsthand exactly how fast Lee had been, but he doubted a genin of any caliber could even come close to Kakashi's agility. There are other ways to increase your speed, Sasuke. Of your peers, including Naruto and Hinata, you are the most versatile. Your chakra control is excellent, your speed and power are above average, your skill with ninjutsu is well beyond your years, your learning genjutsu, and besides Tenten there isn't another Genin, or Chunin, for that matter, that can use ranged weapons like you can. He paused for a moment, and to his satisfaction Sasuke didn't appear pleased by the praise, he knew what was coming. But in order to use the Chidori you must be faster, and you must be stronger. You are capable not because of your bloodline, but because you are strong. When do we move on to a different training regimen, then? Sasuke sighed testing his wounded leg gingerly. I've been dodging thousands of icicles for a week straight. When you can last two hours without taking a hit, we'll start the real training. 
Sasuke scowled but didn't protest. He had managed to avoid Haku's onslaught for nearly an hour and a half before fatigue had caused him to slip up this time. He could do it. Kakashi turned and vanished again, his voice echoing around even after he had gone. Keep going until you're out of chakra, Haku. And don't let up just because he's injured. Haku's reflections paled, but Sasuke gave him an encouraging, if tight, smile. Don't worry about me. Go all out or it won't be worth it, Sasuke said firmly, lowering himself into a balanced stance. His left leg trembled as he put weight on it, but he refused to let the strain show on his face. Instead he adopted a placid expression, willing himself to be calm and focused. After only a second's hesitation Haku began again, and they didn't stop for over an hour. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Stop twitching, Kakashi ordered, though in a softer tone than usual. He was kneeling over Sasuke, who was lying on his chest on the cooling stone ground. The rock formations all around them cast ominous shadows in fading light of the setting sun, stretching like fingers into the valleys below. A gentle blue-green glow pulsed from the Junin's palm as he moved it up from the boy's leg into his shoulder, stitching a trough of ruined tissue back together. You did well today, you may be ready soon. Not well enough, Sasuke muttered, shivering at the strange sensation of his skin knitting back together. Hanada had healed his injuries plenty of times, but those had been nothing worse than fractured bones or bruises. Feeling deep gashes and stab wounds mending was a new experience. I'll get it tomorrow. Kakashi said nothing, only nodding and moving on until he had closed the last cut. When he was through Sasuke groaned and sat up carefully, rolling his shoulders and flexing his complaining limbs. Thanks. His teacher sat down opposite him and tossed him a small bag in lieu of a response, opening one of his own and withdrawing a cube of, something. Field rations, Kakashi explained to his dubious student. Tomorrow you'll find us real food after your training but I figured you could use some rest after today. We pushed you harder than usual. This is terrible, Sasuke sighed, though he took another bite of the food. Regardless, he was famished enough to eat anything. He was silent for a time as he consumed the unusual meal. When he did speak he sounded tired, but determined. Don't let up because I'm low on chakra. I could have gotten dinner like usual, and you know it. I do but it was getting dark and we still have our discussion before you can sleep. Sasuke nodded and folded his legs, facing Kakashi. They had been going over the traits of the Sharingan every night as supplemental training, and though others may have found it arduous Sasuke wanted to learn everything he never had the opportunity to glean. I've already covered the basic abilities of your Sharingan in fair depth, and so far you've shown natural ability with several. You can easily follow and predict movements now and you're able to copy most ninjutsu after seeing them once. Your eyes are not yet developed enough to snare an enemy in a genjutsu, but you've shown promise in using illusory techniques already. You seem to be naturally more capable than most Uchiha, even Itachi. Sasuke tensed, but his expression remained a blank mask. If you wish to bring your eyes to their full potential, all that you can do is train hard and survive stressful, life-threatening conditions. You explained the curse of hatred to me already, I was never told about that part of my clan's history. But, he hesitated, glancing off to the side. Haku was lying on his bedroll with his back facing them. He had all but collapsed there after they had finished training, and it was becoming a nightly routine for the older boy to pass out after a long day of intense chakra consumption. Satisfied that his friend was asleep, he turned back to Kakashi and took on a careful tone. Itachi said, well, Kakashi-sensei, do you know about the Mangekyu Sharingan? Kakashi finished for him, sighing as he spoke. Sasuke pursed his lips and nodded tightly. I knew you'd ask me about it eventually. Itachi has his, doesn't he? Yeah, Sasuke replied gruffly, breaking eye contact. The memories that had resurfaced during Orochimaru's assault came back with harsh clarity. He used the Sukuyomi on me before he fled the village. Kakashi's visible eye widened at the admission before he closed it and shook his head. I'm sorry, I didn't know about that. Sasuke shrugged and stayed silent, waiting. After a long moment Kakashi lifted his hand, tugging his hitaiate up and away from his left eye. He opened it slowly, meeting Sasuke's still active Sharingan with his own. 
Mangeku Sharingan. Sasuke took in a sharp breath as Kakashi's pupil and Tomo distorted, merging and elongating until the entire iris was vastly different. The center circle was now red instead of black, and while the crimson background remained the majority of Kakashi's eye was now a black design that resembled a three-pointed shuriken, with curved, side-like protrusions breaking off at each tip to connect to the one beside it. Sasuke subconsciously shifted his weight back, the sight reminding him too well of that night years ago. How did you? I thought. He couldn't find the words. If what his brother had said could be trusted, Kakashi would have had to. Remember what I told you of my old teammates, Obito and Rin. Kakashi started quietly, looking away from Sasuke towards the last rays of sunlight. Some time after Obito died, Rin was captured by the hidden mist and forced into becoming the vessel for the Sanbi. He glanced over at Sasuke's shocked features, with both of Kakashi's eyes visible Sasuke had a clear view of his bitter expression. The mist's plan was to have her rescued, and subsequently release the tailed beast into Konoha. When I found her she was being chased by Kiri Anbu, and she... He stopped for a moment, looking away again. She begged me to kill her, and I refused. Sasuke waited with bated breath, not daring to speak. It was rare for Kakashi to show any emotion, let alone speak from his own past, and the memory seemed painful enough without his butting in. While I was fighting the Anbu that had pursued her, she threw herself in front of my attack, the Chidori, no less, in order to protect our village and in an attempt to destroy the Biju. I didn't realize it until much later, and I only recently put the events together myself. It seems that the curse of hatred lives on even for Nan Uchiha, he finished bitterly, closing his eyes. When he opened them again his Sharingan was back to normal, and he quickly covered the eye with his forehead protector. Sasuke, this eye is not worth obtaining for the loss you must endure. You should hope to never attain it. His student looked away, staring off at nothing for a time. It took Sasuke nearly ten minutes to gather himself to respond, facing Kakashi again. There's no other way, is there? I'm not sure. I'm not of the Uchiha clan, Sasuke. Everything I know of the Sharingan I learned from observation and experience. If there is another way to obtain the Mangeku, I don't know of it. But if the curse of hatred is involved, it's likely the only way. Sasuke went silent again, staring off into space. You're seeking power for the right reasons, Sasuke. But do not be tempted to seek it in the wrong ways. The boy shivered once, remembering Naruto's words. The right way. Right. Sasuke started, sighing and running a hand through his hair. Anyway. Can you explain again how I can step into somebody else's mind to break them out of a genjutsu? Can I invade people's minds in the same way? Kakashi began a lengthy explanation of the Sharingan's power of suggestion, following it up with an in-depth analysis of how the dujutsu allowed an advanced user to step into parts of another person's subconscious. Haku lay still nearby, his dark eyes staring out to where the sun had fallen. To be unable to reach one's full potential without sacrificing a precious person. What a terrible fate. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. No, Jiraiya said firmly for the umpteenth time. I gave you my conditions already, and I won't make an exception. You're going to learn this technique before I even think about loosening your seal. He was sitting cross-legged atop the center stump of the third training ground. Naruto stood below looking obstinate with his arms folded across his chest. Don't argue with him. He's offering to teach you an advanced jutsu. Fine, fine. I thought you wanted to stretch your legs or whatever. There's plenty of time for that later, and I'm interested to hear more about this Rasengan. In theory it's a bijuadama for you mortals. A what? Naruto asked. Though aloud he said, all right, sorry. I just thought. Since I've spent a week training to balance the Kyubi's chakra, that I'd be ready. Not until I'm more confident in your control. Here. Jiraiya reached into his belt pouch and tossed a water balloon to his student. Naruto caught it carefully, quirking an eyebrow and looking at Jiraiya before glancing aside towards Hinata. She shrugged, seeming curious but unperturbed. She was sitting against the trunk of a nearby tree, enjoying the shade and watching Naruto's training. Jiraiya followed his look and grinned, winking slyly at the girl. Hanada flushed and looked away. You sure it's okay for your girlfriend to be here? 
Jiraiya asked, loud enough that they could both hear him clearly. The medic Nin said that she was fine to leave the hospital as long as she rested for another two weeks. Besides, it's always nicer to be outside than in those stuffy rooms. He tried his best to answer straight without blushing at his sensei's choice of words, but the slightest bit of pink tinted his cheeks and gave him away. Jiraiya let out a hearty laugh. Hanada was busy plucking blades of grass, determinedly not listening. Anyway, Naruto continued, what's this for? He hefted the water balloon, still eyeing it doubtfully. That's where your training starts, Jiraiya explained, nodding at the balloon. I explained how the Rasengan is supposed to work. It doesn't require any hand seals, but you must have very precise chakra control to start the currents. After you manage to get it going it becomes self-sustaining, but getting there is the hard part. This is a very advanced jutsu, even among A-rank techniques. He has the chakra capacity to pull it off, but if he's lacking in control like Kakashi says it may be beyond his ability. Anyo. Sorry, sensei, but could you explain what the water balloon is for then? Am I supposed to put chakra into it or something? Sort of, Jiraiya conceded. He held out his hand out palm up so that Naruto could see clearly. Chakra began to concentrate his eyes, innumerable strands of blue energy rotating in every direction. After a few seconds the sphere seemed to solidify due to the amassed chakra, becoming an orb of raw power with a blinding white core. The goal is to be able to manifest and rotate your chakra in such a way that it flows into a spherical shape, like this. The first step is to learn to move your chakra like that in an enclosed space. Get it? Naruto nodded slowly, staring at the Rasengan with wide, fascinated eyes. Jiraiya grinned and vanished in a plume of smoke, reappearing by a tree across the clearing from Hanada. With a simple thrust of his palm he drove the orb into the tree trunk. Naruto had expected some violent explosion, or at least something more devastating. But what happened was even more impressive, if not as dramatic as he had imagined. The rapidly rotating chakra bored smoothly into the tree, turning the dense wood to dust. It took only a second to pass completely through trunk, which must have been at least half a meter thick. Whoa. Naruto breathed, staring at hole. He looked down at the water balloon, then back up at Jiraiya. When the old man's hand drew back the Rasengan was still there, and only after he smirked back at Naruto did the sphere diminish. Get it now, Jiraiya asked, meandering back to the center of the clearing. Yeah, that was, incredible. He paused for a moment, shaking his head and looking to the balloon in his hand again. So I need to use my chakra to move the water around in a bunch of different directions at the same time, right? The sage blinked down at Naruto very clearly surprised. Yes, exactly right, how'd you figure that out so quickly? Naruto shrugged, and then took on a thoughtful expression. Well, when you first made it, it looked like the chakra was. Uh, it was. Coalescing, Hanada offered, her tentative tone carrying from nearby. Naruto grinned over at her and nodded. Yeah, coalescing, but from a lot of directions at once. It was hard to see after it all came together but it looked like the chakra was spinning a bunch of different ways. Jiraiya gave Hanada another wink before turning back to Naruto with an approving look. I'm glad you were paying attention, that's the principle of the technique. But knowing the way to do it and actually pulling it off are two different things. Here, he said, tossing two more water balloons to Naruto. From what I've heard you've got a knack for learning new jutsu. I'll leave you some extras just in case you drop that one. The goal is to pop the balloon using only the chakra rotation, got it. When Naruto nodded excitedly Jiraiya turned with a wave, moving off towards the woods. I've got more information to gather in town. I'll be back to check on you in a few hours, but... Pop. Jiraiya stopped in his tracks. He turned around slowly, eyebrows rising as he sighted the remains of the balloon dangling from Naruto's fingers. Hanada was smiling at the boy, and he looked sheepishly pleased with himself. Err, you're not supposed to squeeze it or anything, Jiraiya started, but Naruto spoke up before he could continue. I did it the right way, sensei. Here, look, he picked up one of the balloons at his feet, his features becoming focused as he raised his hand up. After a second the thin rubber began to quaver, a multitude of tiny bulges covered its surface in rapid succession, and then it exploded. 
Naruto relaxed and looked to Jiraiya, clearly ecstatic. See. I did it. I suppose you did. I didn't expect it to take him long, but to do it that fast. How did you know how to do it? Hanada-chan has been helping Sasuke and I with our chakra control for years. She's the best at it. Hanada blushed and looked down, mumbling something indistinct about compliments. Naruto smirked and went on, glowing. She had us do lots of exercises that were kind of similar. We had to create little twisters in water glasses, we hung stuff from a string and spun it in a circle between us, we played catch once but only used our chakra to catch or throw. I was really bad at it at first. And Naruto went on for a few more examples before Jiraiya held up his hand to stop him, smiling and shaking his head. All right, all right, I got it. His gaze flickered again to Hanada, a higher degree of respect in his eyes. Your girlfriend's smart and extremely talented to have come up with all of that on her own. You're a lucky kid. Both Naruto and Hinata turned a little red, but they were still beaming at one another. So what's next, Jiraiya-sensei? Do I get to try the Rasengan? Slow down, he responded, reaching beneath his short green kimono and pulling out a white ball. You need to master the second part of the training now, and I guarantee this will be more difficult. He tossed the thick rubber ball to his student, who caught and examined it. Do I need to do the same thing with this one, only stronger? Naruto asked, still a little exuberant. Yes, and no, Jiraiya said merrily, ruffling the boy's hair and turning away again. This time you only have your chakra, there's no water to help you. This part tests your power, so don't hesitate to go all out or you won't do it right. Remember, it has to pop and punctures don't count. There's a whole bag of those by the memorial over there. He walked slowly to make sure the highly unlikely wouldn't occur, and when no loud noise met his ears he grinned and disappeared into the woods. Naruto set into the new task with as much vigor as the first, but soon found that Jiraiya hadn't been toying with him. His first attempt only caused the ball to shudder and deform a little before it settled back out. I guess this won't be easy after all. You think. The Kyubi drawled, yawning in his mind. He said to go all out, and you barely put anything into that. I was just testing it, Naruto glowered, though he smiled reassuringly at Hinata when he saw her peering at him. Then he concentrated, pouring energy into a multi-directional rotation within the ball. Visible chakra rose up around him, flickering like azure flames as he focused harder. In the same fashion as the balloon the sphere began to distend, vibrating violently in his palm. A few seconds later a hole burst through one side, releasing a small stream of chakra and deflating the ball completely. Ah crap, he muttered, trotting to the bag and carrying it back to the stumps nearer to Hanada. What happened? Hanada asked, peering at the discarded ball. Did you use enough chakra? I don't know. I put about as much as I could inside and did the same thing as the balloon, but for some reason it didn't work the same way. Do you think it's different because there isn't any water? Probably, she said slowly, tapping her index finger to her lips thoughtfully. It did some of the work in creating disruption inside the balloon, at least. This way it's only your chakra, and it looks like the ball is a lot thicker. Hmm, I guess I'll keep trying and see if I can figure something out. Would you mind helping me, just by watching and seeing if you can see something? Hanada smiled and nodded. Of course I will, Naruto-kun. Did you think I'd just sit here and watch you? She teased. He laughed, which got her cheeks aglow again. There was just something about Naruto's laugh that made her feel warm inside. Why aren't you wearing your jacket today, by the way? Naruto asked after a moment, blinking down at her curiously. I don't think I've ever seen you out of it. Well, except that one time when I didn't know you were in the washroom. He trailed off, flushing at the recollection. He had been silently grateful, at least, that she had been almost done getting dressed. Hanada shared his blush and began her response tentatively, chewing absently at her lower lip during the longer pauses. Anyo. It was warm today, eh and I felt comfortable without it. Dot dot quote. She looked down, suddenly very self-conscious. She had taken to wearing the heavy coat years ago, in part because it hid the bruises of her father's training. It had also helped hide her body in general, 
Hanada had been insecure about her figure ever since the other girls in class started talking about such things. When she was 11 Eno had made a comment about her physique, insinuating that, a pencil had more curves than she did. The memory had stuck with her ever since. Oh, well, Naruto started awkwardly, rubbing at the back of his neck and turning a bit more red. I think you look nice without it on, too. You shouldn't wear it all the time if it's uncomfortable. Hanada looked back up at him, momentarily taken aback by his assertion. It was the closest thing to a compliment on her body that she'd ever heard, and coming from Naruto. P. Pardon? She asked, not sure what to think. Naruto's deepening blush only confirmed his honesty. I mean, if you like the jacket you could keep it too. I was just saying that, well, I mean I like seeing more of you. No wait. That's not what I meant. He said quickly, fumbling with his words and feeling like he was only digging a deeper hole. Finally he turned around, too embarrassed to face her. I mean you're pretty no matter what you wear, Hanada-chan. Before the stunned girl could even think to get a word out Naruto was jogging back into the clearing. Hanada could have sworn that his ears were trailing steam as he ran off. Naruto returned to his training zealously, determined to work out the secret before Jiraiya returned, and also to work off the minor dose of adrenaline from the conversation with Hanada. She sat nearby and observed, trying to calm down and process what had just happened. After a time she refocused, putting in suggestions and trying to figure out the technique from afar, but it wasn't the only thing trying to work itself out in her mind. Those two work well together. And they're so damn cute. It almost hurts. Jiraiya chuckled quietly to himself as he left his hiding place, finally making his way towards the bathhouse. Naruto definitely inherited his father's talent, and his mother's heart. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The casual onlooker might describe Sasuke's movement as unobservable, but Kakashi was not the average spectator. He followed his students' movements closely, at times having to raise his hitai ape to watch with his Sharingan. Haku had been bombarding Sasuke with ice shards for well over an hour now, and the Uchiha had yet to be struck. His eyes raced around within the confines of the technique, and he moved with such fluidity and speed that every action was a blur. Sasuke never stopped moving, but Kakashi could tell that he was getting tired. Only a few more minutes. It was in the final 30 seconds of his two-hour goal that Sasuke finally slipped up. He ended a series of back handsprings on a spot of melting ice, losing his footing and beginning to fall backwards. He ground his teeth and let out an aggravated growl. The nearest shards were only a meter away, with more coming from several other mirrors further off. Like hell I'm losing here. Rather than attempt to correct his misstep Sasuke gathered his remaining chakra, twisting and forcing as much as he could into his palms. He caught himself in a push-up position with the flying needles hardly half a meter from him. In the fraction of a second remaining he kicked his feet up and pushed hard with his arms, rocketing skyward. His feet hit the overhead panel with enough force to make it crack, and he rebounded off to the side an instant later. Sasuke tumbled to his feet, his breath ragged, but there was a clear triumphant gleam in his eyes. The jutsu abruptly ceased, and all but one of the mirrors shattered and fell to the ground. Haku slowly emerged from the final pain, seeming to struggle free rather than step easily away as he normally might have. Sasuke rushed forward and caught the other boy before he fell, easing him to the ground. Thank you, Sasuke-kun, Haku said with a weak smile, closing his eyes. I'm sorry. I'm just a little tired. I've never had to do it for that long without a break in between. Well done, Kakashi remarked as he approached, giving Haku an approving nod as well. It's time to start your real training now. Haku, you'll have a few days off to recuperate. You'll be able to help again later on. The exhausted youth had already fallen asleep. Can I get a few minutes to catch my breath? Sasuke sighed, standing and stretching slowly. I've been at this for a week now. You only have two weeks left until the exam since you spent so much time at the hospital. Sasuke scowled, but Kakashi smirked and shrugged in a conciliatory manner. But that was necessary, I suppose. Now we're in a time crunch though, and you have to master the Chidori quickly. And when you're too low on chakra to attempt the technique, like right now, we'll do other training. 
The Junin stepped over to a large black duffel bag by his own bedroll, withdrawing a pair of weapons and tossing them to Sasuke. Weapons training. Sasuke raised an eyebrow at the two blades in his hands. They were both of plain but sturdy make, worn with use but no less sharp for it. The longer of the two was a medium-length straight katana with a jagged point rather than the traditional curved end. The smaller weapon was a wakazashi fashioned in an identical style. You've shown a lot of promise with swordplay, and this combination in particular you excel with. As I've said, being able to use all ninja tools is important, but you should have a handful that you truly master. Hanada seems to be getting pretty good with those inverted daggers that Tenten gave her. The only person I've ever seen master those is Asuma. Bukijutsu isn't Naruto's forte, but he's still trying to find his preferred weapon. Do you have another that you'd rather use? Kakashi watched as Sasuke considered his inquiry, but as expected the boy shook his head. He held the longer of the two in his right hand, and in his left the shorter blade was flipped with blunt edge running parallel with his forearm. I'd already decided on these, Sasuke shrugged. I just wasn't expecting to focus on weapon training out here. Your first match is against Gara, remember? I detailed Lee's encounter with him, so you know just how well he can defend against Taijutsu. The speed training you've been undertaking combined with the Chidori will be enough to get through his defenses, but it wouldn't hurt to have something else in your arsenal. Sasuke couldn't argue with that. While he didn't have the chakra for much else, he could definitely do some sparring. His sensei didn't allow him any time to consider if he was up for it, however. The only thing that allowed Sasuke to deflect Kakashi's kunai was his Sharingan, and even with it still active he had barely seen his teacher move. Without any warning Kakashi was upon him, wielding a single kunai and holding his other arm behind his back. Even with the handicap, and without his Sharingan, the Junin was nigh impossible to keep up with. It took every bit of dexterity Sasuke possessed to defend against the assault. It was just after noon when Kakashi called a halt, allowing his battered student to collapse gratefully on the nearest clear patch of ground. We'll break for a few hours to eat and rest so that you can replenish your chakra, your first lesson with the Chidori will come later. He sat down cross-legged, eyeing Sasuke flatly. The boy's eyes were closed against the harsh sunlight above, and his breathing was only just beginning to return to normal. Lunch is whenever you bring something back for us. Sasuke scowled but didn't get up, instead lifting his hands to form the tiger seal. Mizu Bunshin no Jutsu, he mumbled, and a second later another Sasuke bounded off and down into the ravine that their rock pillar towered above. He opened one eye to catch Kakashi's disapproving look, but only smirked and closed it again. I'm still getting it, just without moving. There's always a rabbit down there somewhere. I think the clone will be fine against a rodent. Kakashi smiled wryly back at him and shrugged. That's what you get for using water clones so often when we spar, sensei. An hour later they were relaxing against a small rock outcropping, discussing Gara's abilities in depth. Sasuke had woken Haku briefly to let him eat, but his friend was once again fast asleep. Although, Kakashi paused, in the middle of picking apart the ability Gara used to create the shell of sand that covered his skin. We could always just ask him how much chakra it consumes. Sasuke blinked over at him curiously, then narrowed his eyes and was on his feet in a flash. It's not polite to sneak around. What do you want, Gara of the sand? The Jinchuriki stepped slowly from behind a boulder. His arms were crossed, and his features were as impassive as ever. The killing intent emanating from the boy was enough to send a chill down Sasuke's spine. Gara acted like Kakashi wasn't there, simply staring at Sasuke. I came to observe, he began calmly. And to get your word that you will be at the final portion of the Chunin exam. Why wouldn't I be there? Sasuke asked warily, relaxing his stance. Despite the murderous aura Gara didn't appear to be interested in fighting. Did you expect me to run away? Yes. Gara responded flatly. He didn't appear to be joking. But you seem determined to fight. That's good. I've wanted to kill you since I first saw you, Uchiha Sasuke. After hearing about what you tried to do to Lee, I can say that the feeling is mutual. But I'm not about to let you spy on my training. Go back to Konoha and be patient. I promise I'll be there to kick your ass in two weeks. I look forward to that day. 
The small smile that Gara offered was one of the most disturbing things Sasuke had ever seen. Without another word the Suna Nin vanished in a whirlwind of sand, leaving a fairly annoyed pair in his wake. That seemed like a waste of his time, Sasuke muttered, slumping back down as he felt Gara's chakra fade away. Does he not have training of his own to do? His attitude pisses me off. I believe I told you that overconfidence is one of his weak points, Kakashi chided, though he didn't sound any more excited about the other boy showing up. He truly intends to kill you, Sasuke. If he came all the way out here just to make sure that you'd show up for the exam, you can bet on it. Didn't you say that my speed is nearing Lee's now? I shouldn't have a problem beating him if I can outrun the sand and get a Chidori strike off. That's if you can master it in such a short time period. I know your chakra control and capacity are good enough, but being able to push that much energy into your hand takes immense concentration. In theory it's not difficult to learn. I expect you to have it formed in days, if not hours. But as I've explained, you can not overuse it or you risk dying. Kakashi waited for Sasuke to nod before he continued. You probably have enough chakra for one or two attempts now, so let's get started. Tomorrow we'll figure out how many you can manage per day. Sasuke pushed himself up, and despite his casual demeanor he was excited. By Kakashi's own admission that Chidori was his only original technique, and its significant drawbacks could be counteracted by the Sharingan. It was the perfect ability for an Uchiha. I'll show you once. I can only use it a few times per day, so pay attention to my chakra flow. Sasuke nodded and focused his eyes on Kakashi. His sensei took a few steps back and lowered his left hand, bringing his right over to grip it at the wrist. For a few seconds nothing happened, but then Sasuke saw huge amounts of chakra surging towards Kakashi's left palm, gathering there and building until its intensity nearly forced him to look away. Pure electricity crackled in Kakashi's hand, sending continuous arcs of blinding blue light spiking in every direction. It was the most chakra Sasuke had ever seen concentrated in such a small area. This is the Chidori, Kakashi continued, straightening and extending his arm, as if Sasuke wasn't able to see it already. There are only a few things this can't cut through, and those there's the Reikiri. That, however, you'll need more chakra to be able to handle. But it's only used as a thrust. Sasuke questioned. I mean, I know that with my speed and the Sharingan it won't be difficult to land on the average opponent. I was expecting it to be a little more versatile. It's one of thousands of ninjutsu, do you expect everyone to have multiple uses? Sasuke shrugged, and Kakashi allowed himself a small smirk. If your control gets good enough you can do a few other things with it, like imbuing projectiles. But stick with the basics for now, I think this will be enough. As if to emphasize his point he turned, dashing forward and plunging his palm towards the rock face that Sasuke had been leaning on. The white-hot chakra simply melted into the stone, and cracks formed all around the impact point. Kakashi withdrew his hand as the technique faded and died, leaving behind a grooved hole half a meter deep. I invented the Chidori to serve as a foolproof assassination technique. With the Sharingan active you can move at high speeds and still be wary of your surroundings and react appropriately. However, in order to avoid complications I would only use it when your opponent is unable to move. There are no rules in the final round fights, so you are allowed to kill Gara if you must. But I trust you'll use your judgment when it comes to that. If he intends to see me dead, I won't hold back, Sasuke said simply, glancing again at the half-melted indentation. I have a bad feeling about him, though. I don't think I'll lose, but then again if he's anything like Naruto and capable of using his Biju's chakra. Then you should give up immediately, Kakashi finished for him. Sasuke grimaced and shook his head, prompting his teacher to go on. Sasuke, at your current level you can likely keep up with Naruto when he has the Kyubi's chakra active. But remember what he said, too, Gara is the Aikibi's tool. There's no telling what he's capable of if he's not the one in control. I know that, but wouldn't the match be stopped if things got bad anyway? That's not guaranteed, think about it. How many people even know what a Jinchuriki's power looks like? Most in our village will be familiar with the Kyubi's chakra if Naruto uses it against Neji, but not necessarily another tailed beasts. The chakra might be strong and even malevolent, 
but if the demon fox can be trusted then it could be mistaken for Gara's own ability. Good point. I guess, Sasuke sighed, running his fingers through his hair. I'll do whatever I can to win, he said. As Kakashi's eyebrow rose expectantly he concluded with a resigned, solemn promise. And I'll make sure to give up if I think it's too dangerous. Every fiber of his being protested the statement. This was an opportunity to fight a strong adversary, possibly to the death. Exam or not, this was a chance to test himself in real combat. He wouldn't surrender unless it was the last available course of action. Now that we got that out of the way, it's time for a change of clothes. It was Sasuke's turn to raise an eyebrow as Kakashi stepped over to the duffel, rummaging through it until he found what he was looking for. Here, I had these made for you in preparation for this technique. It's time for a change of wardrobe anyway. He tossed a black bundle over to his student, then turned towards the edge of the cliff. I'm going to climb while you change. You have ten minutes, give or take. Without pausing to make sure Sasuke had heard he leapt over the edge, plummeting out of sight. There's nothing wrong with my clothes, Sasuke muttered, though he quickly realized Kakashi's intent when he unfolded the garments. They were largely the same as his own, but made of a thicker material. There was a new pair of black rubber tabi wrapped inside, along with four long, thick rubber cords. Kakashi had been considerate enough to get the high-collared shirt embroidered with the Uchiha clan symbol as well. I guess there's nothing wrong with these either. It took him a few short minutes to change, though after he had finished the four cords were still lying on the ground. He smirked slightly as he realized their purpose, picking them up one by one and wrapping one around each of his limbs. When he was finished he checked the bands, one spiraling up each forearm and one binding each lower leg to his footwear. Leave it to Kakashi to work in safety precautions and make them stylish. Done. Kakashi grunted, landing just after pulling himself over a nearby ledge. Perspiration shimmered on his brow, and his breathing was slightly labored. Sasuke was going to ask what he had been doing when he heard ropes snapping, and Kakashi brought his other arm from behind his back, flexing his wrist. He had climbed the entire way up with one arm, without using chakra. Yeah. Sasuke replied with a small, disbelieving laugh. Kakashi's climb seemed like something Guy would have attempted. Sometimes it wasn't hard to see why they got along. Good. Then let's get started. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Ugh. Naruto groaned, collapsing next to Hinata. I've been at this all day and I still can't figure out why it won't work. It just keeps making one or two holes and that's it. Hanada was wearing a sympathetic expression as she laid a hand on his arm, smiling encouragingly. It took the fourth years to develop that technique, Naruto-kun. I'm sure you'll get it with some more practice, it's not fair to yourself to expect to learn it so quickly. I know, he sighed, I just wish I knew what I was doing wrong. I don't think you're concentrating your chakra right. Naruto blinked, then flashed Hanada a quick smile before turning inward to address the fox. What do you mean? I'm doing exactly what Jiraiya said to do, right? Yes and no. It's just an idea, but you're probably not focusing the chakra well enough. Do you remember what his Rasengan looked like? Naruto pictured the sphere in his mind, then nodded. What do you see? The Rasengan, he replied with a wry smirk, eliciting an annoyed growl from the Kyubi. Lots of blue chakra, with some white and yellow mixed in I guess. It's rotating really fast in lots of directions. What else am I supposed to see? The colors are the important parts. Ask her about it. Ah, okay. Why can't you just tell me? As expected the fox remained smugly silent. The Kyubi thinks that the color was important, he started aloud, holding up his right hand. It was shaking a little, and there were small scorch marks around his palm. The Rasengan took an immense amount of chakra to form, and this step especially required him to use a lot of it in one place. All I remember was that it was kind of white in the middle, and sort of blue with tiny flecks of yellow on the outside. What do you think? Well, Hanada said pensively, it probably means that there's more chakra concentrated in the center, and it lessens as you get further out. But you knew that already. He blinked again and looked down at his hand. I've been putting all of the chakra inside the ball. Yeah, but I wasn't really thinking about putting it all in one place. Just, inside somewhere. 
It was Hanada's turn to look surprised, but she quickly recovered and flushed slightly. I'm sorry. I should have said something sooner. Naruto glanced over and grinned, flipping his hand over and covering hers with a soft squeeze. It's not your fault. I should have figured it out sooner, he laughed. As always his good humor was infectious, and before she knew it she was smiling back at him. So I should try to put it all into a smaller point at the center of the ball, then. She nodded, looking off towards the bag that Jiraiya had left that morning. Naruto had already gone through most of them, leaving only half a dozen remaining. What'll that do exactly? I'm not sure, but the more chakra you concentrate into that point the stronger it should be when you release it. Be careful, she added, turning her gaze worriedly back to his hand. You've already hurt yourself a few times, and even you can run out of chakra. I will be, Naruto promised. Thanks, Hanada-chan. He grinned and gave her hand another squeeze before jumping back to his feet and hurrying to the bag. He lifted the white ball, sparing a glance for the scores scattered around the clearing in various tattered states. As he had done every time, he turned towards Hanada so she could see clearly, nodded to her once, then focused. The familiar blue glow of chakra surrounded him as he pushed energy into the sphere, trying his best to force it all to the center. Naruto could tell something was different this time. The ball began to quake violently, and he had to hold on tight to keep it in his palm. He kept pouring chakra into it until he was straining to give it even a sliver more. Now, all at once, directed by the image of rotation in his mind's eye, the chakra exploded inside of the ball. In an uncontrolled torrent it lashed out at the rubber walls, and before Naruto could even think to stop it the chakra shredded through the ball and exploded in his palm. He yelped and flew backwards with the force of the detonation, hitting the center post with a grunt and falling to the ground. Naruto-kun, Hanada called anxiously, wincing as she struggled to her feet. I'm fine, he coughed, waving towards her and rolling to his back. Just winded. Don't get up. Despite his wheezing he looked ecstatic. Hanada was still worried as she sank back down, though she was glad no real harm had come to him. It never ceased to amaze her how Naruto always thought of her condition and needs over his own, even after getting blasted across a clearing. Come here when you can, she said tersely. Somebody had to be concerned about his potential injuries, and she knew that he wouldn't be. Her tone sobered Naruto's expression to a small grin, she'd be upset if he didn't let her mend the bruise he could feel spreading across the small of his back. He kicked his legs up and used the momentum to propel himself to a standing position, wincing slightly as the bruised muscles flexed. Naruto trotted to the tree, still beaming. Hanada smiled back, though she waited patiently until he sat down in front of her. You were right, he said cheerily, trying not to notice how her hands felt as they slid under his coat and pressed gingerly against his back to begin healing. I just had to put more chakra in a smaller area, then it sorta blew up, I guess. I didn't expect it to be that violent, though. How much chakra did you put into it? Hanada asked, doing her best to ignore the toned muscles she was touching. I dunno. Naruto responded truthfully, thinking about it. It took a lot of chakra I know, and my hand hurts like hell now. Probably a third of what I had left. It took her a moment to try to work out the rough math, but she shook her head and activated her Byakugan instead. It was much easier to judge his current capacity by looking. Her sharp intake of breath told him something was wrong. What's up? Naruto-kun, you're, well, I've never seen your chakra so low before, except for when you went unconscious after summoning too many clones. You obviously have more than that, but not much. Naruto looked over his shoulder at her and blinked a few times, then shrugged. I feel okay, but I don't think I should be trying that again today. Hanada was taken aback by his admission, but incredibly relieved that he had decided it for himself. She had been on the verge of asking him to take the rest of the day off. I don't want to push myself too hard and not be able to train tomorrow, right? Right, Hanada agreed, allowing the green glow to fade as she finished. She lowered his jacket and stared at his back for a moment, disabling her by a Kugan. The blue currents of Naruto's chakra circulatory system were replaced by the black of his coat, and before she could argue with the impulse she slipped her arms around his waist and hugged him from behind. 
Naruto tensed for only a second before moving his hand down to take one of hers. Hanada had been doing things like that lately, and while he didn't know where the newfound spontaneity was coming from he had gotten used to it. Besides, how could he argue with a hug from Hanada? You okay? He asked after a moment, lacing his fingers between hers. I'm fine, she said quietly into his back, resting her cheek against his shoulder. Just thinking. About what? The question was innocent enough, but she hesitated in answering. There were a lot of things on her mind. Tenton had visited her in the hospital almost every day, and while the majority of their conversations were light and enjoyable, occasionally they touched on more serious topics. At the moment she was reflecting on their first talk. Hanada had assured Tenton that she would tell Naruto after the final exam, but she felt uneasy about it for some reason. Perhaps taking her friend's advice and telling him sooner would be best. Naruto-kun, she began, loosening her hold on him a little so that she could rest her forehead between his shoulder blades. How? Her heart rate spiked noticeably, and she could feel the heat rising in her chest. It was only a few words, she just had to get them out. W what do you think about, us? Us? Naruto queried. The pink spreading across his face would have told Hinata that he had an idea of what she was talking about if she could have seen it. What do you mean? She closed her eyes and took a deep, steadying breath. This was it. She could do it. Just say it. Tell him. You might not get a chance later, she told herself firmly. Hanada had opened her mouth to speak, but before she could start the most inappropriately timed plume of smoke erupted beside them. Naruto leapt to his feet in surprise, and Hanada let out a small, startled gasp. Both of them had been too distracted to notice Jiraiya's approach. Not slacking off, are you? The sage said crossly, folding his arms as he looked down at Naruto. He blinked a few times when he noticed their expressions, then grinned and rubbed at the back of his neck. Sorry, sorry, was I interrupting a tender moment? I can come back. No, they said together, catching each other's eye and looking away quickly. Sensei, Naruto continued, gaining back a bit of his enthusiasm. I finished the second step. Oh, Jiraiya looked around, frowning towards the pillars. Where's the ball then? It ah, uh, well it sort of exploded, like it was supposed to, I think. See, Naruto held up his slightly charred hand, he was still holding the remains of the rubber ball. Hanada-chan suggested that I should try concentrating the chakra into one spot, and after I tried that it worked no problem. I just put as much chakra as I could into one place and let it go. Is that right? Jiraiya glanced down at Hanada, who was flushing predictably. I, that's correct. I take it the rest of these you've just been putting chakra into the whole ball. Yeah, I guess so. The Kyubi told me that the colors were important, and from that Hanada-chan figured out that the center was a lot whiter because there was more chakra concentrated there. I guess I kind of cheated, he continued sheepishly, scratching at the back of his head. But it still counts, doesn't it? To his surprise, Jiraiya laughed. Kid, there's no such thing as cheating when it comes to being a shinobi. In order to survive and get stronger you should take all the help you can get. I'm glad Hinata was here to help you, and. I guess it's helpful that the Kyubi contributed. That thought caused him to pause, but he shook off the unease. If the demon fox was providing its aid then he couldn't be upset. But he was wary of the biju's trickery nonetheless. Can you do it again so that I can see? Naruto looked even more embarrassed now, shuffling his feet. I sorta used up most of my chakra already, and I don't think I should use any more. Use the Kyubi's chakra, Jiraiya responded easily, winking at him. This is a good opportunity to prove that you're in control of it, since you'll need to call up quite a bit to make the ball explode again. Go ahead, the Kyubi said lazily before Naruto could ask. Maybe he'll finally loosen the damn seal if you don't screw it up. You know how much chakra to put into it, right? I don't want too much or it might blow up worse than last time. He was a bit disturbed to find that he understood the fox's subsequent growl as an affirmative. All right, I can do that, Naruto responded cheerily, stepping a good distance into the clearing just in case. Okay, one point at the center. He retrieved another ball and held it palm up, and then he focused. A thin haze of orange chakra formed around him instead of the lively blue fire from before, 
and as he began channeling the chakra it felt quite a bit different as well. The fundamentals were the same, though, and immediately the ball began to twitch and bulge like the other one had. Naruto was forced to tone down the Kyubi's chakra, else the result would have been much stronger than the last time. Center. Just at the center. The chakra gathered quickly, and before long his hand began to tremble and ache with the strain. And. Release. The effect wasn't much different this time around, except that when it burst it was a much less violent explosion. When the shreds of rubber cleared out of the way, however, the blast of chakra was very clearly dark red mixed with a deep violet rather than the earlier blue. Get that stupid look off of your face. How many times have I told you that my chakra is stronger than yours? And how many damn times do you have to use it to augment your ninjutsu before you'll get it into your thick head that it makes your abilities more powerful? It usually doesn't change the colors, Naruto retorted, scowling. Do you use any other techniques that concentrate huge amounts of chakra in one place? The Kyubi ventured sarcastically. One of these days I'm going to figure out how to punch your damn face inside my head. Well done. Jiraiya beamed, clapping Naruto across the shoulders and making him stumble forward. But the last step is the hardest, as I've already told you. Combining both the first and second lessons together won't be easy no matter how much you've practiced chakra control, and no matter how much chakra you put into it. He smirked as Naruto straightened and turned to him with a triumphant smile, but his features also appeared a little tight and touched with fatigue. That's enough for today. Though, even if you use the Kyubi's chakra, your own is too depleted to do much more right now. Take the rest of the day off, and get some rest. The boy's lips parted to protest, but he glanced at Hinata and changed his mind. Yes, sensei, he said instead, bowing before heading over to help Hinata to her feet. Jiraiya quirked an eyebrow at his new student's rush, but only chuckled and turned to go back to the hot springs to do more, researching. Did you still want to go shopping? Naruto asked as Hinata took his arm for support. We can wait a few more days if you need more rest. I'm all right to walk around, she insisted, giving his arm a light squeeze. Besides I, I want to get some new clothes. A blush rose steadily on her cheeks as she recalled his remarks from the other day. I think I've grown out of my old ones. In more ways than one. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The owner says they close in half an hour, Naruto called through the dressing area's curtain. So you've got plenty of time to try everything on, don't worry. He didn't feel like it was a good idea to share the dirty looks he had received when going to ask about how long the store was open. Oh okay, Hanada said from the other side. Her voice sounded small and a little nervous. Clothes and accessories lay in neat piles around her, including everything from various sashes to different designs of chainmail. She pressed her fingers together, unable to think of much beyond the fact that Naruto was standing only a meter or two away from her while she stood in her undergarments. You can always start with your favorite colors, Naruto suggested. That snapped her out of her reverie, summoning a blush and a quick nod at nothing in particular. She began separating things out, setting aside lavender and cream-colored items to try on. That's the fun of looking for clothes, I think he started again, sounding thoughtful. You get to pick stuff you like instead of stuff you need, like ninja tools. Except the chain stuff. I'm not letting you get away with not adding that to everything. He laughed, though Hanada knew that he meant it regardless. I'll make sure to get some. She took a deep breath, deciding to just start trying things on and seeing where it led. A few minutes later the curtains rustled and Naruto straightened, watching the cloth pull back anxiously. Why am I nervous? He pondered, dismissing the thought as soon as Hinata stepped into the open. By and large the clothes she had chosen were similar to her old ones, though there were a few notable changes. Her capris were shorter, coming just past the knee, and they looked to be a darker shade of blue. Her jacket had been replaced by a different kind of coat, this one was slimmer and longer than the old one. The whole of the torso and the cuffs were purple, while the sleeves and loose hood were white. The jacket's zipper was down far enough to show the collar of a chain vest, underneath which she wore a simple black t-shirt. What do you think? She asked diffidently, fidgeting with the hem of the coat. I'm kind of useless here, I think, Naruto laughed abashedly. 
I'll probably just say you look good in everything. Hanada smiled faintly, but continued fretting until he continued. You really like those jackets, huh? And not really, she said defensively, forcing her hands to settle. I'm just used to it, I guess. Naruto tilted his head to the side, folding his arms and studying her. Hanada wanted to squirm under his scrutiny but she forced herself to stay very still instead. Well, if you don't like it you shouldn't wear it, he stated matter-of-factly. Or you can just get it and wear it when it's colder or something. I mean, I usually don't wear my coat on hot days, and it is getting to the warmer part of summer. Hanada nodded slowly, looking down at the jacket pensively. Let me try something else. Before he could lean back again she had disappeared behind the curtain, renewing the sounds of stirring fabric and the clinking of chainmail. Naruto's comment had sparked a bit of inspiration, and she was only clinging to the jackets out of habit. New clothes for a new me, she told herself determinedly. When she emerged again Naruto's jaw nearly hit the floor. In her fervor it seemed that she had gone a bit over the top with the new outfit. Her dark leggings, while not quite as tight as the one Sakura usually favored, hung very close to her skin and extended almost to her knees. She was tugging self-consciously at a short beige skirt that ran from just above her hips down to mid-thigh, with a purely aesthetic, thin leather belt hanging at an angle over it. What took Naruto by surprise the most was that the arm she was using to tug at the skirt was passing over her bare midriff. The attire was completed by a cut-off chain tank top which was mostly covered by a deep indigo top of similar design. Her shoulders and arms were left bare, something else that Naruto couldn't overlook. Ah, uh, he began eloquently. You ah, uh, well you, he couldn't seem to get the right words out. Even if he knew why his face was burning it would have been hard to phrase. You look, great, how do you like it? It was then that Hinata spotted herself in the mirror and realized the error she had made in her earnest. She suddenly felt very lightheaded and visibly paled before turning the approximate shade of a ripe tomato. Naruto was pretty sure that even Kakashi couldn't have moved faster than Hinata did when she tore behind the curtain again. I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry. She squeaked, sliding miserably down the wall of the dressing room. She had never been so embarrassed in her life. I can't believe I just went out there dressed so, so indecently. Err, Hinata-chan. Naruto ventured carefully, I don't know why you're apologizing, but I didn't mean to hurt your feelings if I did. I was just, surprised. You really do look great, but, she pulled her knees to her chest and buried her face in her arms, hugging tightly at her legs, waiting for him to say what had to be coming. I don't think that look is really, you, you know. I think if you want a little more, er, breathability, the fox chortled, clearly amused breathability, he inserted, flushing again, that outfit would be perfect. But maybe cover your waist with some flexible chainmail and a comfortable undershirt. It's up to you, though, of course, he finished lamely, twiddling his thumbs just outside. That was not what she had been expecting. Hanada raised her head and glanced furtively at the curtain, biting her lip and thinking. She wanted to show Naruto that she was at least a little different from how she used to be. But he was right about the clothes, she had some modifications to make. I'll be out again soon, she stammered, standing quickly and scurrying around the small area. She knew that she only had 10 or 15 minutes left, and that they could always return the next day, but Hinata wanted to find something then and there. Naruto's broad grin met her as she stepped out again, and she returned it with a bashful one of her own. She was wearing the same style of shorts as before though these were colored a deep violet with the familiar bandages wrapped around her right thigh. A short skirt, light cream in color this time, fell about her hips, complete with a black accent belt. Her waist was now covered with a close-fitting chain mesh, underneath which she wore a simple dark cotton shirt. The top was similar as well, though now a shade similar to her capris and significantly less form-fitting. Her right arm was left bare still, but the left now had a white cuff about the wrist with a buckle strapped around it, an identical article encircled her upper arm, and between it and her wrist she had woven bandages the same color as her skirt. Her hitai ate hung around her neck as usual, and her hair was tied back in a low ponytail, hanging down to just between her shoulder blades. You look incredible, Hanada-chan. That's more like you, don't you think? 
She flushed but kept an appreciative smile, moving away from the curtain to stand next to him in front of the mirror. Yeah, I think so. Hanada stared at herself in the mirror, intrigued far more than she meant to be. Naruto had been telling the truth when he had mentioned never seeing her without the coat on, she wasn't even used to seeing herself without it. The new attire didn't hide her body, but it didn't emphasize it too much either. She didn't want to flaunt her figure by any means, but the feeling of being out of her old clothes and into ones she had chosen with Naruto was liberating. Closing in five minutes, the clerk barked from the front, making them both jump. They shared a glance, and then Hinata broke out into a fit of giggles. Her merriment was contagious and got Naruto laughing almost immediately as well, and for a full minute the pair fought to control the sudden bout of giddiness. We should get going, Hinata said breathlessly at last, leaning on the wall. Naruto, still chuckling a little, voiced his agreement and moved to let her take his arm. She accepted his support gratefully, holding on tighter than she might have normally. It was both terrifying and exhilarating to leave the store in her new outfit, but Naruto's presence assuaged the majority of her fears and allowed her to bask in her newfound freedom. It had been her choice, and with Naruto's help she had conquered a small part of her past. Just by changing some clothes, she thought wonderingly as they neared Aruka's apartment. But that wasn't what had done it, her clothes were only a symbol of her resolve. Hanada knew where her confidence had stemmed from and where it continued to build every day. Thank you, Naruto-kun. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The two weeks leading up to the final exam seemed to fly by. Sasuke returned with Kakashi the day before, and they were both dumbstruck upon seeing Hinata again. After the initial shock passed they got back to their usual banter, Sasuke and Naruto traded stories about training, though neither of them gave any specifics on what they had learned. They both knew too well that, in all likelihood, they would be fighting one another in the second round. Hanada had recovered fully the week prior to the exam and had been able to start training again, though the majority of it was spent regaining the flexibility she had lost during rehabilitation. She had joined Jiraiya and Naruto when she was able to, helping out as much as she could. A few hours every day had been spent with Tenten, both honing her weapon skills and just enjoying her friend's company. On the day of the exam they all met with Kakashi at Ichiraku's for breakfast. Naruto had invited Jiraiya along as well, but the sage had only given him a confusing answer about a free spa day. My treat, Kakashi said mildly. Naruto let cheer and immediately called his order to Tyuki, eliciting a laugh from the old man and his daughter Ayame. His friends and sensei requested their meals afterwards, and then an unexpected voice spoke up as well. I'll take a bowl of miso ramen, Jiraiya muttered, settling onto the stool beside Kakashi. He gave the Junin a lopsided grin. You can treat me too, right Kakashi? The younger generation needs to respect its elderly, after all, Kakashi said placidly. The older shinobi grumbled about respect and manners but quickly fell quiet as he watched the three genin. The silver-haired Junin followed his gaze and smirked, shaking his head at his team. Remind you of something? Kakashi asked quietly. Jiraiya smiled faintly, his eyes lingering for a moment on Sasuke. I hope not, he said somberly, sighing and shaking his head as well. But in a lot of ways, yes. A while later the trio stood to leave, though they cast Kakashi questioning glances before departing. I'll catch up, he assured them, nodding towards the arena that loomed over the buildings to the northeast. Naruto. Sasuke head to the main floor and onto the stadium grounds. You'll be meeting the other genin there with Genma. Hanada, I'll meet you in section B, Lee and Tenten should be there with Guy. They all nodded, sharing a grin before heading out. He's a lot like Minato, Jiraiya said quietly. Kakashi only nodded, watching as his students made their way down the street. And from what I've seen the little Hayuga is incredibly talented. She possesses the chakra control of someone far beyond her age and experience, and she's way too smart. With that genius Uchiha in there as well. You're one lucky instructor. I am indeed, Kakashi agreed. Jiraiya eyed him for a moment before turning his gaze towards Naruto, Hanada, and Sasuke. Tsunade and I were lucky to have Serutobi sensei, just as those three are lucky to have you. The younger man glanced at him wryly, 
pretending he hadn't noticed Orochimaru's omission. You're starting to sound like the Hokage now, he remarked, though he paused before continuing. But thank you, Jiraiya-sama. He went back to watching his team then. Naruto and Hinata were holding hands now, and the blonde was talking excitedly to both her and Sasuke. Kakashi allowed himself a small smile. Perhaps we're lucky to have each other. Chapter 16. Assault on Konoha. There's only nine, Naruto said, glancing around at the other genin. Wasn't that sound guy, Dosu, supposed to be here? He probably got scared and ran away, Ino stated loudly, letting out a laugh that would have displayed her mocking confidence if her voice hadn't cracked halfway through. She coughed, glancing around nervously. Gara stood nearby, saying nothing. Nobody noticed the corner of his lips twitching in the slightest maniacal smirk, but the surge of killing intent was difficult to ignore. Either way, he's not here. Genma stepped before the group, looking bored and clicking the Sinban in his mouth against his teeth. His fight is scheduled last. Yamanaka Ino will receive a bye in the event he does not arrive on time. She will face the winner of the fourth round, either Tamari or Nara Shikamaru. Ino paled visibly at that, but Shikamaru only scowled. Getting a bye on the first round, he mumbled. Tisk, can I trade with her? Genma's only response was a wry smirk at the Nara boy. The first match will be Uzumaki Naruto vs Hayuga Neji. The feudal lords and other guests are still being seated, so expect to begin in 15 minutes. The rest of the contestants are to move up to the viewing area there, he continued, pointing to a section below the regular stands. It had no seating area, only a tunnel that presumably led up to the stone balcony. Good luck, Shikamaru said with a casual wave as he turned. The comment was offered in such a way that he wasn't directing it at either of them, but Naruto knew who he was talking to. The blonde grinned and nodded his thanks. Sasuke's hand fell on his shoulder and gripped it hard. Kick his ass, he told Naruto bluntly, loud enough that Neji could easily hear. The older boy said nothing, apparently closed off in meditation. They nodded at one another, expression sober, before Sasuke moved off with the rest of the genin. Only Naruto and Neji remained at the center of the ring now as the din of thousands of voices rose steadily around them. Genma stood a few meters away, scanning the crowd disinterestedly and waiting on the signal from the Hokage's attendant. Neji, Naruto said quietly, waiting until his adversary's eyes flickered open before continuing. I might not get a chance to talk to you later, so I'd like to say this now. Neji's eyes narrowed but he remained silent, waiting. Naruto took a deep breath and held it for a moment before exhaling slowly. I, I can't pretend I'm not angry about what you did to Hinata, and what you tried to do after she was down. A flicker of agitation played across the older boy's features. But I talked to her about it, and I think I understand a little of why you feel the way you do about her. What do you know? Neji asked contemptuously. So she told you of the seal placed on branch members? of how my father was sacrificed for the head family. You think that allows you to understand me? No, Naruto admitted carefully, making sure not to raise his voice despite the bubbling fury. But I know that you've had a hard life as a branch family member, and I guess I can understand a little of how you feel. You've been treated differently your whole life, and you had somebody precious taken from you unfairly. Neji laughed bitterly, and Naruto almost lost the thin patience he had with the other boy. You're an outcast. Everybody knows that Chunin only took you in because he felt sorry for you. You've got some talent I'll admit, but compared to a genius like me you're nothing. You're fated to be an average shinobi for the rest of your life. I'll be the Hokage one day, Naruto ground out, just about ready to snap. He could take insults thrown at him, but not at Aruka. Neji laughed again, and before he even realized it Naruto was reaching for chakra. Calm down, kid, he's trying to agitate you. And it's working. What am I supposed to do, just let him stand there mocking Aruka sensei Yes, that's exactly what you should do. If he gets a rise out of you, he wins. Just wait for the match to start, idiot. Naruto scowled and took another deep breath, smoothing his features and forcing his rising emotions down. Ninjas like the Hokage are born to attain that rank. I hate to tell you but you have no natural skill, no keke genke, and no potential. 
Even my pathetic cousin has more talent than you. I should be fighting the Uchiha for a real challenge, not some kid that should have dropped out in the academy. Genma caught Naruto's wrist when it was a few centimeters from Neji's nose. The Hyuga hadn't moved or even flinched, now only smirking triumphantly at his opponent. Dust swirled about them from the Junin's movement, and though he still seemed placid he spoke with a deadly calm that made Naruto wince slightly. Do you want me to disqualify you before the fight begins? He asked softly, eyes still on the crowd. A few cheers and shouts were ringing out from the spectators at Naruto's attempted strike. A shinobi should keep his emotions in check at all times. Weren't you taught that in the academy? Naruto grimaced and retracted his arm, bowing to Genma. I apologize. It won't happen again. The proctor eyed him for a moment before nodding and returning to looking around nonchalantly. Naruto turned back to Neji with a hard expression. If you recall, Hanada almost beat you. If you consider her pathetic for laying you up in the hospital then you have a really skewed view of strength. Neji blinked, taken aback by what Naruto had, and hadn't, taken offense to. Say what you want about us, but we're strong. I'll show you just what it takes to become Hokage. I'll show you how to change your own fate. Neji opened his mouth to respond, closed it, and repeated the motion as if searching for the right words. I have nothing to say to such foolishness, he said finally, looking away. He looked very tired all of a sudden, and considerably less prideful. Naruto wasn't sure what Neji was playing at, but he didn't press further. He had said what needed to be said. Their match would prove his words true without a doubt. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Hanada winced when she saw Naruto's attempted strike, she could only imagine what Neji had said to provoke him enough to elicit such a response. She relaxed when he withdrew, relieved that Genma had stepped in and that her friend seemed to have gotten a handle on himself. That was close, Kakashi sighed, startling her. A moment before the seat next to her had been vacant, but now her sensei was occupying it as if he had been there the whole time. He nearly got himself disqualified. Hanada nodded gravely. Neji Nisan looks like he's trying to provoke Naruto-kun, I can see it in his eyes. You can see that from here. Tenten asked from her other side, squinting down at the arena floor. I can hardly make out their expressions. You can tell by the way he's standing, Lee put in from beside Tenten. Neji is looking down on Naruto-kun. It's the same way he looked at me a long time ago. Hanada chewed on her lip pensively, glancing back down at Naruto and Neji. I like the new fashion statement. Hanada blinked and looked over at Kakashi in surprise, not sure how to react towards the casual remark. He smirked, though didn't offer any further comments. Guy slapped him on the back and let out a booming laugh. After Kakashi recovered from nearly being knocked over he gave his loud friend a humorless smile. Kakashi means that he is proud of you taking charge of your youth. Lee has gone through the same experience, and just look how marvelous he's turned out. Hanada started to turn a little red as she looked over to Lee, who gave her an exuberant nod and proud thumbs up. He was out of his hospital clothes and once again clad in his ostentatious jumpsuit, and Hanada had to return his wide grin with a small uneasy smile. Guy leaned over from his seat beside Kakashi, peering at Hanada and rubbing thoughtfully at his chin. Have you considered adding some green? Her clothes are fine how they are, sensei, Tenten said exasperatedly, though she shared a look with Hanada that got them both giggling lightly. They really do look good on you, she continued in a whisper, nudging her friend's side. But I already told you that last week. Hanada smiled and returned the nudge, appreciative of her friend's support. Tenten winked at her just before Genma's voice rose over the crowd. He must be using some kind of jutsu to make his voice carry like that, she muttered, intrigued that they could hear his normal speaking voice so clearly. The first match will begin presently, please find your way to your seat. Be safe, and do your best Naruto-kun, Hanada whispered so quietly that Tenten nearly missed it. The older girl smiled and took her hand, giving it a squeeze but saying nothing. They both knew that Tenten couldn't endorse Naruto over Neji, but that wouldn't stop her from supporting her friend. Hanada held on tightly, her eyes locked on the arena floor as she tried to wait patiently. She was nervous not because she was worried that Naruto would lose, but because he might forget his promise. 
The fact that he had lashed out at Neji only a moment before made her even more anxious. I trust him. He won't let Neji Nisan get to him again. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Genma stood a few meters to one side of Naruto and Neji, positioned between them. He looked more annoyed than bored now. The match will begin in two minutes. Don't forget that the rules here are the same as in the preliminaries, there are no rules. The fight will end when one of you dies or gives up. But if I say that the match is over, it's over, don't argue with me over it and do not take any further action afterwards. Understand. The Junin looked at both of them for confirmation, though his gaze lingered on Neji. They both nodded, not taking their eyes from one another. The Hokage's voice rang out from above a moment later, and the buzzing crowd fell silent. Honored guests, he started, spreading his arms, I welcome you to Kanahagakur and the Chunin selection exam. We will now begin the main event with the nine contestants that have passed the preliminary round. Please enjoy the matches. The Sandame afforded the now cheering spectators a small, gracious bow before returning to his seat next to the case cage. That's our cue, Genma muttered, stepping back another few paces. Put on a good show, kids. He raised his head to address the crowd then, clicking the Sanban against his teeth again before speaking. The first match will be Uzumaki Naruto and Hayuga Neji. A mixture of applause, shouts, and jeers met their ears at the announcement. Naruto could make a pretty good guess as to which were for whom. Genma lowered his gaze again and lifted a hand. Neji eased into his Juken stance, but Naruto didn't move. He just stood there, fists at his sides and eyes hard on his opponent. Remember not to let loose completely on this guy, the Kayubi cautioned. The goal is to hold back as much as possible until the later rounds so that you can. I'm going all out, Naruto responded flatly. I don't care if the others find out what I can do. I want Neji to see just how wrong he is about me and Hinata, and I'll beat everyone else even if they do know what I'm capable of. As expected the fox growled before letting out an exasperated sigh. Don't even think about trying to surpass your limits. Naruto said nothing, and after a moment the Kayubi's presence receded to the back of his mind. Begin. Genma called, and the crowd roared. Let's go. Neji said calmly as his Byakugan activated. I'll show you how helpless you are to the trappings of fate. Naruto stayed where he was, watching his adversary calmly. Neji sighed. If you're too afraid to move, I'll come to you. He smiled menacingly before vanishing in a burst of speed. Naruto was only half concerned with tracking the older boy's movements, mostly focusing carefully on the subtle task at hand, suppressing his gathering chakra. Neji became a blur whirling in behind him faster than he could follow. Naruto didn't see the palm strike closing in between his shoulder blades, but he didn't care, Neji was within range now. All at once Naruto released his chakra, along with every bit of fury he had been holding in. The effect was instantaneous. Blue energy roared up around him, extending far above his own head in a torrent of flames. The red cloak of the Kyubi's chakra stopped Neji's punch cold as it sprang up around Naruto smoldering angrily against his opponent's bare skin. The explosion of power not only provided a defense against the blow, but it also sent out a minor shockwave that sent the Hayuga boy skidding back several meters. The crowd fell completely silent. Naruto turned slowly to face Neji again, his eyes burning red with the Kayubi's influence. He let his chakra rage for a few seconds longer, making the fox's shroud appear purple for the duration. The azure fire died down again, and Neji didn't miss one of the two tails sinking back into the reddish cloak. Naruto stood facing him again, surrounded by the vermilion chakra with its single tail swishing back and forth restlessly. He lowered slowly into a fighting stance, his voice deadly quiet as he spoke. Instructor, he began, a small, fierce grin spreading across his features. Try to stop the match before he dies. Whether or not he intended to kill Neji was irrelevant. When the older boy heard Naruto address Genma so confidently, using Neji's own taunt, no less, he narrowed his eyes and set his stance again. Naruto was satisfied enough to see that his opponent lacked his usual excessive pride, he wouldn't have had it any other way. There would be no pleasure in victory if Neji acted with the same hubris as he had in his fight with Hinata. As they clashed Naruto realized two things. 
The first was that Neji was taking this seriously, putting forth his full effort despite his earlier statements. The second was that Neji's movements were disparate. They were more fluid, and his style had veered slightly from traditional Jukan. Naruto wasn't sure if his show of power had jarred the other boy, but something was very different about the way he fought when compared to the previous month. Looks like he's been training, the Kyubi mused as Naruto deflected a strike. I bet your girlfriend put a crack in his nice little picture of the world. He's gotten faster, I think, and it feels like he's got more chakra. That's enough playing around, then. Although the fox referred to what they were doing as, playing around, the onlookers were in awe at the bout of hand-to-hand -hand combat. At points the two of them became only blurs of color, striking with such force that showers of chakra, both blue and red, burst all around them. But Naruto was only just getting started. Between one kick and the next Naruto summoned a clone behind himself, using the replacement jutsu a breath later to swap places with it so smoothly that Neji wasn't able to react. He kept the clone between himself and Neji as he flashed through hand seals, shaping his chakra rapidly. Fudan. Vacuum sphere. Naruto took in a breath, exhaling in several sharp bursts and sending columns of air shooting towards his adversary. The clone didn't let up its assault, dispersing only a fraction of a second before the ability struck. Neji was already starting to spin, however. The revolving heaven technique was just as impressive as when Naruto had last seen it. The dome of chakra created by the technique deflected the jutsu, forcing it off to the side and into the wall of the arena. The stone structure shuddered as the impacts created four sizable craters. As Neji's rotation slowed Naruto was already charging forward, his right arm back and gathering chakra. The hum of thousands of muttering voices started back up as an orb formed in his palm, spiraling in a mix of blue and red energy. When he was only a meter from his opponent he thrust his hand forward, driving the orb directly into Neji's degenerating technique. A bright flash of indigo shone from the point of contact as Naruto roared over the cacophony of the crowd and colliding chakras. Rasengan. The light grew until it became blinding, and Naruto had to wince away from it after a moment. But then he felt the opposing pressure give way slightly, drawing from him a determined growl and a renewed effort to press the Rasengan forward. For a fraction of a second it felt as if Neji had blocked his advance, but all at once the resistance fell. Like a knife through soft wood Naruto drove forward, and right into his waiting adversary. Hake. 64 palms. Unable to stop his forward momentum, Naruto grunted as the first two struck home, and it was then that he saw his mistake. Rather, it was then that he realized Neji's plan. The older genin had been hidden in his whirl of chakra, but with his Byakugan he was still able to see everything outside. By speeding up his rotation just as Naruto's jutsu had come in contact with his own, he had been able to momentarily halt its progression to set up his own technique. The Rasengan had passed within centimeters of Neji's ear, directly over his left shoulder, he had avoided it at the last possible moment. A fine mist of blood shot up around Naruto's hand as the sphere clipped the other boy's shoulder, dissolving clothing and skin alike as it passed. Four strikes. Another group of Naruto's tenkatsu shut down as he was hit, now stopping his movement and forcing him back a pace. Release it as he strikes next, the fox barked, and Naruto had time only to heed his advice and do just that. Eight strikes. Naruto grit his teeth as the first hit his left shoulder, making it go numb. But then he willingly let go of his focus as the Kyubi had instructed, and Neji was caught by the violently spiraling chakra let loose from the uncontrolled Rasengan. The core of energy unraveled and lashed out in every direction, though with significantly less power than a direct hit. The Hayuga's technique was cut short and he was thrown back, hitting the ground hard and skidding through the dirt before he could regain his balance. He's not stupid, the Kyubi commented as Naruto shook his tingling arm. It seems he not only trained this past month, but he did some spying too. Unless your girlfriend told him about your new technique. She wouldn't do that. You know that as well as I do. If he could have spat the words he would have, but he settled for an annoyed tone instead as he reset his stance. Either way. He knows, and he countered it. What will you do? He can deflect any ninja tools I use with that spin, and that ninjutsu Jiraiya taught me was pretty strong. If that didn't work, I'll have to rely on taijutsu. Probably, 
but there's a weakness to his technique that you're not considering. Yeah, Naruto asked as Neji sprinted forward to attack. Kinda busy here, explain fast. Figure it out. If he had the time to be frustrated he might have at least cursed at the fox, but instead Naruto was forced to begin trading blows once again, his mind racing. It uses a lot of chakra, right? It has to if he's putting out enough to deflect strong ninjutsu. Silence. He continued, grinding his teeth as he narrowly dodged a palm strike. And he has to stay still when he does it. Right. Mostly. You had the right idea attacking when he was slowing down but it's time you started using your, and my, large chakra reserves to your advantage. He'll tire out before me, Naruto realized in the middle of a sweeping hook kick. I'll just keep using a lot of ninjutsu and throwing weapons. Have to start somewhere. Taju cage bunshin no jutsu. He yelled a moment later as he leapt back. Shuriken flew from every direction as dozens of clones materialized around Neji, but he didn't miss a beat. The Hyuga twisted and spun keeping track of every weapon as he maneuvered among them. Naruto's bunshin let loose a round of kunai following quickly on the heels of the shuriken, and it was the added pressure that forced Neji to use his revolving heaven once again. Any ninjutsu or spare weapons you can throw. Naruto ordered. He was answered by a round of enthusiastic shouts and more shuriken. A few clones carefully performed various techniques, taking time with the hand seals and chakra balance in order to waste as little as possible. Jets of water, barrages of wind, and even a few stray fireballs tore through the air to bombard Neji, combining at the center of the arena in a chaotic display of the elements. That might have been a bit overboard, kid, the Kyubi mused, though the lack of an insult was encouraging on its own. Naruto felt noticeably drained by the effort, but it didn't stop him from smirking. I can feel Neji's chakra, he's having to spend more than me to keep that up. Well, relatively more. I think. Clones began dispersing as they reached their limits. Those that remained were the ones that had only emptied their physical arsenal and neglected to perform any ninja techniques. Scorch marks covered the ground around Neji's still spinning form, the area completely scoured down to the foundation. Torrents of steam rose all around from the mix of jutsu, momentarily obscuring Naruto's opponent as he finally slowed. Naruto dropped to the ground and rolled as a fist of shuriken flew from the shroud of fog, springing to his feet in time to swing his forearm out and block a straight palm strike from Neji. A satisfying crack from his opponent's wrist elicited a fierce grin from the blonde. Neji held the blow regardless, locking up Naruto's arm. He was breathing hard, which brought another note of satisfaction. Hake, Neji said in a quiet, strained voice. Naruto tensed and tried to fling his arm away but the older boy's hand turned and grabbed his forearm in a vice-like hold despite the fractured bones in his wrist. The Kyubi's chakra roiled around Neji's grip but he held on, his other palm thrusting forward as he snarled, mountain crusher. A dense wave of chakra erupted from Neji's palm, obscuring Naruto from view in a burst of whiteness for a split second. The wall of the arena 50 meters away cracked as an orange-red blur collided with it, sending out a cloud of dust and rubble. Neji sagged forward, catching himself in a stagger. His hard eyes were locked on where Naruto had hit the wall, and his breath was coming in ragged gasps. The hand that had been used to hold Naruto was twisted at an odd angle and badly burned, a sacrifice to land the blow. In what dream, he panted, spitting on the ground as he slowly straightened, did you expect to defeat me? Neji turned towards Genma amidst a stunned silence from the crowd, staring pointedly at the Junin. If he's not dead, he'll need medical attention immediately. Nobody could have survived that. Neji spun back towards the wreckage, eyes full of fury. The smoke from Naruto's impact was still thick, and all that anybody else could make out was a vague shadow walking slowly towards Neji. I saw you fall, the Hyuga boy seethed. I saw your chakra deplete from trying to absorb the impact. You, you can't fool my eyes. Maybe try looking again. Naruto continued calmly, stepping from the dust. The spectators had started a cheer but choked it back immediately, a few strangled cries coming out instead. Go ahead. Take a look, Neji. Tell me what you see. Naruto stood defiantly before Neji, before the entire village. Two red tails twitched back and forth behind him, bubbling with the same chakra that covered the rest of his body. 
The features created by the Kyubi's cloak were more pronounced than before, and the whisker-like scars on his cheeks were thicker. Claw's rod of red chakra dug into the ground at his feet and flexed at his fingertips. The faux fox ears atop his head appeared alive with the chakra's motion. Neji looked into him with his Byakugan, and then he saw, it. At Naruto's torso, where the core of his own chakra should have been, was the bright orange flame that had grown to envelope him entirely, sharing its unfathomable energy with the comparatively small container. As he watched through his Byakugan the fires twisted, forming the bust of a ferocious fox. It laughed. It was a deep, cold, mocking laugh that shook his very being. And then it was gone, as if it had never been. From the look on your face, Naruto smirked, rolling each of his shoulders in turn, I can tell that you saw. Who? What? Neji couldn't get the words out. Neji, Naruto said in a low, serious tone. I'm going to give you the chance to back down now, to save you a lot of pain and pride. You can't beat me, you didn't have a chance from the beginning. Why? He started, looking desperate to understand. This isn't how it's supposed to happen. You're not. You're just. I'm not weak, Neji. I'm not a monster, either, Naruto added dryly, knowing that Neji had at least a glimpse at what was inside of him. And I can't let you keep hurting people because of some stupid ideas about fate. Whether you surrender here or not, he said firmly, starting forward again, I'll show you and everybody else that there's no such thing as fate. Neji's eyes narrowed and he lowered himself into a Jukan stance, drawing on his chakra reserves. Naruto shook his head, continuing forward. You look down on Hinata because you think she's weak, but she's stronger than you'll ever be. And it's because of jerks like you that she's trained so hard to become strong. Do you know how much she's suffered because of the head family? You two might have more in common than you think. He was only a few meters away now, never halting his advance. She cares about you, Neji. No matter what you say or do to her she never says a bad thing about you. She just keeps fighting against her own fate, the fate of being born as the heiress to the Hyuga main family. And here you are, fighting your own battle to try and prove that what she's doing is wrong. Hake. 128 palms. Neji shouted, flying forward in a fit of rage. He didn't want to listen anymore. He didn't want to hear this pariah try to pick him apart like he was some broken object to be examined and fixed. He didn't want his life's ambitions and beliefs tarnished. He didn't want any of it. Before he could take the first step Naruto's fist buried itself into his stomach. The air was ripped from Neji's lungs as he careened backwards with the force of the blow, spinning through the air before hitting the ground and tumbling several meters further. His progress was halted abruptly as his back hit Naruto's foot. The blonde had moved so quickly to intercept him that few from the audience had even followed him. A chakra-coated hand latched onto Neji's collar, dragging him from the ground and holding him aloft. The Hyuga boy still had enough fight in him to struggle, but it was useless. Kid, you're losing it, the Kyubi cautioned. You can't control this much chakra yet. Naruto wasn't listening, and the fox let out an irritated tisk. Naruto held out his right hand gathering chakra there once again. In moments the empowered Rasengan was making its high-pitched whirring sound, muted slightly by the Kyubi's chakra surrounding it. He pulled his arm back, intending to drive the sphere directly into Neji's chest. The match is over. Genma called sharply, causing Naruto a moment's hesitation. The Rasengan quivered a hair's breadth from Neji, cutting into the fabric of his shirt. Memories surged within Naruto's mind, fighting for attention. Hanada's apprehension when they first went to train with Team Guy, Neji's cruel words during the preliminaries. He tried to kill Hanada. Crimson eyes flicked to the Junin examiner, then back to Neji. He couldn't stop himself. Naruto-kun. Hanada's voice pierced the tense silence of the arena, and Naruto froze. All eyes turned towards Section B, at the girl leaning over the railing with a shamelessly pleading expression painted across her features. Naruto's eyes were only one of many pairs, but his were the ones that softened most. Can't believe I, he mumbled, shaking his head as the cloak of chakra dissipated. Neji fell to the ground a second later, coughing and choking for air. Naruto looked oddly distant, and even a little disgusted for a few moments. 
But when he turned to look down at Neji his eyes were back to normal again, expression controlled and somewhat sympathetic. Don't give up. Neji, he said softly, voice tired. You're not as trapped as you think you are. Naruto held out his hand to him then, trying to summon a grin. I still won't forgive you for hurting Hinata, but we can start with an apology and work from there. Deal. Neji stared at him in blatant disbelief. After being beaten, made a fool of, and lectured, this boy expected him to take his hand and forget it all. Naruto was asking him to leave his pride by the wayside and go against everything he believed in. He could not. He would not. He looked away and said nothing, swatting the offered hand away with his wounded wrist. Naruto frowned and straightened, shaking his head again and scratching at the back of his neck. Winner. Uzumaki Naruto. The crowd erupted in cheers, prompting Naruto to blink up towards the stands. His gaze traveled slowly around the amphitheater, and just as gradually a proud yet sheepish grin spread across his features. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Hanada fell back to her seat, already biting at her lip. There were still a few people glancing furtively at her. Tenton was watching her concernedly as well, but she was too distracted to notice. Too many thoughts were flitting through her mind. He won, Kakashi said, leaning down so that Hanada would hear him over the din. I know you're anxious, but just look around you for a moment. She looked up at her sensei curiously before scanning their surroundings. A small smile tugged at the corners of her lips as she realized what he had meant. This is the first time that he's ever been acknowledged by the villagers, isn't it? Kakashi nodded, leaning back as he straightened to watch as Naruto gave the spectators a few waves before making his way out of the arena. Even after nearly losing control of the Kyubi's chakra he was beaming, though his cheeks were still aglow with an embarrassed flush. Uruka had taught him something of humility, at least. Everybody seems impressed with him now, the Junin mused, smirking slightly. I guess they're finally starting to see what we see, hm. Hanada nodded, smiling to herself. Starting to, but, she blushed and shook her head quickly, turning to strike up a hurried conversation with Tenten. Kakashi raised an eyebrow before shrugging and turning back to Guy to continue discussing the previous match. But they'll never see what I see. Naruto arrived in their section just as Genma was making his way back to the center of the ring. A team of medics had escorted Neji out on a stretcher, and the youth's eyes had been locked on Naruto his entire way out. That was incredible, Naruto-kun. Lee said exuberantly as the blonde approached, leaping from his seat and clenching his fist in a passionate display. What was that technique you used that turned you all red? Anyo. Naruto started, stopping at the bottom of the stairs. He looked around, though most of the people around had turned their attention back to the center of the ring. The next match was the most anticipated, after all. It's just a special kind of chakra I have, he finished lamely, shrugging and slipping past Guy and Kakashi. They made room for him without his asking. He lowered himself next to Hanada on the side opposite Tenten, wincing as he did so. You're hurt, Hanada said quietly. Naruto gave her a weak smile and leaned back. His hand found hers a moment later, relaxing in a comfortable hold as he spoke again. Yeah, kind of. I had to uh. He glanced past her to Tenten and Lee before deciding to censor his words. I had to use the red chakra to absorb the impact from that thing he did, the mountain crusher, or something. It was a lot stronger than I thought, and I wasn't ready for it. He also got a few hits around my chest, it's a little hard to breathe. I wouldn't have expected it before the preliminaries, Tenten said with a sigh, smirking over at Naruto. I didn't think Neji could be beaten by another genin. It looks like you proved me and everybody else wrong. He flashed an appreciative smile at the older girl before looking back to Hinata. She hadn't said anything, but instead was giving him one of her looks. Naruto rolled his eyes, but he couldn't stop a chuckle from escaping as he pulled his right leg onto the bench so that he could face her. All right, go ahead, he said in a light, teasing tone. Hanada clicked her tongue at him before putting her hands to his chest, seeking out and starting to heal his injuries. Did I miss Sasuke-kun's match? They turned to see Haku skidding to a halt at the end of their row, breathing hard and flushed from his hurry. He was dressed in a formal kimono that sported far more pink than a young man might usually wear. 
Neither Naruto nor Hinata seemed to notice, however, only shaking their heads in unison and smiling at him. His fight's just about to start, Hinata assured him. Come sit with us, Haku-chan. The older boy flushed and nodded, quickly making his way to squeeze in between Kakashi and Naruto as Genma's voice called out from below. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The next round is between Uchiha Sasuke and Gara of the Sand. The crowd redoubled its cheering. Sasuke vaulted the railing from the competitor's viewing area, sliding a ways before putting his hands in his pockets and walking casually the rest of the way down. Gara watched him, his expression one of maddened glee as he turned towards the stairs. Tamari and Konkuro stood silently nearby, beads of sweat forming on their brows. Sasuke made it to Genma well before his adversary emerged from the tunnel. He was still dressed in the black outfit that Kakashi had given him, though a thick leather belt had been added to hold a wakazashi on his left hip. The longer blade rested on his back, suspended by a sash-like shoulder holster that attached to his belt. The weapons were sharpened and polished within their black sheaths. One of his first errands back in Konoha had been to obtain a new set. Hurry it up, kid. Genma grumbled at Gara as he made his way slowly to them. Everybody's been waiting for this match, and you're not adding any suspense by being lazy. The boy was silent and did not pick up his pace. He simply continued forward, his eyes never leaving Sasuke. The Junin rolled his eyes, but the pitch of the crowd only proved that they were becoming even more excited. Thanks for joining us, Genma said sarcastically before taking a few steps back. Same rules as the preliminaries. If I say the match is over, it's over. Don't second guess me. He looked between them, noticed that neither boy was paying attention, and sighed. Whatever. Begin. Sand began flowing from Gara's gourd the moment Genma gave the go-ahead, and Sasuke crouched into a ready stance in response. However, the Suna Nin twitched and winced as if in pain a moment later, clutching at his right eye and muttering under his breath. Sasuke couldn't make out much of it, but what he gathered was that the boy was speaking to his. His mother. Yes, mother. You'll get to drink up his delicious blood. All of it. Sasuke tensed at the cryptic, disturbing statement. Gara shuddered again and flinched, breathing in deeply for a few seconds before turning his now flat gaze to his opponent. Come. Gladly. Sasuke smirked fiercely, activated his sharingan, let loose a fist of shuriken, and sprinted forward. Gara's sand flowed into a clone, which caught and flung back the projectiles. A beat later a wave of sand was speeding towards Sasuke, but it wasn't nearly as fast as he had expected. Kakashi made it sound like his sand was faster than this, he thought as he leapt over the attack. He was right that this guy seems to only be able to use his sand to do anything. Pretty boring, but I'm not waiting around to figure out what else he can do. Sasuke turned his landing into a roll to put him right up to the clone, and with a single straight punch he drove a hole straight through its abdomen. The bunshin twitched once before sand began enveloping Sasuke's wrist, but he wasn't about to let that happen, Kakashi had told him all about Lee's fight. He struck again with his other hand, freeing both of them and pivoting into a lightning quick hook that took the clone's head off, dispersing it to individual grains once again. My turn. The sand may as well have been moving in slow motion for all the good it did in keeping up with Sasuke. His movements were similar to Naruto's when he had taken on the two-tailed shroud, for those that had been there for Lee's fight with Gara, his speed now matched the older Genin's. The crowd's cheering faltered and sputtered into an odd, quiet rumble. Gara hit the ground ten meters away, the armor of sand on one half of his face was cracked and breaking off. Sasuke stood where Gara had been, his fist pulling back from the punch that had come too quickly to detect. The Suna Nin narrowed his eyes and rose, apparently unharmed. Looks like I'll have to try a little harder to actually hurt you, Sasuke mused aloud, pretending to think for a moment before he disappeared again. The audience only caught glimpses of the Uchiha in the following minute. The cheering from the onlookers came in brief bursts whenever Gara was struck by a seemingly invisible force. Only the cheers from the Chunin and Junin spectators were consistent, however. By the time Sasuke was fully visible again shards of hardened sand riddled the ground around Gara. His shell had been shattered in most visible areas, and though he was breathing hard he still didn't seem to have taken any direct damage. 
Sasuke's own breath was coming a bit more labored than usual as well. Examiner. Sasuke breathed, reaching for his weapons. Stop the match when you see fit to do so. I'm not going to let up until he dies. What's with you kids? Genma scowled, obviously exasperated at being told nearly the same thing two fights in a row. This time, although Sasuke was still moving faster than Gara's San could keep up with, more of the crowd was able to track his movements. Blood sprayed into the air every few seconds as he danced blinding circles around his opponent, striking at the areas where the sand had been weakened. He didn't train at all. Does he think this sluggish sand is going to be able to protect him forever? Sasuke was almost offended by the idea, and after a particularly gruesome slash to Gara's shoulder he jumped back to view the damage. The sand genin was hunched over in front of him, eyes unfocused but still filled with malice. Blood dripped or simply flowed from a dozen cuts and gashes along his body, most of which had landed along his limbs with one or two deeper wounds on his chest and side. My. Blood. Gara snarled, finally breaking eye contact to look down at his injuries. Mine. And then he laughed. It was a harsh, hollow sound that sounded like a mix between a bark and a madman's cackle. Sasuke balked and took a subconscious step back, eyeing the other boy warily. It's time. Gara quieted and brought his hands together, holding the maniacal smile as the sand churned and flowed around him into a tight sphere. Sasuke threw two kanai at the closing center space, but the weapons deflected wildly and sent showers of sparks cascading over the barrier of sand. The shield was already as hard as the metal blades. Great. Sasuke sighed, deftly sheathing his blades and rolling his shoulders. Impenetrable shield. If only I had a technique that could break through that. He feigned thought for a moment, if only to further annoy Genma, before appearing to have an epiphany. Oh yeah, I do. He smirked as he crouched and flew through seals, lowering his left hand and beginning to gather his chakra. The hum coming from the stands turned into an excited trill as electricity crackled in Sasuke's palm. Miniature lightning strikes played across the ground and up his arm until he pulled it back, starting forward at a dead sprint. The focused chakra began to emit a dissonance of high-pitched chirping sounds that were loud enough for the spectators far above to hear. Spikes of hardened sand shot from Gara's barrier as Sasuke approached, aiming for his vital points. Sasuke used only the barest movements to avoid the strikes in order to keep his momentum, even allowing one to cut into his cheek. He grit his teeth and thrust his palm forward, shouting above the screeching energy and roar of the crowd. Chidori. As in Kakashi's demonstration the ability cut smoothly into the sand, melting it around the point of impact. The hardened grains flowed together and became brittle under to the intense heat, and several centimeters surrounding Sasuke's forearm turned to glass between one instant and the next. The small circle of glass shattered as the Uchiha's attack made contact on the other side, and then everything became very quiet. Sasuke tensed as he sensed something amiss, and he immediately tried to pull his arm back. Something fastened onto his wrist, threatening to crush it in a vice-like grip. He ground out a curse and reactivated the Chidori, setting his feet against the outside of the shell and pushing back with all of his strength. After a strained moment he felt the hold loosen and shy away from the lightning. Sasuke dove backwards, twisting mid-flight to land sliding several meters away. What the? He started under his breath. Dark shapes writhed beyond the small hole he had created, indistinct but disconcerting nonetheless. It wasn't until he saw the amber glow that realization began to dawn, and by then it was too late. A large yellow eye flashed in front of the opening, and then Gara began screaming. The sound was one of agony, terror, madness, and rage. Sasuke could only get one panicked word out before he leapt away from the cracking shell. Shukaku. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Kai. Almost the entire row holding teams Guy and Kakashi spoke in unison, dispelling the genjutsu that had begun moments before. They were already on their feet, and before Kakashi could get a word out Naruto had reached the railing. Naruto. He said sharply, halting the youth in his tracks. Take stock of your surroundings before you act. The boy, glanced around hurriedly, then let out a curse. All of the civilians were asleep, and the shinobi that had managed to shake the illusory technique had already engaged in combat with ninjas wearing sound hit I-8. Sensei. You heard Sasuke. 
Naruto said with a quick glance back to the arena floor. If it is then. Then we'll deal with it when we must, but for now protecting the citizens of Konoha is the priority. Do as I say. This is not a game. Konoha is under attack. He hesitated for only a moment before nodding tightly and drawing a kanai. Guy had already ordered his team to the western part of their section, and the three of them were battling half a dozen Odo Nin attempting to enter from the stairs. You three take the other side. I'll handle the center aisle. Hanada reached behind her belt and withdrew her modified trench knives, her expression grave and anxious. Haku had Sanban between each of his fingers, and with a worried look down at Sasuke he charged east to assist the leaf forces. Naruto and Hanada followed without hesitation, prepared to heed Kakashi's final barked order. This is the real thing. Strike to kill. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Tamari and Konkuro landed together in front of Gara's hardened shell, facing Sasuke. They both had their weapons drawn. In the older boy's case, his puppet was already out and ready. A second later their Junin instructor appeared in front of them, looking irate but serious nonetheless. Damn that Gara! He spat, glancing at the barrier. He could ruin the plan by losing control like this. I'll take Baki, Genma said as he stepped up beside Sasuke eyes narrowing at the other man. You take the two kids. He raised his voice to the three San Shinobi, drawing out several kunai. So you've been planning to attack from the beginning, using the Chunin exam as a front to get your people inside. I hate to tell you, but it won't be that easy. Baki only grinned mirthlessly at Genma, and a moment later they realized why. The ground shook and a few chunks of stone fell from the high walls around them. Thunderous crashes reached their ears from far off, followed by a monstrous hissing noise. Sasuke wasn't allowed a moment to wonder about what was happening. He and Genma were forced to dodge aside as a torrent of wind rushed towards them. Genma disappeared at the same time as Baki, and a short time after the sounds of a skirmish could be heard a ways off to one side. All Sasuke was focused on were the two enemy genin in front of him, however. I'm not really excited to fight this guy after seeing what he did to Gara. Konkuro sighed, flexing his fingers. But orders are orders. We shouldn't be here in the first place, Tamari growled, glancing worriedly back to where Gara still remained entombed by his own sand. We could die. Yeah, you could, Sasuke responded evenly, drawing his blades once again. I'll. He trailed off, staring past the two of them. Both Sun and Nin froze, their eyes widening in fear. The shell of sand had burst open on one side and along, tan something came slithering out to claw at the ground as if testing something. Konkuro. Tamari shouted, panicked. Her brother needed no further encouragement. She flipped her fan horizontally and leapt on it, Konkuro right behind her. Sasuke was left blinking at them as they sped away through the air. His eyes were drawn back to Gara a moment later, at least, what had been Gara a few minutes earlier. Debris scattered in every direction as the ground buckled under a colossal weight, and Sasuke was forced to cover his eyes as he staggered back. When he lowered his arm to see what had happened, all that could be seen was roiling dust. But slowly a shadowy shape became visible within the shroud, towering higher than the walls of the arena. It was truly massive. On its own it took up half of the grounds, and that was only because it had torn down the entire northern wall of the amphitheater with its coming. When the haze finally settled Sasuke was looking up at least a hundred stories, right into the mad golden eyes of the Aikibi. You're the one, the beast yelled. It let out a crazed, high-pitched cackle, its giant tail crushing several more buildings behind the already destroyed wall. You did it. You made him lose too much blood. I'm out. I'm out. The piercing laughter created a wave of force on its own, pushing Sasuke back several meters. This. This is a tailed beast. Its chakra was incomprehensible. Its mere voice could shake the earth, and a casual flick of its tail could level acres. Nobody could fight this thing. I have to get out of. Fudan. Drilling air bullet. A mass of air the size of a building burst from Shukaku's mouth towards Sasuke. You're the one. I want to kill you. Sasuke growled and vanished, but a moment later he was sent tumbling to the side as the chakra bomb hit the ground. Even from 20 meters away the force of the impact had been enough to knock him from his feet and send him rolling off to the side. You can't get away. 
You can't get away. I want to taste your blood. Sasuke kicked back to his feet and flipped sideways, narrowly avoiding a round of Sanban and a small tornado. The needles got caught up in the whirlwind, creating an even deadlier spiral that passed far too close to him. Tamari and Konkuro landed nearby, placing Sasuke between them and Shukaku. Both looked frightened and strained. You're not getting away, Uchiha Sasuke, Tamari called in a shaky voice, raising her fan as the Aikibi reeled back for another ranged attack. Another chakra-laced mass of air shot towards Sasuke in the same instant that Tamari let loose a powerful, broad wave of wind. Konkuro's puppet sent a barrage of poison-tipped needles from above, further narrowing Sasuke's options of escape. Time slowed down as he took everything in. A cold sweat broke over his brow as his mind raced. Her wall will knock me back into the other two attacks. I'll die if I get hit by Shukaku's. Only option is up. He turned his Sharingan skyward, and in the fraction of a second that it took him to gather chakra and jump he had calculated his trajectory. There were at least a hundred Sanban, but they were spread wide enough that he had been able to find a path through. Sasuke twisted as he flew upwards, trying to remain calm and focused on his movements. He raised one knee, bent his arm slightly, and moved the other a few centimeters out while keeping it locked straight. A tense moment later he broke through unharmed. Several of the projectiles had passed so close to him that he could feel the poison burning on his skin. Sasuke spun to get momentum for his kick, driving his foot into the puppet responsible for the deadly shower. Its carapace shattered with the blow, and it hit an undamaged portion of the wall a second later only to crumple to the ground. Caden. Great fireball. Caden. Phoenix Sage Fire. A comet of fire rushed towards the Suna Nin, forcing them to dodge to each side. The first technique, however, was a distraction from the second. Several small fireballs broke off from the larger one while Konkuro and Tamari were still in midair, tearing towards them. Tamari used her fan to guard, and Konkuro crossed his arms to help absorb the attack. Both were carried off course regardless, sending them much further away than they had intended to dodge. Damn it Naruto! Hanada, where are you? Sasuke landed on the wall, already letting loose a volley of shuriken. Raiden. Lightning shuriken. Electricity coursed down the hidden wires and into the spinning blades an instant before Tamari attempted to deflect them. The charged weapons ripped through her fan as they lit up with Sasuke's channeled chakra, and a breath later he guided them around to wrap the wires tightly about the Kunoichi's body. She let out a strangled cry before falling to the ground, twitching as the remaining power faded. Tamari. Konkuro shouted, sprinting towards her. Sasuke fell to one knee, wincing and breathing hard. Even if he had wanted to attack, he had used up too much chakra in his fight with Gara and his subsequent assault on the others. Unfortunately he did not have the time to recover. A laugh from Shukaku signaled yet another attack on the way, and the only thing Sasuke could do to avoid it was release the chakra holding his feet to the wall. He dropped fast, and a second later the section of the wall he had been standing on exploded in a shower of rubble. Sasuke hit the ground hard, gasping in a sharp breath and rolling to a crouch. Fudin. Drilling air bullet. The Aikibi yelled maniacally again, and before it even left the monster's mouth Sasuke knew he wouldn't be able to dodge in time. Hake. Vacuum palm. Sweden. Water blast. Sasuke blinked up at the backs of his two friends, standing side by side and blocking his vision of the oncoming technique. With his Sharingan still active, however, he could see the amount of raw power they both put into their jutsu. An enormous column of water shot towards Shukaku's air bullet, surrounded and accelerated by a tremendous force of air. The combination of abilities met the tailed beast's attack, and the resulting blowout shook the ground on which they stood. When the misty aftermath cleared, Hanada and Naruto still stood in front of him, their features grim and their eyes hard on Shukaku. You're late, Sasuke panted, pushing himself to his feet. We had to help the villagers, Naruto responded with a tight grin. I figured you could handle yourself for a bit. Hanada. He continued quietly, tilting his head back to Sasuke. She nodded and moved back to do some quick mending. I'm not very injured, just low on chakra. Hanada nodded again and pulled a soldier pill from her side pouch, handing it to Sasuke as she began to work quickly on his minor injuries. Naruto took a step towards Shukaku, 
clenching his fists and meeting the giant raccoon dog's gaze without fear. This is way out of your league, kid, the Kyubi said gruffly, and the urgency in his voice gave Naruto a moment's pause. I'm serious this time. Even if you could control nine tails worth of my chakra, there's no way you'd be able to match a fully transformed biju. Kakashi ordered us here to help Sasuke, and that's what I'm going to do. The Hokage is the only one that could stand a chance against Shukaku, but he's busy fighting his own battle. Naruto took a deep breath, summoning all of his and the Kyubi's chakra that he could muster. I can at least keep it distracted until Sasuke's recovered. Do what you can to help me. Whatever you say. You're a fool, mortal. Oi. Aikibi, Naruto called. Why don't you pick on somebody else? Shukaku's gaze fell from Sasuke and Hinata, its eyes narrowing on the blonde just below. Ooh, the Jinchuriki. Is that you in there, Kyubi? Why don't you come out and play? I'll show you that one is better than nine. Naruto didn't have time to puzzle over the Aikibi's words, forced to dodge to the side as a massive claw tore down at him. Come on, come on, come on. Fight me, Kyubi. Another blast was aimed directly at where Naruto was landing. You're right. He is crazy. Naruto thrust his palm towards the immense chakra ball, his Rasengan whirring to life in the same instant. If not for the Kyubi's chakra Naruto would have been crushed, but his own together with the one-tailed cloak allowed him to withstand it, if barely. Little more, he grunted to the fox. The second tail snaked out behind him, and then both shot forward over his shoulders and slammed into the air bullet. The added strength deflected the technique back and into the Aikibi's stomach, forcing it to take a stumbling step back. Interesting. Very interesting, mortal. But I don't want to play with you, I want the fox. Shukaku began lashing his tail, tearing down more of the arena wall as he moved forward and began swiping at Naruto. Not only was the beast faster than its mass should have allowed, but with every strike smaller tendrils shot out from its arm towards where Naruto dodged. Its entire body seemed to be able to flow and shift. He's made of sand, isn't he? Naruto asked as he slashed through a few extra reaching limbs. More or less. The Kyubi was oddly subdued, speaking in a tone of resignation. Naruto-kun. Hanada called. I'm finished. Get back. He heard her gasp after that, and the clang of metal striking metal. His eyes flicked towards his teammates for only an instant, in which he saw Konkuro engaging Hanada while a recovered Tamari battled Sasuke. In the instant he looked away a sweeping limb struck him across the back, sending him crashing into the ground. Ow. He rolled quickly to the side as a gigantic paw descended on him, smashing into the ground and creating a meter-deep impression. Kid, your girlfriend said to get back. That'd be the smart thing to do about now. I know. I'm trying. Naruto muttered, leaping away as another bullet of compressed air whistled by. He looked worriedly back towards his friends again. Ah. Kyubi. Too distracted to come out to play. Let's fix that. The world slowed for Naruto as he realized what Shukaku was doing. Three large spikes shot from the monster's chest towards Hinata's back while another set sped after Sasuke. The Uchiha flipped backwards to avoid the attack, and then his eyes widened and he spun towards Hinata. She had been jumping forward to attack Konkuro when the spikes were released, and though she could see them with her Byakugan she wouldn't be able to move fast enough to dodge. Her adversary dove to the side as her foot touched back to the ground, but it was too late. I can't. That instant felt like an eternity, but the aftermath seemed to try to make up for the lost time. Hanada hit the ground hard on her shoulder, bouncing once before colliding with one of the sparse trees lining the arena. She felt one of her ribs break at the impact, and she fell to the ground a moment later to gasp for air. It was then that she noticed how quiet things seemed to have gotten. The fighting in the stands above had died down, and the skirmishes around her had ceased. She was still trying to figure out what had knocked her aside with such force when she finally looked up. Where she had been standing there was nothing, which confused her even further. Her gaze traveled further to Sasuke whose eyes were impossibly wide as he stared at the mangled wall of the stadium. Hanada followed his gaze to where the three spikes had been driven half of their length into the solid stone. Pinned between them was a blonde boy, his black coat fluttering in the light breeze as the red-orange chakra faded from his limp form. Naruto. Hanada's sluggish mind went blank. She stood slowly, 
her eyes growing wider by the second as she took several slow steps towards him. One of the spikes had missed him, striking the wall a hair's breadth from his head. Another had his arm held to the wall, or what was left of it to hold. The barb had struck his left bicep and nearly torn his arm clean off. Blood flowed freely from the wound, and his forearm hung uselessly over the spike by a few shreds of mangled flesh. The last shaft had run through his torso, and where his right side should have been there was only bloody, hardened sand. The Kayubi's chakra had dissipated rapidly, and now Naruto only stared out at nothing with vacant, dimming blue eyes. No. Nobody stopped Hanada as she approached, trembling uncontrollably. No. She reached out, desperately feeling his neck for a pulse. Nothing. She couldn't take her eyes from his, and she couldn't even hear Shukaku's maddened laughter behind her. All she could see were the eyes of the boy she loved, and the small, relieved smile that graced his lips even after he was gone. Hanada didn't hear Sasuke shouting. She didn't hear when Tamari and Konkuro retreated or when Kakashi and Haku arrived on the scene. She didn't hear because she couldn't hear. All she could hear were Naruto's last words to her, just before they had arrived to assist Sasuke. Be safe. He's dead, she thought hollowly, touching his cooling cheek. Tears were flowing unchecked down her face, but her expression remained empty and disbelieving. She had always thought of Naruto as invincible, somehow. He had always been so confident, so determined no matter the odds. They had been through so much together. They had trained together for years, been on dangerous missions together. They had fought side by side so many times. And now, Naruto-kun is dead. The warm, ever-burning fire within her wavered and began to dwindle. It flickered for an instant, then was snuffed out completely. Hanada clutched her head, beginning to hyperventilate. And no, she stuttered, backing away and unable to move her eyes from Naruto. No, he can't be dead. Her voice rose with every word as she stumbled sideways, finally tearing her gaze from him and turning towards the sky. And then something happened that no person had ever witnessed, and none would ever wish to experience again. Hanada screamed. Something snapped within the young Hyuga, and without regard for herself she spun towards Shukaku. The beast was still filled with mirth at his accomplishment and appeared to be dancing about in glee. You, Hanada howled, starting towards the Aikibi. You took him from me. I never told him. I never told him that I loved him. Every choked syllable was a tragic note played upon broken heartstrings. Ten Ten's words echoed over and over in her head, mocking her. One of you could be gone tomorrow, and you'll have never shared your feelings for one another. Nearby, Sasuke had snapped out of his daze, fighting back tears of his own as Kakashi yelled at them both to fall back. But Hinata was already running at her friend's murderer, hands becoming a blur in the multitude of hand seals she had begun. Fudin. Gale Palm. Sweden. Slicing waves. Hake. Ethereal Sanban Barrage. Chakra was pouring from the girl as Jutsu tore through the air towards Shukaku. Huge scythes of water sliced into the Aikibi's torso as blasts of air battered his eyes and face. Hanada's arms became untraceable in movements similar to her protection technique, but now fine needles of chakra cascaded from her, battering every visible part of the beast's body. Hundreds of Sanban later Hanada was still running at Shukaku, heedless to the fact that her attacks had amounted to little more than an annoyance. She hadn't even seen Hiyashi flash in front of her, only realizing his presence when she was thrown over his shoulder and being carried away. The Hyuga clan leader deftly maneuvered around the biju, sprinting towards an exit before his daughter could end her life in her recklessness. No. Let me go. It killed him. It killed him. A breath later she felt a sharp blow to the back of her head, and her vision began to blur. Her hand stretched back towards Naruto as she was taken further from him. As merciful darkness took her she prayed to fate, destiny, and everything in between that this could be a nightmare. Naruto. Kun. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.